We are joined by the Controller and Auditor General Seamus McCarthy, as the permanent witness to the committee, and he is joined by Josephine Mooney, Deputy Director of Audit. Apologies have been received from Deputy Kate O'Connell, and the minutes of the meeting are being held over and will be cleared next. Previous meetings will be all cleared next week. Uh, I'm moving on straight away now to correspondence. So the first item is category correspondence A, briefing documents and opening statements in relation to today's meeting. Correspondence 1745A from the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protected to Protection dated 23rd of November, providing briefing notes on the following uh, for today's meeting. Uh, that's in relation to the var various chapters, the outturn figures and um, various summary documents which we will note and publish and we'll deal with them in public session so they're noted and published then the next item is correspondence b from accounting officers and our ministers and follow up to the pac meetings another item last week's meeting we dealt with a number of items held over from previous meetings there's still a few remaining items one is um correspondence 1560b dated 7th of september 2018 from the president of cork institute of technology providing detailed notes requested by the committee in relation to the preparation of the terms of reference for the KPMG review of anonymous allegations against CIT in 2014. We've discussed that, so we're just noting it now and publishing it. Um, and we will be dealing with that as part of our periodic report. Next item held over from the last meeting was 1637 um, from the Office of Public Works providing um, the Managing Valuers report in five historic cases on foot of a preceding submission and to deeper. We have advised the correspondent that we may request a meeting with the individual in due course, so we note and publish that. Uh, we've all seen that and discussed it off and on here before. Next item held over um, from the last meeting is 1684, is from Robert Watt, Secretary General of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, dated 24th of October, enclosing a minute from the Minister of Finance and Public Expenditure and Reform in relation to our third uh, periodic report of our meeting from January to May 2018. And this will take a few minutes. It's the biggest item of correspondence, so if you'll bear with me, um, we'll go through that. There's quite a lot in this document. I said it's reference number 1684. So before we go any further, we can note and publish the document. That's agreed. So this is in relation to the report we published um, in, on, on the 11th of July 2018. And in that, we covered a range of government departments. And in that document, we had 39 recommendations across the various departments, 30 of which have been accepted, nine of which haven't. And we'll come to those as we go along. So I just, uh, I'm, this document is going to be noted and published. So I have no intention of reading this out. It's a 27 page document, but we'll just run through each of them. And I won't be reading the recommendations, I'll just refer to what they are. And it's a question of recommendation number uh, A1 was that there should be a business case for all major proposed capital expenditure projects above a certain threshold. And the department accepts that. And they're now um, doing upgrade, updated guidance as part of the public spending code. And um, what we have said will be one of the changes to the new um, public spending code guidelines to be published, write to the department and ask when we can expect to see a copy of that. Okay? So we, they've accepted it. I noticed it's very easy for the department to accept a recommendation, but the follow through is all we're interested in. So we want to know when that will happen. Next recommendation was A2. Um, it's about um, public bodies that do not adhere. Now, this is one that's not accepted. And I want to read the sentence of what we recommended. The committee recommends that the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform examine the imposition of appropriate sanctions for public bodies that do not adhere to public procurement policy. And their official reply is denoted. And they're saying it's a matter for each contracting body and each government department to supervise the whole thing. So I think we, um, it's interesting they don't accept the principle of that. Um, we'll just note the response, and they're saying it's a matter of good governance uh, for each individual department. They're not accepting the principle of it. I think we stand by our recommendation as disappointing that that's not accepted. Then the next one is in relation to the valuation office, and these are very clear. There's a big national revaluation program, and they accept all the recommendations in relation to um, we were not happy with the time scale and the delays was one recommendation. Um, they accept that. They have a new plan and they'll do it every five years. Um, 
they've agreed to do that. The next rec that's recommendation B2, B3, and there's a variety of payment methods should be made uh, allowed for ratepayers. Up to now, they had to pay their bill in one or two annual instalments. That's accepted and it's been agreed and it's going to be in the Local Government Rates Bill 2018. The next one, they recommend um, the, the, the sequence of the revaluation, how they picked the various counties. We asked for a logic to be presented and they said, first revaluation is almost complete and it will be done on a rota basis every five to ten years. They also accept a recommendation in relation to there were some owner assisted valuations and some external contractors did some valuation and we asked it suggested that they, they do a review as to which is the most efficient and effective and they've accepted that and they will consider this in the context of the overall funding allocation for the housing planning and local government. So the, the Minister has said that um, that they understand this and they will providing, provide funding um, from the department to, to facilitate this and we were going to write to the department and ask to know how much money did they include in the 2019 estimates uh, in respect to recommendation 5. Um, next item recommendation B6 is um, an external independent review is accepted. So the, the valuation office have accepted as best they can everything we said. Um, next item, the management of salary over payments. Uh, they accept the recommendation and they have a new committee uh, established to liaise with the clients to make sure there's a proper agreement and understanding and they want to root out um, the overpayments at source which main, uh, arises mainly um, from people being absent and notification not being given quick enough in time and they seem to be improving on that area, so we note that. Uh, next item is, um, they, they, they said, we asked about the, the savings that's to be achieved by this new office, and the Minister has informed us that the process for planning the evaluation of the savings of the implementation of the shared services has commenced. We're going to ask, write to the Minister and ask when that will be completed and for a copy of that report. Um, next item is the Dormant Accounts Fund. That was a disaster the way it was managed because we had the Dormant Accounts Fund and then it transferred to various different departments over the years and that was the key issue. But there are some good recommendations accepted here and we said that um, there was a sub substantial amount of money had been um, locked in and hadn't been de committed and we recommend that old ones that were not going to happen should be decommitted and the department has confirmed here in writing that they have now decommitted a total of 16.5 million of these monies and they're now available to fund new measures and future action plan. That's very welcome and it's good that they've accepted our recommendation on that. Um, that was one of our significant recommendations. Then the only other one they noted was that we had a recommendation that they that fund be maintained by one body to provide a stable platform for the effective administration of the fund and it has moved from the department to the department and they're, they note a response and they essentially say the allocation of responsibilities regarding the fund is a matter for the government and ultimately the Taoiseach so we will accept their point, they've noted their point but, um, and we accept that it's a, it's a matter for the Taoiseach to outline ministerial responsibilities. Next item then is um, I think all the other um, the, the final recommendation, B14, is that um, they, they, they're reviewing the scheme, they accept that the assessment of, we said, this is very important, we said there was, there was over, the recommends that the department review the, the dormant accounts application process. We felt it was overly complicated and they actually accept our recommendation, which is very good, and they actually acknowledge that the assessment and selection procedures in particular would appear to be superfluous. And they say that uh, some of the rules and recommendations go far beyond the normal accountability and grants for exchequer funds. So they are accepting some of the pr procedures were unnecessary and superfluous, and obviously they're, they're dealing with that. Um, next item then was the decommittal of funds again, and they accept the recommendation. So let's watch. We'll watch this space for future improvements. But they've, they've accepted some of their application procedures were overly and unnecessarily complicated and they've agreed to the recommendation that um, some funds should be decommitted and available for new applications. So there's two good achievements. Next thing then was, and um, this is the department that 
By and large, accepted very little of our recommendations, and as the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, they note everything we say, but they don't seem to accept any of it. So <clears throat> we said that um, the Commission recommends the flow of funds from central government to local government are reviewed to simplify the process. They noted, they say, the CNAG has a chart which explains it all. I think the CNAG's chart highlighted how complex the whole issue was, rather than simplify. So I think, look, at, we'll be coming back to the Department because the, their answers are... You know, I, I think, you know, they haven't taken the spirit of what we were saying there, and it might be understood by the CNAG's office and the accounting officer, but the public need to be able to understand these things, so they haven't simplified the issue. And then we noted, we spoke about the fragmented nature of funding for local authorities from de different departments, they note that. Um, then they go and say that there is a review group established by the Minister uh, to bring greater balance and equity for local authorities. That's the, that's the funding model, so that's being examined. And that's recommendation B18, and we're writing to the Minister to know when we can expect to see that on B18. Um, then we come to the um, next item is... Um, the Commission maintain, this is about roads and they say they're providing additional funding for um, serious road accident black spots. Then the next recommendation, B20, they noted that's where we said there should be a five euro um, charge for online transaction for taxing the car and that, that the excessive charge for the quarterly issue of discs um, should be reduced. So essentially they say it would be a cost to a checker. I don't, what they're saying here is that the costs of a fiver down to close to, we've recommended a fiver for each online transaction. They, have, they are saying the cost is closer to a tenner, which doesn't fully tally with what we understood in the evidence here during the course of our meeting. But in any event, to say any such change would require an amendment to section 152 of the, uh, of the relevant legislation. So we note and publish this, and if any member or party feels it's worth amending the legislation, they can bring forward the private member's bill, but we've highlighted it now. And next item then um, is, is in relation to the housing assistant payment. Um, and it's about the inspections and they, they, they accept the recommendation and they say there has been some duplication of inspection where, people, where local authorities were already inspecting private rented accommodation and now it might also cover a HAP inspection and they make the disappointing remark, but I admire their honesty, they said while inspections are being undertaken widely by local authorities, not every local authority is recording data in respect of every HAP tenancy on the dedicated HAP system. So lads are walking in and out and saying that's grand and keeping no record. So I think um, that's a recommendation um, we need to follow through. And they admitted themselves, lads are, are women, as the case may be, are not recording their inspections. That's extraordinary. From local authorities, yeah. of course. So, so that's extraordinary. That are you basically saying then that yes, we accept that we're not recording, but they're not oh, saying oh, that, that oh, they oh, want anything oh, about. Oh, sorry, they, they, they accept it. No, no, they accept it, but they're, but they're I, not I, accepting they should do anything to change it. Um, I give. It is expected that will they say the last paragraph is they accept the recommendation and they highlight the particular problem which I just highlighted, yeah. and they said it is expected that. By the end of 2018, sufficient progress will have been made to integrate the recording systems and provide an inspection status on all active HAP tenancies on an ongoing basis. So write to the Minister and ask, we want a copy of that How report that early in yeah. the new year, okay, if okay. it's to be completed by the end. So they say they're working on it, so we'll follow through. Okay, thank you. We're getting there now. Um, then the next one was uh, Arts Heritage and Regional and Rural Gale took the fairs. There were several recommendations in relation to the Galway Art House, and they've accepted every single one of them. There is recommendation 23, 24, 25, I think we've seen, and they said they've learned a lot of lessons, and um, they're, they're accepting and implementing, well, it's a historic issue, now at this stage, but they said they've learnt a lot of lessons from that and they accept the department should have had more oversight in relation to it and that, that is assisting their planning for future projects. Um, next item then is the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. Um, the Commission recommends the Department prioritise the production of consolidated central government financial statements. That's accepted and they're working on it internationally with the OECD. Uh, the recommendation 29 is to ensure that um, proposal to improve coordination of government accounting, that's including the various state bodies. They accept that as part of the review with the OECD. And then we're nearly there in the Department of Finance. 
we recommended that the Minister should endeavour to make sure progress. This is in relation to the GNI star of measuring activity in national income. And the, the accept is very clear. It's not a European rule. They say on several times there is no, and I'm quoting from the, the official reply, there is no legal status for GNI star, which is purely a domestic measure and is not defined in the European system of accounts. So we understand that they're saying you'd have to get consent of all of the EU countries if you're to change the European system of accounts. But they go on to say that the European Commission, while they use the, 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 G, the normal GNI, not the Irish GNI star, they do actually, in, when they're looking at Ireland, take the GNI star into account. But it doesn't have legal standing, and they say to change that would be an EU change. So they accept the point that was well made here at this committee as only a domestic figure, and it's not an internationally accepted figure, but the Commission do take it into account. So. Yeah, but just on that, because I think it's important to restate it, they might take it into account yeah. in terms of, well, we accept that's the figure that's used, but it's meaningless yeah. because okay. it's the GMP figure that's used to calculate and to implement the fiscal rules or any rules. You know, the application of any policy, if you like, is based on, the, on, on GDP. It's not, not yeah. GDP. So they, they accept it. In fact, the No, but I'm just saying that they accept that. Yeah. They might, it's, the, the, the Commission might understand yeah. why GNI is used in Ireland, yeah. you know, in terms of uh, a better, uh, more accurate reflection of the Irish. state's yeah. accounts. I, I, but I'll read the sentence that they say on that. It's on page 22. While the fiscal rules will continue to be based on GDP, the Commission also yeah. acknowledge in their assessment of Ireland's 2018 stability programme that GNI star more accurately reflects yeah. the income standards of Irish no, residents no. and the uh, public debt sustainability and, all, and, and also needs to be assessed against complementary indicators such as debt to GNI star. They're accepting everything you say. Yeah. The rules are the rules. They're European rules. They do take it into consideration when they're issuing the stability reports for Ireland, but they still don't have legal standing. Yeah. What they're basically saying is that debt to GNI is a better reflection, is more accurate than debt to GDP in Ireland. But the problem is the fiscal rules yeah. use debt to GDP, not debt to GNI. So, in, in, in yeah. for presentational, uh, um, in presentational terms, in terms of the reports, they might reflect the fact that GNI is more accurate. But my point is, it's meaningless in terms of policy. Yeah, it is, and not as at far, European far, level. Far more important. Our contribution to the EU is based on G, um, GDP, not GNI star. So this is cost in Ireland, I think, several hundred million each year that are GNI star. I think is the is the indicator. Is the indicator, but not, yeah, but GNI, not star. GNI star. So it does actually mean, based on what they accept is kind of more appropriate to Ireland, our contribution is not based on what's more appropriate to Ireland. It's based on the EU-wide standard, which actually in reality means Ireland is paying a higher contribution um, to the EU each year based on the European legal issue uh, definition rather than our domestic GNI. Although if I'm right, I, I think, think they were a, saying that... There is an outcome and a consequence of this. But That's also, and just so it's on the record, I, I think I, I might be... We can check this, but I think they were saying that because we use uh, GDP and not GNI or GNI star in terms of uh, working out the fiscal rules, the fiscal space is actually greater. Yeah because of that. It should actually be less. I think that's what they were saying. So maybe we shouldn't show too loud. In fact, GNI star is a much higher debt burden. Uh, and, and therefore, if you were to substitute that, uh, you'd be in a much, much tighter fiscal space, yeah. would be my interpretation. Maybe we shouldn't show too loud. Yeah. yeah. But, but at the same time, it is costing this Irish taxpayer money in extra contributions each year. Well, it, it's, it's kind of swings and merry-go-rounds. I mean, you're taking in more corporation tax uh, as well, yeah. which is the thing that's driving the GDP. Yeah. There's a so, complementary... you know, I, I think you can't just look at one aspect of it and say, well, that's a problem when you're benefiting on the other side. Yeah. Okay. It, it needs to be looked at as a holistic... Um, look, uh, I think the PAC exercise. has done a good job in highlighting that, and during the course of our meeting, we've got very useful documentation put out there in the public arena which would be of interest to those people who follow those things. And it was, we fulfilled the role in terms of public accounts by dealing with this matter publicly. Then the next um, department is the Department of Justice and Equality. 
And we said the committee recommends that the Chief State Solicitor's Office ensures its oversight mechanisms are sufficient to prevent reoccurrence of the unacceptable waste of taxpayers' money. And that's where um, the probation service uh, took over a building in Wultone Street in Dublin, uh, but was never occupied. And we were told that the advice from the Chief State Solicitor's Office was based on legal professional privilege. And it's good. Um, they, they accept this. And the, the Minister has written back, the, the Department will commence a process of relevant law with relevant law officers to examine how legal professional privilege will be protected in future in a manner which is, insofar as possible, consistent with the accountability role of the PAC. So they're accepting we have a valid point. They're saying we'll go as far as we can to meeting that in future, but there will still always be an issue of legal privilege, but they're now accepting the need to go the road with us in terms of public accountability and that's actually good to see that okay um, the next item was the the um the toll and report in the department of justice they accept that and we know there's a program for change ongoing on that department and we can continue to raise it when they're back again and then finally um the committee re recommended a number of steps to address the um, monitor to follow through in relation to that and the Department are and we can come back to that at any stage when we're dealing with the Department of Justice again and then the last section was the strategic communications unit in the Department of Antishok and they accept our recommendation um, that the process should proceed in the manner outlined by the General Secretary of the Department of Antishok in his review of the operation of the strategic communications unit and they make clear that they're accept we're accepting the Secretary General's review and they make it very clear then in terms of implementing that review. I'll read out a couple of points. Um, a public body should always ensure that they have the right to sign off on documentation. So they say now that any new items um, that will have to be clearly identified if it's being paid for, that is called editorial advertisement sponsored or commercial feature. And they also say that where media partnership or agencies, third parties to use final editorial control of sign-off must be with the relevant department. And should anyone be interviewed for an advertorial or informational commercial, they should be informed of the purpose of their permission being sought. That's people welcoming issues but not know it's as part of a paid advert advertisement. Third, and they say politicians and public representatives should not feature in any paid for content by government other than the relevant office holders, i.e. the minister. So I think that is clarifying all that issue. And then the, the final thing was in relation to RTE and the licensing system. And they say that th there's a working group was established um, there were proposals before the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Communication and Climate Change. They sent proposals to government, and on the 28th of July, they've established a working group arising out of the pre alleged scrutiny by that committee, and they obviously will report back to that committee. And they also say they're looking at the possibility of the collection of the licence fee by revenue commissioners contracting it externally as provided in the Broadcasting Amendment Act. There's no com commitment, it's just been examined. And finally then, in relation to the Eversheds report and RTE, they, they, the RTE has accepted the recommendation that we made um, in relation to the Evershed report. And, and that is the final recommendation, RTE have accepted our recommendation on that, uh, David. Yeah, they have accepted it. And I did ask at the last meeting that we write to RTE to uh, get an update on the implementation of the Evershed report right. and its recommendations. That it, it was to review the contracts which are there. As I said, I've been contacted or was contacted a number of weeks ago by several of those employees who have still not had any contact from RTE management. Okay. So what I was seeking was a breakdown of the 157 and the 433, what was done, how many were contacted, uh, and if they haven't been contacted, why? Now, I sought this last week because the workers themselves are saying that, listen, if they accept the recommendations, uh, they should be implemented. And okay. it's months on now, and yet a lot of them haven't heard anything. So can so we, we just follow up? One way or the other, can we follow up on as indicated, Did we follow up, sorry, first? Last week. We did get a response. No. No, we, oh. that was only last week. We oh, followed okay. that up. We have, okay. we have so written. we can give us another week. Yes, yeah. only last and week. And we will okay. follow that up. So we'll note on yeah. our review of that report to follow that up. Okay, that's a long, extensive report. Some good stuff. 
I think the main issue is, we'll come back to the Department of Housing and local government, they just noted our items but didn't really accept any. Most other departments accepted the vast majority of everything we recommended and we're following up the implementation of those recommendations. So next item of correspondence, that was the biggest item, was 1730, the CEO of local government management agency in relation to a request from the committee for a copy of the report arising from the value for money review of Irish public bodies. The report is subject to a non-disclosure agreement with the LGMA and Irish public bodies and PricewaterhouseCoopers. The CEO has written to both bodies to request their consent and to release the report and we are awaiting a response. Um, the Secretary is keeping an eye on this and will return to this item um, in December and update the committee in the position. So uh, we note and publish that. I think we've mentioned that in public session before. Next item 1725 from the Secretary General of the Department of Education and Skills regarding the structural assessments carried out on schools constructed by Western Building System. Um, um, at the, we agreed to note and publish this item and request a briefing from the department when we will meet them in the new year. When education are in, we'll raise that, but we'll note and publish that document which we had here last week. Uh, 1731 from the Department of Culture, Heritage and Gale Talk, dated the 19th of November. It's a signed performance delivery agreement between the Department of Galway 2020. And we noted an unsigned version of the document last week, so we note and publish this now. Next item is 1737 from um, Jackie, Mc uh, Jackie McGuire, Chairperson of the <laughs> County and City Managers Association, dated the 20th of November 2018, in relation to the Commission's request for a representative to attend a meeting in relation to housing. The Association have provided some information in relation, and but they've decided, um, they've declined our request to attend. We've already requested the Association to review um, the rarity of decision, the association states that they will um, provide assistance to the accounting officer of the Secretary General of the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government, who is the accountable officer to the PSC. Um, I think the members will be very disappointed that senior public <coughs> servants in local authority who are at the front line of dealing with okay. the housing crisis are deciding to make them, not make themselves available on a voluntary basis to the PAC in its examination of the matters in relation to housing. So we note and publish and I call Deputy uh, Cullen Ann. <coughs> we ask them <coughs> for further advice and further assistance. We, we never suggested that they were within the remit or accountable to the PAC. We stress that. It is a voluntary um, attendance and very disappointed that they would choose not to do so. And we will come back to um, this issue because we will be having a second meeting on the housing issue and um, early in the new year. Deputy Cullinan. Yeah, no, I just want to say but I, I think it's unacceptable that yeah. they won't come before us. We had a number of bodies which have come before us on yes. a voluntary basis. Uh, private nursing home providers, for example, RTE, which we just yeah. dealt with earlier. So I think it's an act of bad faith, really, that they won't come before us. I mean, it's not good enough that they'll say they'll furnish us with information. Uh, if we're going to look at housing and the relationship between, because housing obviously it's the, one of the biggest issues is the relationship between the Department of Housing and local authorities. That's one of the obvious links. Um, and especially in an environment where we've had ministers and indeed the department putting some of the blame and the responsibility back on local authorities for maybe not moving quickly enough or for not being ambitious enough in terms of their own plans and um, not using money that's there, for example, that they say is there. This is the department. Now, uh, if they don't turn up, then they're not doing themselves any favours, in my view. Um, and I just think it's a slap in the face to us to say, well, listen, we're not coming. We'll give you information, but we're not coming before, before you. Yeah. And these are, as you put it, they're not you know, just anybody. They're CEOs of local authorities and representatives of all local authorities across the state. So I don't think we sh should just accept it and note it. I think we need to go back to them again and say, we have a job of work to do in relation to our evaluation of housing and processes. They have a valuable role to play. And we, it's constructive in terms of our work and, our, and the engagement we want with them. But I don't think we should just note yeah. this and accept okay. it. We, will, no, we, will. we can't compel them, or we, <coughs> but we can, no. but we don't want to, or we can't. Uh, force them and that they, we have to point out they don't have to come before us. Okay, so the, the Deputy is quite right. We will, um, well, we'll, we'll publish this document, um, this letter, and the committee is dis dissatisfied with the response and we will come back to this matter because we will be discussing housing after the break, after the Christmas break, when we will be returning <coughs> and we'll see what mechanism can 
be achieved in terms of having some people who are on the front line, as they tell us, they're the key people on the front line um, dealing with this issue because the deal would happen, RAS, and several issues, which is taxpayers' money, not to mind the building programme and approving um, application for approved housing bodies. And it, it, it's a slap in the face to the people of Ireland that the chief executives of the local authority will collectively decide not to appear before an Oireachtas committee that's discussing housing. And we will come back to that. But we could have, just to make this point, we could have went directly to a number of local authorities, the might. bigger ones. And we but might. we could have, and asked <coughs> that the CEOs come. But we went through the proper organisation and the proper channels. And that, that point should be made. Yeah. So we did the right thing. Uh, this is the body that represents all of the CEOs of local authorities. Yeah. Uh, it has a clear function. Yeah. And one of its functions should be to help, I would imagine one of its functions should be or is to help policy makers and to help the Oireachtas. So yeah. the, it strikes the, me, the why is it there in the first place? The, the deputy is quite right. In, in the letter, us. the second letter we wrote to them, we specifically said that individual chief executives of some local authorities perhaps will come, not yeah. representing the CCMA, yeah. but come in their own capacity to help us. And that option is still available. And we will discuss that option again. Um, they may not come under the CCMA hat, but we do need to see some chief executives or some local authorities here uh, when we come back to discuss the housing. Okay, so th that's where we are on that. Next item is 1738 from Tusla, date of 19th of November, providing an update in relation to the service level agreement with, with third party funded agencies. We noted that the HSE have service level agreements in place with their funded organisation. Tusla had a problem in that regard and they now are saying that they have, they're fully on top of that. The next item of correspondence is 1739 from Robert Watt, Secretary General of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, dated the 6th of November, providing follow-up information requested um, from our committee in relation to a, a large number of items. And I would suggest, I'm just requesting we hold this one over. Well, we'll discuss it. Okay, Deputy, there's quite a lot in this document, yeah. Yeah, this is to do with the sick days. The sick leave, yeah. Sick leave, yeah. Listen, can I just say, when I read this first, uh, I think we need to be careful how we respond to it, because it is obviously people who have put in for sick leave, and yeah. I don't want to cast any aspersions at any individuals. Um, I think the figures actually point to maybe uh, whether or not there's issues in relation to the work environment in some state bodies. But the average sick day... Uh, across the pub, sick days across the public service is 10.1. But then when you go uh, look at those organisations that are above the average, uh, employment and social protection are 13 days, Garda Síochána Ombudsman Commission 12, the Irish Prison Service 15.7. Like, I don't think that would be a surprise to some of the members here given that we had a whistleblower before us uh, in private session. Is that more to do with work practices? 15.7, that's three full working but weeks. Some of them could be as a result of assaults. In the it could be, but work, yeah. and there might be issues. There's but lots it, of them. It's three weeks, yeah. it's still a lot. Revenue at 11.4, two weeks. Yeah. Uh, transport, tourism and sport, 11.2. So I'm asking that any of those that are above the average, can the Secretariat take a note of those and when those departments are in, that's one of the issues that's put to them and that we want a response from them when they come in. Because if you're above the average, like some of them, and, and there's huge variations. For example, the Department of Antisho, 3.5. Yeah. And yet you have revenue, 11.4. How can there be such variations? Yeah. Doesn't, there, there might be a reason for it, but I'd like to know what the reason yeah. is. <clears throat> so, so that chart at the end of that document is an excellent chart and mm. uh, I think we need to, to publish that and put it on the, the record and you've summarised some, that, that, that chart that right across all government departments shows the number of days lost in each department and the average being 10 and you said there's clearly some outliers and clearly some departments that have a very low um, days lost due to sick leave as based on the 2017 figures. So we'll publish that and yeah. we might... Yeah, and can I just, just want to, just so, I'm very, yeah. so people are clear on it, um, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong in terms of yeah. the public servants who claim sick leave. I'm just looking at where the variations are. And I think you made the point, the Irish prison service is high for very obvious reasons, but more, more the reason why we then need to look at the work environments in which these people work, because these are public servants and, who and deserve our support and protection yeah. as well. And if the sick leave is, is high in some of those areas, in the prison service being an obvious one. But then there's one, it's less obvious why it's high. And I think we just need to get an understanding. Is there, is there a problem in revenue? 
that we yeah. should know about? Well, is there a problem in social protection that we should know about? And social protection are here in a half an hour. Yeah. And, and what, after the prison service, the level of sick leave is, um, is next highest, a 30, an average of 13 per annum in the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection. So that's the question we put to the Secretary General here as soon as we uh, have the witness in. Deputy McSharry. Yeah, just uh, protected disclosures is kind of buried in there in the middle. Uh, and it's kind of an outline of the fact that they have no protected disclosures in the last few years within the Department themselves. Uh, maybe members can help me, but my memory of, of that particular exchange where we did ask at the end of themselves in the department was more their role in terms of enforcement and oversight, but they're not being handled well elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, what action is taken if it's not, or is there monitoring, or what's the situation? Because uh, I think it was said at this committee in terms of the committee's experience of protected disclosures, there certainly seems to be issues in terms of how things are handled. Them. Um, the perception of people reviewing themselves and and, 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 uh, and, and all of that. So uh, uh, that was kind of what I was expecting. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I was expecting back from them. Look, we'll come back to that topic because they did issue a report recently in relation to the operation of the protected disclosures. And it was one of the poorest reports I've ever seen published. Uh, I had no engagement from any person who had made a protected disclosure. It was just look like a desktop thing among senior officials. It was one of the weakest reports. So we will come back to that. The report officially is very poor. Right. We've noted it before. So look, at, we'll, we can deal with the absences with the line department as a common law, and that, that matter, we, we no problem coming back to that issue again. So, um, that's, so we'll note and publish that. Then the next item is from the Chief Executive of the IDA providing information requested by the Commission regarding the annual employment survey. Now, what we have to put in the record here is we had asked details of the annual employment survey that um, obviously the other schemes are done on a very specific basis in terms of checking the numbers of people who are employed as a result of particular fund, funded schemes operated by the department. However, or the IDA, but we did ask them to know what was the response rate in relation to their surveys. Was it a 5% response or 95%? So to say, on completion of the 2017 survey, the response rate stood at 94% of the total population. That, to me, on the face, that seemed a very high response, and that's, that's a figure you could rely on if they have a 94% response. So we just wanted to check the veracity of the survey. That would appear, from my first reading on it, as to be a good response, Deputy. Yeah, the problem wasn't um, the response rate. So the response rate is high. The difficulty or the issue that I raised, and this is why I'm, I'm following up on this, is the nature of the survey itself. It's a self-assessment yeah. survey. And I don't believe that it's correct to say where the, uh, sorry, what's the person who signed the letter? Is that the CEO? Is it it would be the CNO. CEO, yeah. yeah. Where the CEO says that these are accurate figures. It's an assessment. It's an estimate. You can't say it's accurate because it's self-assessment. Like the problem was, there's what controls are in place, what follow-up, what inspections are in place to make sure the figures are accurate. We were never given any information to uh, reassure us that that is the case. So to say these are accurate figures, I don't accept that. Okay. So I think we need to go back to them and say, that's great, 94% uh, of the companies fill in the forms, that's fine. But again, on what basis do they fill in the forms? Self-assessment, and then what's the follow-up? So how did they uh, confirm that the figures that they got are actually accurate? What okay. for, what? What's the confirmation process? Exactly. Okay. What, so and, and I don't think there. there it's it, it from my understanding, it was. It was. Uh, I don't even know if there was one, or it, it wasn't to my satisfaction anyway. Fine, and, and the day is carried out by an agency on behalf of the IDA, not them yeah. directly. So yeah. we can ask for more specific details regarding verification um, of the figures. They do, 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 do that. Okay. Next item then is um, one seven four four from the Chief Executive Hickwe, providing an update requested by the Committee's examination of the cost of agency staff. And in that letter, he says that they've been approved, um, the, the, he says there's been a significant improvement in the permanent staff. Um, he said the total number of posts in Hikwa <coughs> are now 279, an increase in 47 posts from January 18, which seems significant. Um, he's saying there's, and they have funding for um, most of the requests for additional staff have now been approved and funding provided. 
Um, I would say that if people want to get a copy of the workforce plan, he said he would be happy to provide a copy of this workforce plan to the committee. I think he's offered it. We'll take him up on the offer to see a copy. Yeah, we'll take him up on the offer. He's offered it. And we'll get a um, ask for a copy of the workforce plan. Well, according to the correspondence, obviously, they are dealing with the agency issue and they've got the resources to deal with the agency yeah. issue and bring. Well, that would be great, but let's see if it's actually happening. Okay. Because obviously, significant issues were there previously. Okay, and we'll get the copy of the workforce plan. Okay. And given the work that they do, continuity of workforce and continuity of thought in relation to what they're doing, I think it would be very important. Very important. Okay, next letter then was from um, the HSC confirming that the findings and recommendations of the Hanaway report um, okay. um, took the form of a presentation. We'd asked for a full copy of the report to say there's only a slight presentation, and that was the full extent of the report. And Deputy Kelly. No, I just no. I was surprised by it, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. yeah, there didn't seem to be anything else prepared for us. Could we write back and just ask, <coughs> okay, there may not be a report, but is there any relevant documentation that they would might like to make the committee aware of? Yeah, and, and when it was presented, were minutes taken of the presentation Absolutely. and the discussion on the presentation. I was surprised that there was no report. Yeah, a slight, a slight presentation, and there had to be some discussion on, on that, Absolutely. maybe a minute's take. Any relevant documentation, yeah. minutes, etc. Relevant to that. Okay, grand. Okay, next item then is um, uh, 1748, received from the Revenue Commissioners dated the 26th of November, uh, providing clarification. We spotted just uh, a wrong decimal point of a matter of 100 million in one of their letters, a part of our periodic report, and they've corrected the figures, and that's happy it's been. We'll be publishing a report next week, and that the correct figures will be in it. Next item is, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's uh, 1.76 billion is the, the figure, is my. Yeah. Um, I think they had put down, they had put down the, the amount in dispute was 7.01 million. Sorry, it's 176 million. It should be 176 million. million. It should be 176 million. million yeah. yeah, it should be 100 million, I think, yeah. yeah. But we've got the correct it's, figures for yeah. our, our periodic report, and, Joe, we're, we're watching carefully. Okay. Um, next item then is um, 1750 from. One, 1749, it should be, from the Higher Education Authority, dated 26th of November, providing the following information requested. Um, and we requested this for our forthcoming periodic report. Um, this is a table relating to most university costs in the second, on the second page of the attached. The committee are looking for a breakdown of the direct and indirect costs. Just for the periodic. Yeah, and then further information on matching fundings from the HEA contribution. That's fine. That's, we, we saw that information, but they, they don't give us a breakdown, a, a detailed breakdown of the, in, the, they don't. They've just broken it down between direct and indirect costs, and we have that figure in our um, periodic report, which will be ex, uh, published next week. Next item, 1750 from Garda Sheikh Khanna, 26th of November, providing information requested by the committee. Um, in relation to response to queries regarding the ICT directorate payment process, the extension of project agreement at the 3rd of December 2014 for the provision of skilled resources. Um, again, this information is included, will be included in our periodic report. And it looks, um, there's, we'll note and publish this, and they give a breakdown of all the different categories under the ICT contracts, and particularly to say that the approach allows for the current skill resource contract to be broken into a number of manageable contracts and also allows for better competition under the OGP, ICT skilled resource framework. Rather than having this one massive contract going to one company, they're now saying they're breaking it down into manageable amounts that can be tendered separately. So it will obviously be a bit more competition and hopefully a better, and that's progress. So it's good to follow that and they acknowledge that there. Next item then. Um, we note and publish that. Correspondence C, that's um, from private individuals. This is from an individual dated the 20th of November. The correspondent makes a number of interesting points in relation to developments at the University of Limerick. I propose to note this for the time being, and we may consider these points when we come to consider the CNAG's report in relation to UL and Sligo, which you published a couple of days ago. So we will be coming, we will we'll discuss... The HEA there, or an email from the HEA. 1749. Yeah. One, one, is that coming up? Look, I've just covered it. 
um, what, what is said about the HG. I must have been asleep. Yeah. What is it? We asked for a breakdown of the cost between the direct and the indirect costs. Yeah. And we wanted that for a periodic report. And they've just provided the, a break. The, they've separated it between direct and indirect costs. That's all they've done. We haven't gone any further. To yeah, we have, but that's not, we wanted it further. Well, then we'll ask again for further. Yeah, but that's okay. what I'm saying, because in our report, we won't be able to conclude okay. and just say that we're waiting for this information. Yeah, but we'll conclude based on the information we have to publish a report, but we can put a sentence into a report that we've now requested a further breakdown and we're awaiting this at the time of publication okay. of the report. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Sorry about that. that. Yeah. Yeah, the reports now in the education sector that the CNAG has done, the, the Limerick Sligo one and the Waterford one. So I would propose that we could deal with both on the same day if possible. Yeah. Um, and just to make one remark, if I can, on the Limerick Sligo one, um, and maybe just put a question to the CNAG if I can. I read the report several times and I found it quite shocking. But is it the case, and I'm, 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 I want to be careful how I put this, but is it the case that the university itself, and I'm talking about Limerick, misled the CNAG's office previously in relation to documentation. Would that be your assessment? Yes, that, that is the finding. And um, I, I think as well, uh, you'll recall that when the university were here on a previous occasion, uh, they had to come back twice, I think, to make corrections to the information that was given to the... So to if we have a university that misled the CNAG in and, terms and of its work and the department and possibly the committee. The, this committee as well. That's incredible. And it, it, it chimes with what we were saying when they were here, because we were getting pushback from these universities. What are we asking questions for? We're being too tough. It goes back to this public perception that's not public perception, but from some in the commentariat that the PEC is overstepping the mark and we're unfair to witnesses, which I completely reject. But here's a situation very clear to us now that we had accounting officers before us that didn't give us the information that we sought. In fact, maybe gave us uh, inaccurate information. Certainly, it seems, gave inaccurate information to the CNHG. That's quite serious. Okay. Um, and I think we have to come back to it. So I'm asking that um, both the Waterford one, which is not in the same space, to yeah. be fair. Yeah. It does, that's not about wrong information. Um, I'm talking about the Limerick one. Yeah. Uh, that, but I think we can deal with both on the same day. Okay, we'll put it. We'll because try. if the CNG does report special reports, I think we have a responsibility to follow up. On. And we always do. So next week we'll go through a draft work program for the January February period for, for next week, and we'll have that on. Deputy McSharry. That report published by the minister or whatever. So, yeah. um, it's out there. So the likelihood of us getting to that is, is probably January February. It is the new year. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, there's only a fortnight. Yeah. So look, at, we'll we'll go through a work program for the new year um, next week, you know, and uh, we'll try and sign off on on priorities from the committee's point of view of what we want to deal with and the the, the sequence. So th that's noted and published. Uh, and sorry, it's not noted and published. That letter was from an individual, and we can discuss that in the context of the meeting you just referred to. Next item, 1742, from Deputy Catherine Murphy, with her proposal regarding our forthcoming meeting with the Department of Communication, Time and Action, and Reform on the 6th. We we'll notice this and return to it when we're considering a work program. Well, what, what I will say is Deputy, Deputy um, Catherine Murphy, and she can raise it later on in the meeting um, when she's present, she is saying that um, while we have the department in next week, she wanted uh, us to consider extending an invitation to BT Air, Image and CSIRO and ENET as they will be in a position to give evidence from a non-departmental perspective. So we have that request from Deputy Murphy. What I would propose is the next week's meeting go ahead as scheduled because we're not going to mix uh, you know, the private sector at such short notice with the department. But I think um, we will ask Deputy, maybe we will consider inviting some of those companies to give us information other than what we're hearing from the department like other companies have come into us in the past during our project eagle report and other items like that and when it came to the cervical check issue the nikki fail and stephen teep did provide a very important public counterbalance to what we were being told by the hse and it helped 
um, us in our work in that regard. So I'm of a mind to do that, but we wait until Deputy uh, Murphy. We might discuss it somewhere along the line in the course of the afternoon. But it won't happen for next Thursday, but possibly um, in the, uh, at a later date. And then finally, we have uh, 1746 from Deputy Alan Kelly, who is requesting further details from the EHEA regarding the implementation of employee assistant, assistance helplines and the names of firms providing them across the colleges. Um, we will forward the schedule that Deputy Kelly has provided yeah. it. Yeah. So, Chair, so Chair <laughs> like, this is actually quite annoying. Yeah. I mean, we made a specific request for, and like, you try and help witnesses when you're looking for information, you, you, they mightn't have it on them, so you ask them to write back in. So I asked for, when each institution put in employees, employee assistance line, and they wrote back with a generic email, with a, sorry, a general response saying these are examples. I don't want the examples. I want to know specifically when each institution put in an employee assistance line. So I've had to know, and this just makes up work, I've had to know, and I, I didn't mind if they didn't have it in a week or two. I wasn't expecting straight away. But I've had to go now and actually write out a table with list off the institutions and then ask them to bring the dates of when it was put in place in each one of them. Like this is just chasing the tail, chasing around. It should be information that basically the HEA write out to all the institutions and say within two weeks come back and confirm the date and when you put this in and fill in and send it on to us. Okay, so um, as I say, um, we'll send them that schedule. <laughs> yeah. And we'll keep, on, we'll keep on them very closely to get, okay. to get it fully completed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So next item on the agenda are the statements and the accounts received since the last meeting. I think there are six. And we're nearly there in terms of this section of the meeting. Then we'll get on to the real. Okay, the first item is the Social Insurance Fund, the clear audit opinion. Um, deals the estimated level of irregular payments in respect of certain uh, social insurance fund schemes which are material and we'll be discussing this today at a meeting this afternoon so we, we know that Broadcasting Authority of Ireland clear audit opinion and to, except there's a note um, that they had attention is drawn to note six in the financial statement which sets out that the Broadcasting Authority had not had a formal contract in place with the Chief Executive since October 2010. Uh, can you give us the up-to-date position? Is there as I know, it, uh, at least the last we were um, informed, it still hadn't been um, approved. Okay. So uh, it, it doesn't have ministerial approval, which is required by law. Okay. So we're writing directly to the chairperson of the board. Mm. As the, this is the responsibility of the chairperson to ensure there's a contract in place for the chief executive, asking him to explain the position and to regularise it and give us the reason why this has continued for all those years. So right, we're writing to the chairman only. Next one is the regulator of the National Lottery of Ireland, clear audit opinion. It's not the National Lottery, it's just the regulator's office. Next one, the National yeah, Lottery. Yeah. What did it do? The regulator. Yeah. The National Lottery. Do you remember? The next account is actually the National Lottery Fund. Oh, no, the fund, yeah. But yeah. you remember the, the, the Neon claim prizes? Yep. Yeah. And, and we were wondering where they went yeah. and, and yeah. how much they were and, yeah. and who, did any, was anyone told how much it was? No. no we were never no. given a figure. No. They, were, they were told... Is the regulator? The regulator knows. The regulator knows. Yes. yes. And they're happy enough. They're, yeah. they're satisfied. They're yes. satisfied yes. that this do you, being do you, do you get told? Um, I'm not sure if we have the thing, but I, I wouldn't uh, see any reason so why just I kind of assume. be told. Regulator says, you can take it from me, everything is in order, and we all accept that. No, it? but I, I think we can, we can see the workings uh, you, you around can. that. We can, yeah. And you're happy, all right. Yeah. They're probably, Sorry. yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Deputy. So we note that. And the National Lottery Fund, um, clear audit opinion, and then the export guarantee account, there was no turnover in that, um, on that particular year for 2017. Clear audit opinion and National Training Fund um, established... Um, to raise the skills of those in employment and give job seekers relevant skills and to facilitate lifelong learning, a uh, clear audit opinion. So that and that. In relation then to the next item, the work programme, um, we'll discuss Catherine Murphy's um, request to invite third parties in in relation to the broadband plan at the meeting next week. And in relation to the meeting, we had hoped 
Um, social Protection are here today, and we thought if we didn't get finished, we might bring them back on the 13th. So, so next week we have the Department of Communications, and we'll be dealing with the broadband plan as well as their vote. But for the following week, the, the last meeting before Christmas on as Thursday the 13th, um, the Department of Employment and Social Protection were not available to return on that day. So there's a special report produced by the CNAG on school transport. Some members <coughs> asked that. Might be just a simple, straightforward net issue to deal with yeah, on yeah, our last day of the board of prison break. So so that's been the sole item on so, that day. So Chair, just clarify now. Um, on next Thursday we're dealing with the Department of Communication Communications yeah, and the National Broadband Climate Change and yeah. whatever the new and title. The Including the broadband. So we're dealing with their vote and we're dealing with the broad matters relating to the broadband plan. Yeah. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, and secondly then on the ninth on yeah. the thirteenth, we're dealing with the provision of school transport. A special report. So that's but, the last meeting before we... And who what witnesses will we have for that? Department of Education will ask them to transport. bring CIE people with them. No, 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 transport. Transport. Or, no, is it transport? Yeah. We, this, we this, know, this, this, okay, Deputy. Yeah, yeah. What, what is the Deputy? Um, no. Can I just ask a question, yeah. please? Um, this is a real issue. Um, I speak here with some knowledge as have been in the Department of Transport. Um, this is in the Department of Education. And um, obviously, with a special report, it's, and they're the right people to bring in. But there's a serious crossover here with the Department of Transport, and yeah. you'd have to consider. Do we not need to bring in even just some people from the Department of Transport purely on the basis of lap over here? I mean, personally, I'm not satisfied that it's in the right department. I was never satisfied it was in the right department. There's the, the, you know, the, the crossover and the economies certainly can't be materialised by this being in the Department of Education. So is there any way or a feeling that we should, given we're discussing a special report, that we should bring in Department of Education official or Department of Transport officials as well. Just a request. Yeah, yeah. Uh, controller, um, I think some time ago, is there a separate fund published on the school transport? Or um, the, the, the funding for our bus Aaron comes from different sources. There's the free travel. There's the oh, subsidy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I but, know that. But the issue has always been raised is the funding for school transport cross subsidising other services or vice versa. I don't know, and I think it's very hard to get there. A significant you know, yeah. part of the expenditure by the Department of Education and Skills goes to Bus Aaron, who provide the bulk of the service and who effectively manage the um, what we call the large scale mobilisation. I think th there is some um, provision otherwise through grants and so on to individual parents for individual children. <coughs> but a substantial part of the, uh, the, the spend is uh, with Bosserne. And it f actually forms a substantial part of the turnover of Bosserne. Huge. In, in the year. So I can see that there is, there is certainly an interest on the part of the Department of Transport in this. So when you were doing your report, did you, did you deal only with education? We, we went through the Department of Education and by agreement uh, that opened the door for us in Bus Aaron. I don't audit Bus Aaron. But you didn't go to um, the Department of Transport? And there, there was some contact with the Department of Transport okay, so who, just who, to get their, their views. Obviously so education are the line department for the vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. They will have I, to have I think the, 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 the Assistant Secretary in charge of transport. Yeah. Uh, land transport would yeah. be the appropriate person because there is a huge overlap here um, and given that the, report, the way in which we all have issues in relation to school transport, we all have had constituency issues, we all know the way in which it's structured, like I, I have the bizarre scenario where people living beside me, some are being told they have to go to school in Clare as opposed to like it's yeah. just bizarre stuff but anyway that's a side issue. The issue here is when it comes to uh, school transport and bus airing Bus Aaron without school transport, like, isn't Bus Aaron, to be honest with you. I mean, we'd be looking at a completely different scenario for Bus Aaron. You've now got the whole overlap in relation to rural transport and rural transport schemes and the connotations there. So I don't see, and there's lo loads of other issues as well, I don't see how we can really go through a special report without having representatives of transport here because really they're over Bus Aaron, Bus Aaron provide the service, the overlap here is huge, 
and really we'd be, we'd be okay. one, leg, one leg of the stool short. Okay, so obviously education are here, they'll have a representative from both there and with them. And what we clearly know, in the department, aside from ministers, nominees and the board, who have a fiduciary duty to the board, not to us, I presume there's a liaison officer between the department and both here and the, person, the, the, go, the, the link person. In the Department of Education? Yeah. Yes. There is. Well, that's the person we need, I would think. Well, isn't I, it? Think, I think we need the Assistant Secretary or whoever okay. is the relevant person, Principal Officer from the Department of Transport, who manages Bus CIE Bus Air. Agreed. Agreed. So we will have the three groups Thank you. here. Agreed. Okay. So that's that meeting. So then um, I think at this stage there's a couple of items we want to deal with in private session before the witnesses take their seats. So um, we are now in private session. Do you want us to leave? Okay. The Public Accounts Committee has a very extensive agenda today. We will be examining the appropriation accounts vote 37 for the Department of Social Protection, um, Chapter 11 from the CNAG report regarding the regularity of social welfare payments, Chapter 12, Job Path Employment Activation Services, Job, <coughs> Chapter 13, Actuarial Review of the Social Insurance Fund, Chapter 14, Overpayments of Age Related Job Seekers Allowance, Chapter 20, uh, PRSI Contributions by the Self Implied, uh, the 2017 Social Insurance Fund. So, in order to provide structure to today's meeting, we will take all matters relating to the rental supplement and HAP and the chapter on the PRSI contribution by the self-employed in the afternoon when we will be joined by representatives of the Department of Housing, Planning, Local Government and from the Revenue Commissioners on that matter. So we are joined uh, today by officials from the Department of Employment and Social Protection, John McEwan, Secretary General, uh, John Conlon, and Vaughan, Kathleen Stack, Deirdre Shanley, Patricia Murphy, Jim MacDonald. And I would like to acknowledge that the Department has already given um, extensive material to us, even though the invitation was at short notice. We're also joined by the Department, from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform by Grainne McGuckey and Principal Officer. Um, can I remind members and witnesses in those in the public gallery to turn off their mobile phones completely and put them onto the airplane mode, as merely putting them on silent uh, will not be adequate because that can interfere with the recording system. I wish to advise witnesses that by virtue of 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person or persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her it identifiable. Members of the committee are reminded of Standing Order Number 186 that the committee shall refrain from inquiring into the merits of a policy or policies of the government or a minister of the government or the merits of the objectives of such policies. While we expect witnesses to answer all questions put to the committee clearly and with candour, witnesses can and should expect to be treated fairly and with respect and consideration at all times in accordance with the witness protocol. So we will start by taking the opening statement um, from the controller and auditor general. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as the members are aware, the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection operates a wide range of income support, welfare and labour activation schemes. Expenditure on the schemes is spread across two accounts the appropriation account for vote 37 and the account of the Social Insurance Fund. The Department's overall expenditure on scheme payments in 2017 totaled 19.3 billion euros. Expenditure on administration of the schemes amounted to a further 618 million euros. An annex to the appropriation account provides a useful summary of the combined programme expenditure and sets out the expenditure on a scheme-by-scheme -scheme basis. The vote account is funded mainly through direct exchequer issues. In contrast, the Social Insurance Fund is financed mainly from pay-related social insurance contributions, which are collected by the Revenue Commissioners acting as the Department's collection agent. Receipts into the fund have recovered in recent years as employment and earnings levels have increased. Total receipts in 2017 were 10.2 billion euros, up 6.6% year-on-year. 
The receipts included some €422 million Euros in levies payable to the National Training Fund operated by the Department of Education and Skills. The surplus for the year was €731 million, Euros, leaving the fund with accumulated reserves of €1.2 billion Euros at the year end. I gave a clear audit opinion on the accounts of both the vote and the Social Insurance Fund for 2017. Welfare recipients may be paid amounts to which they are not entitled or which exceed their entitlements. Such irregular payments can ar arise as a result of innocent claimant errors, deliberate fraud by claimants or the manner in which claims are administered by departmental staff. Controlled surveys of welfare schemes carried out by the Department are intended to identify the types of cases where such excess payments arise. The surveys also provide a basis for estimating the level of irregular payments affecting the schemes examined. The results of successive control surveys suggest that there was a material level of payments in excess of entitlements on both the vote and social insurance schemes in 2017. As has been the case for a number of years, I have drawn attention to my concern about this in both audit certificates. The matter is explained in further detail in Chapter 11. Chapter 14 presents an example of the type of circumstances that give rise to welfare payments in excess of entitlement. As part of the audit of the 2017 appropriation account, a review was undertaken of job seekers allowance. One of the matters examined was the correct application of age-related rate reductions which have been implemented since 2009. Reduced payment rates apply to most job seekers aged 25 or younger but there are a number of circumstances where an exemption applies and the payment rate is not reduced. At the beginning of November 2017, there were just over 30,000 claimants in the age cohort, of whom 5,225, or 17%, were not on a reduced rate. The audit identified, based on the information held by the Department, that 486 of these claimants, or 1.6% of the cohort of claimants as a whole, did not meet the qualifying conditions for payment of the maximum personal rate. As a result, they were being paid an amount in excess of their entitlement. We estimated the cost to the Department of such excess payments at just under 1.2 million euros in 2017. This is attributable to departmental or official error rather than to claimant error or deliberate fraud. Chapter 12 reports on an examination of the Department's Job Path Employment Activation Service for people employed for one year or more, un unemployed for one year or more. The Job Path Service has been delivered since mid-2015 across the state by two companies contracted by the Department. The key object objectives of the Job Path Service are to move people from the live register into employment, to reduce the number moving back onto the live register, and to reduce the duration of unemployment when it does arise. The service has been delivered against the backdrop of a substantial upswing in employment levels in recent years. Job seekers selected by the Department for participation in Job Path are provided with information on the services available, and a personal advisor is assigned to each job seeker. Together, the personal advisor and the job seeker develop a personal progression plan, or PPP, which includes a series of actions designed to assist the job seeker in securing employment. The service provider then, then supports the job seeker in implementing the plan. Up to March 2018, the department had referred 192,000 job seekers to job path. Almost 160,000 of those referred had commenced engagement with the service providers. Around 16,000 had dropped out and a further 16,000 were still in the process of developing a personal progression plan. About 69,000 were working with the service providers in implementing agreed plans. The engagement with the service provider can extend to around two years. <coughs> Consequently, in order to assess the outcome of the service, we looked at the outcomes for almost 63,000 job seekers referred in the period up to the end of 2016. Of these, around 25% had subsequently commenced employment, which was significantly higher than the target minimum rate of job commencement set by the Department. 
However, the proportion who stayed in employment fell away over time, so that by the end of 12 months, only 7% of those who engaged with the service providers were still in a job. As indicated in the diagram which can now be shown on, on screen, this was just marginally above the reference job sustainment rate which the department based on its own previous performance. Broadly speaking, the outturn pattern achieved was similar for the various categories of unemployed persons. On the cost side, fees of some 109 million euros had been paid to the two companies up to March 2018. The payments were based on verification of the delivery of the service to individual job seekers and of continued employment for those who took up a job. Fee discounts built into the contract were availed of in 2017 when employment in the economy generally exceeded pre-specified levels. Rates of contribution to the Social Insurance Fund are based on earned income but vary for different contribution classes. The types of benefits available to contributors also vary considerably by class, reflecting the ins insurance nature of the system. Chapter 20 reviews the procedures adopted by the Department to gain assurance that PRSI classifications declared by employers in relation to their employees and on a self-assessment basis by employed individuals are appropriate. The report also considers the adequacy of the arrangements in place between the Department and Revenue in relation to the collection and reconciliation of PRSI receipts. In 2016, 96% of persons classified for PRSI purposes were in one of three classes, that's classes A, M or S. Class M, which was about 10% of the total, applies mainly to those under 16 or over 66 who are in employment and those in receipt of an occupational pension where no social insurance liability arises and very minimal benefits are available. Class A, which is about 76% of the total, applies to the earnings of most categories of employees, while Class S, again about 10%, applies mainly to earnings from self-employment. An individual may have more than one contribution classification depending on the source of earnings. The rate of personal contribution by persons is the same for Class A and Class S at 4% of earnings, but in the case of Class A, employers are liable for an additional contribution equivalent to 10.85% of their employees' earnings. Consequently, there may be a considerable potential economic incentive, at least in the short term, to categorise workers in certain circumstances as self-employed. However, we noted that despite apparent changes in employment relationships over recent years, there has not been a significant increase in the proportion of earners in PRSI Class S over the past 10 years. The Department Scope section may make a formal determination of the appropriate PRSI classification if requested. However, the number of such determinations is small, less than a thousand a year. The Department undertakes some testing of compliance with PRSI classification rules, including through joint investigations carried out with revenue. Targeted joint investigations in recent years have detected a significant incidence of misclassification in the construction sector. Members will also recall the review of the circumstances of persons in RTE classified as self-employed, which identified a significant number of cases that required further review as to whether individuals were employed by RTE or were truly self-employed. This potentially has implications for their PRSI classification. The Department also recently undertook a pilot review of the social insurance class of company directors and concluded that such a review did not need to be repeated. Our examination found that the pilot review used a very narrow sampling frame resulting in assessment of the cases of just 13 individuals. This limits the conclusions which can be drawn from the exercise. The examination concluded that there is scope for the Department to increase the level of compliance activity it undertakes in relation to contribution classification and recommends a programme of random reviews of PRSI classification. Finally, ch uh, Chapter 13 reports on the long-term prospects for the operation of the Social Insurance Fund. 
This is based on the results of an actuarial review of the financial condition of the fund that the Minister for Employment Affairs and Social Protection is required by law to commission at least every five years. Based on the position at end 2015, the review projections indicate that, in the absence of further action to tackle the shortfall, the fund will move into a deficit position and the exchequer subvention required each year to meet ongoing expenditure requirements will be substantial and will increase rapidly. The review projects that the subvention in constant 2017 prices will be 1.7 billion euros in 2025, 5.6 billion euros in 2035 and 11.4 billion euros in 2045. However, these projections are heavily assumption driven. Changes in assumptions about real earnings, growth and life expectancy have the most significant impact on the projected SIF shortfall. The conclusion is that the periodic review is a valuable exercise that enables informed public discussion about the expected long-term implications of current decision-making. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you indeed, uh, Mr. McCarthy and <coughs> Mr. McKeown, can we have your opening statement, please? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, Committee Members, I'd like to thank the Committee for inviting me here today to discuss the Appropriation Account for Fold 37, Chapters 11, 12, 13, 14 and 20 of the report of the Controller and Auditor General and also the account for the Social Insurance Fund, all for the year ending 2017. I am joined today by Anne Vaughan, Deputy Secretary of the Department, together with Kathleen Stack, Assistant Secretary General with Responsibility for Control Policy, Deirdre Shanley, Assistant Secretary General with Responsibility for Finance, Patricia Murphy, Assistant Secretary General with Responsibility for Employment Affairs and PRSI Policy, and I am also joined by Jim MacDonald, the Department's Chief Accountant, and Ms. Grania McGuckin from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. I may, with the Chair's permission, rely on assistance from my colleagues in addressing some of the questions that members may raise. I arranged for an advanced copy of this statement together with briefing material on each of the chapters under review, the annual report of the Department and the annual statistics report and other relevant information to be provided to the Committee Secretariat last week, and I hope that members found that material to be of use. In my opening statement last year, I referred to the changes in the nature and role of social welfare over the period dating back to the establishment of the Department some 70 years earlier. I spoke about the role of welfare in compensating for and mitigating the impact of failures in the market economy. I spoke of how the more than 70 different payments and services provided by the Department contributed significantly not just to cushioning the impact of the Great Recession, but to helping the economy recover faster than it might otherwise have done. I spoke about how our staff are acutely aware through their everyday work of the impact of welfare and employment services at the micro level, the individual citizen and families, and that while we are mindful of the need to control the distribution of scarce state funds, they are equally mindful of the vulnerability of the people who rely on our services. I spoke about how we work to treat every person with dignity and respect and to make our offices bright and welcoming. And I spoke about how independent research indicates that customers rate our staff and our services highly, including those provided under contract by third parties. I mention this again because the work of our department is essentially the work of balance, not just the external balancing of market dynamics and social goals, but also internal balances. In our work, we have to strike a balance between ensuring on the one hand that people have access to a payment and on the other, providing them with and requiring them to avail of a service that can help reduce dependence on that payment. There is also a balance to be struck in, on the one hand, designing and managing large-scale service processes that are reliable, efficient and effective for the overwhelming majority of customers, and on the other, imposing controls and checks intended to reduce fraud and error. As I said last year, we cannot pursue the elimination of error or fraud at the cost of denying entitlement to service or frustrating access to that entitlement. There are also balances to be struck on the revenue side of our operations, relating both to the intergenerational and intertemporal equity and to horizontal equity in terms of treatment of social insurance charges and different types of employment. These are the balances that are at the heart of the five chapters selected for discussion today, and it is on these chapters that I will focus my opening remarks. The first chapter, Chapter 11, summarises the Department's approach to what, following feedback at the Public Accounts Committee last year, we now call control surveys. It outlines the results of 14 surveys conducted by the Department over the past six years, covering approximately 80% of the Department's expenditure. These surveys are conducted to help identify the risk factors that give rise to incorrect payments on individual schemes 
and to inform changes to operations processes and control measures to help reduce the level of incorrect payments into the future. The surveys also provide an indicative estimate of the level of control loss or leakage in the system at a point in time. In general, for most of the scheme survey, this ranges between a half a percent and five percent, with farm assist being a notable outlier at 10.4 percent. Across all 14 schemes, the net level of excess payments averaged about 2.2 percent. As a counting officer, I agree, given the scale of the Department's expenditure with the Controller and Auditor General's assessment that this level of control loss or leakage is material. However, as I did last year, I would also draw attention to the fact that this rate stands comparison with equivalent rates in social welfare administrations in other states, for example, the UK 1.9 per cent, Israel 5 per cent, Canada 3.5 per cent, and so on, and indeed to the rates of bad debt, which typically range from 2 to 5 per cent, and shrinkage, which typically range, uh, ranges at about 2 per cent in commercial industry. The second chapter, Chapter 12, reports on a review of the Job Path Service by the Controller and Auditor General. By way of background, JobPath is an employment or advisory case management service provided to long-term unemployed job seekers. The service is provided on behalf of the department by two contractors who are remunerated based on their engagement with job seekers and the employment outcomes achieved. The service sits alongside and augments the case management advisory service provided by the department's own intro staff and the contracted service provided by our local employment services. In the past, at this committee and elsewhere, a number of queries have been raised in respect of job path. The first is whether or not it is appropriate to provide and to require job seekers to engage with a case management employment advisory service. The evidence on this is, I believe, very clear. Of all of the types of labour market intervention provided by public employment services around the world, the form of intervention which is shown to have the most impact is case management and employment advice. For this reason, it is important to provide an employment advisory and case management service, and JobPath is simply a method of doing this. The second question raised is whether or not such a service should be provided under a contracted model or should be provided directly by the staff employed by the state. Different people will have different views on this question. What I can say as a counting officer is that most countries use a mixed model, contracted resourcing being used to ensure that resource capacity can be flexibly added as required to core in-house capacity. This was the rationale for the procurement of job path services at a time when the Department's in-house resources could not respond as required to the large increase in unemployment. The third question raises whether the job path model provides value for money. I provided under separate cover some additional briefing material which sets out the cost of the job path service and the outcomes achieved. This data indicates that the service is delivering on target set and that the costs of the service compare favourably with other case management services contracted by the Department. Committee members may be interested to know that preliminary results of an econometric study currently being finalised indicate that people who receive the job path service have higher rates of progression into employment and higher earnings in employment than people with a similar profile who have not received the service. The fourth question raised is whether the Department has sufficient controls in place to ensure that payments to contractors are validly made and supported by real evidence of sustained employment. The issue was considered by the Controller and Auditor General in this examination of job path. Overall, the Controller and Auditor General's report notes that the number of people moving into employment from job path exceeds the target levels and that the number of people sustaining employment is broadly in line with the reference levels, both of, both of which were set at 62 per cent of the counterfactual or base level, but which I mean 62 per cent higher than the counterfactual or base case level. The report also notes that the Department has a reasonable basis for the key performance measures used to evaluate contractor performance and that payments made to contractors were validly supported by evidence of the performance achieved. Other questions raised in respect of job path, including, for example, its interaction with programmes such as community and employment, were addressed in the presentation to the Joint Directors Committee on Employment Affairs and Social Protection earlier this year. I have provided a committee with a copy of a statement on the job path service provided to the committee at that time. I hope that this material addresses any questions the committee members may have, but I will be pleased to address any further issues of interest. The third chapter, Chapter 13, summarises the results of the actuarial review to Social Insurance Fund and notes that it is a valuable exercise to inform discussion regarding short-term decisions and their impact on long-term outcomes. Again, by way of background, the actuarial review is a periodic study conducted every five years in accordance with statute to project forward the likely evolution of the funding position of the Social Insurance Fund based on a defined set of assumptions. It is important to note that the Social Insurance Fund, unlike, for example, private pension funds, 
does not operate on a pre-funded basis, whereby contributions made by a contributor today are invested to fund future disbursements. The fund operates on a pay-as-you-go basis, with current year expenditure funded by current year revenues. Deficits in any year are funded by means of an exchequer subvention paid from the central fund. Surpluses in any year are invested by the Department of Finance for the benefit of the fund and are used to supplement income in subsequent years, but are not netted off against deficits incurred in prior years. Therefore, although the fund is projected to be in surplus to the value of $2.3 billion at the end of 2018, this is a somewhat simplistic presentation of the actual position. Over the past 10 years, the fund has run deficits in six years, and during the Great Recession, the total value of deficits amounted to $11 billion. This data indicates that the value of benefits paid by the fund greatly exceeds the value of contributions made into the fund. This position is confirmed by the actuarial review, which indicates that the value of the state pension alone is worth more than the value of the contributions made. For this reason, given the projected increases in the numbers of older people and increasing life expectancy, the actuarial review projects significant annual deficits into the future. It is important to note that issues in relation to funding of the Social Insurance Fund in particular with regard to setting in social insurance rates and investment of any fund surpluses is vested in the Minister for Finance. The fourth chapter for discussion today is Chapter 14. This sets out the results of an examination by the Controller and Auditor General of age-related job seeker allowance payments. The report finds that approximately 1.6% of job seeker payments to people aged under 18 to 25 were paid at a higher rate than provided for in legislation at a cost of some 1.2 million in 2017. The report therefore recommends that the rules used to calculate payments should be coded into the Department's computer systems and that pending this change a greater level of quality control should be applied and additional staff training should be undertaken to ensure that all staff are aware of the rules. As Accounting Officer, I agree to these recommendations and have taken steps to put them into effect. These steps are set out in the Conclusions and Recommendations section of Chapter 14. The final chapter earmarked for discussion is Chapter 20 relating to the collection of PRSI contributions by self-employed people. This is a topic that cuts across both the operations of this department and those of the Revenue Commissioners, so I will be joined by Keith Walsh and Kevin Cashel from the Revenue Commissioners who will endeavour to address any questions that relate to its work. As noted in the chapter, self-employed people pay the standard rate of employees PRSI, which is 4%, but do not pay any employer-related contribution, which is 10.05%. And this difference in contributions may provide a financial incentive for an individual to be declared as self-employed. However, the chapter also notes that despite this important incentive, there has been no increase in the proportion of earners classified as self-employed over the past 10 years. For information, this issue of disguised employment was the subject of an interdepartmental review group study in 2017. This study is referenced in Chapter 20, and a copy has been provided to committee members under separate cover, together with a recent presentation on the subject to the Joint Directors Committee on Employment Affairs and Social Protection. Classification of employment for social insurance purposes is based on self-declaration, typically by the employer, with the scope section of the department determining the appropriate class in cases where the correct classification is unclear or is in dispute. Scope utilises the agreed code of practice for determining employment and self-employment status of individuals in making such determinations. The Revenue Commissioners act as agents of the Department in the collection of PRSI, and both the Revenue Commissioners and the Department, working separately and together, conduct investigations of compliance with correct classifications as part of our standard investigations regime. As part of its review, the Controller and Auditor General examined a random sample of 35 determinations made by Scope during 2017, and found that the evidence supported the basis on which the section made its determinations. No example was reported of a misclassification. The examination also considered a pilot review by the Department of the Social Insurance class applied to company directors in order to assess the merits of a regular annual review and notes that the Department has concluded that such an annual review process is not merited. In addition, the examination considered a number of cases where the Revenue Commissioners or the Department's own inspectors conducted investigations in relation to social insurance classifications and did not find any issues of concern in relation to these investigations. It did note, however, that the, issues, that the investigations detected that the, what the Control and Order General considered as a significant incidence of misclassification, particularly in the construction industry. The Control and Order General concludes with three recommendations. First, that the Department should introduce a random programme of reviews of PRSI classifications, both to provide assurance as to the accuracy of classifications and to act as a deterrent to deliberate misclassification. 
In the main, I agree with this recommendation. However, my preference is that this should be achieved by increasing the number of employer PRSI inspections rather than reviews per se, and that these inspections should include targeted as well as random elements. As committee members may be aware, the Department conducted a media campaign on the issue of false self-employment earlier this year. Following this campaign, we undertook an intensive programme of employer inspections in the Dublin area and a targeted campaign in the construction sector in the Galway area. Based on these exercises, the results of which are currently being reviewed, we intend to intensify our employer inspection activity as part of which we will again conduct a media campaign in 2019. The purpose of this campaign will be both to increase employer and employee awareness of their rights and obligations and to encourage reporting of suspected cases of misclassification. The intelligence garnered in response to this campaign will also inform the targeting of specific business and industry sectors for inspection purposes. The second recommendation relates to the compilation of sectoral data on, data on self-employed contributors. At present, the data provided by the Revenue Commissioners does not include sectoral data on the source of PRSI receipts. I agree that receipt of this information would be useful in targeting inspection activity, and we are following this matter up with revenue. In the meantime, the Department has analysed the sectoral data on self-employment available from the CSO, and I have forwarded a trend analysis of this data over the past 20 years. In summary, this indicates that the share of employment comprised of self-employment is in a gradual but steady long-term decline, and this suggests that at a macro level at least, the issue of disguised or false self-employment is not as prevalent as it is sometimes presented to be. Within this data, there are some interesting trends worthy of note. For example, the share of self-employment accounted for by the services sector has grown, whereas that accounted for by agriculture has diminished. The share accounted for by other sectors is largely unchanged. These changes are, however, largely driven by changes in the composition of employment in the economy, in particular the growth of the services sector. As a result, the share of employment in the services sector comprised of self-employment has remained relatively unchanged at about 11% over the entire period. Again, this suggests that there is no systemic reclassification of employment in that sector. When the data is analysed by type of self-employment, a somewhat different picture emerges. There are two types of self-employment captured for the purposes of statistical reporting. The first type of self-employment relates to people who are self-employed but also employ staff in their business, and it is very unlikely that such people are misclassified. The second type of self-employment relates to people who are employed on their own account, people who do not have any staff engaged in their business. It is this type of self-employment which could include some people who should properly be classified as employees. At an overall level, the share of own account self-employment is in a steady decline, and this trend is common to all of the major sectors, with one exception, construction. As shown in the charts forwarded to the committee, the share of construction employment classified as own account self-employment was constant at about 15% in the period up to the start of the recession. During the recession, this doubled to about 30%. This can be explained for the most part by the fall in construction employment during this period. It is notable that the share of own account self-employment is falling again as construction employment recovers in recent years. However, it will be important to monitor this trend to ensure that the downward trajectory continues. Accordingly, the Department continues to have a particular focus on PRSI compliance inspections in the construction sector over the next year. The third recommendation relates to the process currently undertaken with Revenue Commissioners to reconcile monthly variances in PRSI receipts versus estimates. I agree that a more structured process would be useful and expect that more timely data that should become available as part of the PAYE modernisation programme will support such a process, and I am therefore arranging to have this recommendation followed up with the Revenue Commissioners. Finally, I understand that the committee members would like to discuss the, housing, the issue of housing supports today. This department previously played a significant role in providing monetary supports to help people in receipt of welfare payments cover some or all of their household rent. The role of the Department has diminished since 2014 when the Housing Assistance Payment, or HAP, funded by the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government and administered by the local authorities is introduced. Payments by local authorities which are not contingent on a person being in receipt of a welfare payment and so avoid a welfare trap problem now count for the majority of more than 70 per cent of housing support payments funded by the State. In order to address any issues that the committee members may wish to raise, I will therefore be joined by my colleagues Mary Hurley and Marguerite Ryan from the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government later this afternoon. In conclusion, I would just like to say that the scale and scope of the operations of the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protections are greater than perhaps any other department or public body. 
we, and by we I mean the managers and staff of the department, and particularly the staff, work hard to deliver services to the communities from which we come and in which we live, conscious that it is our families, our friends and our neighbours who not only depend on these services, but who through their social insurance contributions and taxes pay for these services. We are proud of the work we do, but we know we are not perfect and we don't always get things right. And that is why we welcome the oversight of the Controller and Auditor General and of this committee. It's a process that plays an important role in reminding us of our purpose, helping us to identify areas for improvement and helping us to learn from our mistakes. And it is through such a process that we would hope to improve. Uh, my colleagues will be pleased to take any questions members may have. Thank you indeed, Mr <coughs> McEwen, for the opening statement. It was a long, comprehensive statement, but there were a lot of chapters in the CNAG's report. <coughs> so that explains why it was um, an exceptionally long statement to cover all that ground. First speaker is uh, Deputy Cullinan, followed by Deputy Peter Bork, and uh, then Mark McSherry and Catherine Murphy. First speaker is 20 minutes, second speaker is 15, and the remaining speakers have 10 minutes each. Deputy Cullinan. Thank you, Gwaherlock. Welcome to Mr McEwen and your uh, colleagues. Um, just to pick up on that point, I do accept that the Secretary General or the Accounting Officer is dealing with four chapters from the CNAG's report and the appropriation accounts. But the reason why we seek uh, documentation in advance of an Accounting Officer coming in supporting documentation is to avoid lengthy opening statements um, because we have a voting block at 10 to 1. And, you know, I'm not saying this is the case here, but sometimes there is a perception that accounting officers give lengthy statements to talk down the clock. It doesn't work because we can stay here for as long as we need to. Um, but I'm not saying this was the case this time. I understand uh, there is a lot, and we won't even get to all of the issues because there's a huge amount. Am I right in saying that the PRSI contributions by the self-employed and rent supplement are best dealt with in the afternoon when we have the staff from Revenue Wizard and Housing will be here? That's fine. Um, and I did give prior notice, Mr uh, McKeown, I would raise this with you because you talked about your staff working hard, which no doubt they do, and if I can pass on my appreciation for the hard work that your staff does do. But this morning, under our correspondence, we received a breakdown at our request of civil service sick leave stats for 2017, and also uh, civil service sick leave stats to show lost time rate in percentage terms. And uh, your department... Uh, has one of the highest in terms of recorded average working days lost per full-time equivalent of 13 on average, which is two and a half weeks per year. The average across the civil service is 10.1, and on lost time in percentage terms, your department is 5.7, uh, as opposed to the civil service average of 4.4. So, can, first of all, can you account for why it's so high at 13 per FTE. Yeah. I, 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 sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it is an issue of concern to us, Deputy. Um, I, I think if you were to delve into the figures in, in a bit more detail, and I know you haven't had the oppor opportunity, and some of the information that I have wouldn't be available to committee members. Um, if you look at, for example, the aid profile of our department compared to the civil service generally, if you look at the gender mix, if you look at the uh, grade mix, we have a different mix than the civil service generally. Um, just to give you an idea, we have about 150 staff under 30, and we have close to 3,000 staff over 55. That wouldn't be the typical age okay, profile. I, and, and those issues do yeah. play into And I think if we adjusted for those issues... If I could issues, just come back on that, OK. Yeah. What we got here are caveats from the uh, Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. So they, they do set out a number of caveats which might explain why the figures are higher in some areas. That explanation isn't one of them. It, first of all, it breaks it down in terms of it co colour coordinates each department in terms of the numbers of staff. So for those that are 5,000 plus, which would be the bigger departments, your department is one of them. What it says is that smaller organisations, there may be fluctuations because of the nature of the organisations. The bigger the organisation means that you would have the full flavour of, of, uh, of staff in terms of age, demographics and gender and stuff. So it really shouldn't be the case that you're higher if that's the case. This is according to Deeper. It also does say that uh, there might be an issue in relation to rural and community development because it only was established in 2017. So my point to you is this, that 
you know, it's just not acceptable that you then say that, well, it's how maybe it's, it's classified. If it was done differently, it might show a different outcome, because it would show a different outcome for everybody. But that caveat isn't given to us here. And I appreciate we haven't been given an opportunity to delve into the figure, but I think we need to understand why it's 13 on average, because I'm looking at the prison service, for example, the Irish prison service, where it's 15.7, and we can accept in that area it might be higher given the nature of the job, given that there are people who unfortunately get assaulted in the course of their work and would be out. So we can see there's obvious reasons maybe why it would be higher in that area. <coughs> but yours is the next highest at 13. And so you, you said it was a concern, but the explanation you gave me doesn't really satisfy me. So I'm just trying to figure out why there is a difficulty in your department. It doesn't seem to be in other departments. For example, uh, the Taoiseach's department is 3.5%. Uh, some other big departments are, uh, you know, well under the 10 percent, and yet yours is 13 percent. Oh, sorry, not 13 percent, 13 days. 13 days, yeah, it's 5.6, 5.7 yeah. percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that definitely, and I understand what you're saying. Obviously, you know, I'm just seeing these data on screen now. I am aware of them from before, but I'd be pretty confident that if we were to adjust those figures for age, gender, and grade, that we'd that be. Because they're old or because they're young? Yeah, well, we'd have one of the older age profiles in the department, which means that we have people. So, for example, we had 12 people who died in service last year. I think that'd be far more than any other department. It's a reflection of the age profile. Well, how many people and over 60 years of age would you have? Oh, I think over 60, um, over 60 years of age, we have about 630 people over 60 years of age. So 10%. About 10%. And is We'd that have above the norm in the public service? But we, our median age is 53. Uh, the average age, I think, around the civil service. Okay, is maybe to clear this up, and it's just yeah, be useful for us. Can yeah. we go back to the department and get a gender breakdown and an age profile for each of these yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, departments as well? And it might give us the full picture that, that, that you're saying, Mr. McKeown. Because, and I should make the point as well. Um, I'm not saying that staff mm -hmm. don't have an entitlement to uh, apply for sick leave. Of course they do, but in for example, the Irish Prison Service were very sympathetic to the type of job that they have. So my concern was, if there's a problem in the department where maybe people are out sick for whatever reasons, uh, we, would want, we would want to know to improve the situation for the staff. It isn't an attack on the staff at all, it's yeah. quite the opposite. Yeah. Um, so it's just a, a concern when we see the figure so high. Yeah. And maybe you are right. If you do delve deeper into the figures, but we'll come back to it once we get so that breakdown. breakdown from deeper. Well, if, if it is the case that look, what we have here is a breakdown just of the department and the number of days lost, it, yeah. it doesn't take into account, and there's no caveat given here to us that if there could be variations because of gender, where, for example, if there's maternity leave, mm -hmm. so we ex I accept that, it doesn't say here there's no caveat in relation to if the age profile is higher, that might have an impact. I, I'm saying we didn't get that information here. So it's fair enough, I think, for the accounting officer to point that out. So can we go back, get that information from each department? And then we can see whether or not there is still a problem or not. Um, so can we do that? We'll do that deeper, but we'll ask you to send us a, your own comprehensive note of your department. We can do that. Analysis that you have internally in relation to And I just want to reassure the committee, we are very conscious of managing sick leave and absences in the department, and we do have a, a rigorous regime. I don't want to give the wrong impression by rigorous. We don't, like the deputy said, people are entitled to sick yeah, leave, exactly. and we, it's sympathetic. But, you know, we do interview people when they come back from sick leave, to find out you know about their absences we do work to try you know we've had a situation in the past where we had a number of people who are on very very long-term sick leave and we've taken measures there to try and address those issues so okay thank you can i start with job pad then in terms of the uh cnag special reports and your own appropriation accounts so we dealt with this before if you remember mr mm -hmm. McKeown, the last time you were here and uh, i put the same questions again because um I feel that for us to evaluate whether or not we get value for money is what we're doing. The CNAG, as far as I can see, looked at process and not necessarily in overall terms whether the project itself represents value for money. So I want to maybe come at it from that perspective. But if I'm right, it, the, the total cost of job pat from July 2015 to March 2018 was 109 million. Is that a correct figure? 
I think that's the figure that's the energy. I can, energy. can give you yeah. the up-to-date figure we gave in information. Well, no, that just, we work on that figure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what is the up-to-date figure? The up-to-date figure is 149 million. But for that time period, which I've broken down so I can work on that figure, in July 2015 to March 2018, 109 million. That's what's in the CNHE's report. And then there's two companies, isn't there? There's Rollout Job Pat, yeah. there's CTEC and Tourist Newham. Yeah. So can you give us a breakdown then, based on the 109 million, how much went to each of the organisations? I, I have the breakdown of the 149, if that's yeah, okay, I don't have the 109. Do, yeah. I, 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 I have to say, de definitely, I mean, we saw and we had to get permission of the contractors to provide this because it's yeah. commercially confidential under public procurement, so they've yeah. agreed that I can provide the information. So I, I, you had an indicated that this was a yes. issue of concern. So Taurus Nua... Can we thank the companies then for that? Yeah. Um, because that's yeah. helpful too. Yeah. Taurus Nua, 75.7 million. And CTEC, 73.3 million. I think I'd indicated last year, Deputy, that the split was 50-50 or as close yeah. as made no difference. So you can see that's the case. It's fa fairly close. OK. And... Uh, and then in terms of the payments themselves, then, that they, they get paid per... Um, individuals, so there's an initial registration payment yeah. once the, an individual signs up to yeah. the person progression right. plan, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. What is that payment? The, the average, and I provided it in the information we provided at the committee last week, the average across all clients and across both providers is €311. Euro. €311 euro an initial payment, and then there's four sustainment fees paid That's right. once you do a 13 week, uh, 13, 26. 13 yeah. week period of sustained employment. And again, what's the average for that? There's there's four different sustainment fees. Uh, yep. So the 13 week is 613 euro. Yep. The 26 week 737 euro. The um, 39 week 892 euro. And the 52 week 1165 euro. 1165. 65. Okay. Can I thank the accounting officer for that information because it was information we saw before um, and uh, we did appreciate mm. that there could be commercial mm. sensitivity but at the same time this allows us now to evaluate whether or not we're getting value for money so I think that's helpful you've given us those figures I want to say that first um, but in, in, on, one page, on page 139 of the uh, CNHG's report it states that the service is intended to assist assist unemployed persons to find and sustain permanent employment or self-employment. Mm -hmm. What's the definition from your perspective of permanent employment? Well, it, the definition, it, it's sustained employment is what we talk about. That the, the term we use is sustained employment. And sustained employment... Sustained permanent employment is in, I, I, I was reading. Am I wrong? Okay. Well, the, the term we use is sustained. You use sustained anyway. Okay. Sustained, yeah. And the, the term permanent, <coughs> generally the term pay, permanent in labour market terms, for example, the way the Central Statistics Office would mean it, is that it's a job that you have for a period of 12 months or more, and that you know you have tenure in the business or tenure in your employment. So that would be the general de definition. Okay. So, um, so just bear with me for a second. So, okay, you use the term sustained mm -hmm. employment. Yeah. So. What is your definition of that? What does that mean? Well, what we mean with that, and that goes back to the job, we define employment as employment of more than 30 hours per week, so it's full time, and it lasts for at least 13 weeks, um, and uh, ideally up to 12 months, and that's why the sustainment fees are set out at 13 week increments. So how many people have gone through your uh, gone through job, Pat? About 190,000 at the moment. 190,000. And then how many of that 190,000 have gone on to have some form of what you would describe as sustained employment? The, the figure at the moment is about 28% have gone on into employment. What's the figure? 28,000. 28%. 20, 28%. <sighs> um, but do you have the number? I'll, well, sorry, I can do the, do the maths. Um, you're looking at, say, roughly a third out of 190,000, so... Okay. I, I can get the figures to you, Deputy. So, you what know. I want then is I'm looking for a full breakdown. So you work on the basis of four payments which are made to the companies based on 13 weeks, 26 mm -hmm. weeks, 39 weeks and 52 mm -hmm. weeks, isn't that yeah. it? So of the 28 percent, and if you can get the actual accurate figure, yeah. do we have a breakdown of how many of that 28 percent uh, were employed 
in a sustained way for either 13 weeks and then up to 26, 39 and okay. 52. I, I've and got the figures people. and we sent them if again. Yeah, the percentages, that would be okay. Yeah, yeah and we, we sent this information again to yeah. the Secretary in advance. So the, no, the percentage who sustained 13 weeks is 17. 17 percent. 17. Yep. The percentage which in, sustains 26 is 14. Yep. The sustained 39 is 12. Yep. And sustained 52 is 9 percent. 9 percent. 9 percent. And those figures are increasing because one of the features of the services there are people who haven't had the opportunity yet to get to the 39 or the or the 52 okay. or even the 13 week period. So those numbers are increasing every time we look at them. But is at 9 percent the a good figure for up to 52 weeks? Would you? Consider that to be for a good very long term unemployed people, it's an excellent figure, actually, Deputy. Um, the, well, the, given the, that, and I have the employment figures, or the unemployment figures mm. have dropped. July 2016 was 8.6%, it's now 5.1%. Yeah. So, in a climate where more jobs are being created and unemployment is dropping, um, you'd consider 9% of people, who, of the total of 190,000 people who go through, you think that 9% is a good figure? It is, but compared to the people who don't go through job path deputy, it's quite a good figure. I mean, we, we benchmarked our, um, uh, as the control and order the general mentioned, when we set the targets for job path, what we set as a target was what the counterfactual was, in other words, the figures in 2012 and 2013, and we added 62% to it. Um, so the target figures were 62% above the base case, and all of these figures here are exceeding those base cases. You are looking at the same figures, and we'll have the full data when the econometric review is published in January. Uh, but the preliminary data is that it's significantly uh, okay, in excess of, of other people today okay. that don't have job path service. Okay, I'll come back to that in one moment. Can we get up page 143 of chapter 12 on the screen of the CNHE's report? Um, and my reading of that, and maybe the CNHE can help me on this, am I correct in saying that of the 62,631 job seekers that are mentioned here that engage in job path, where 15,731 commenced a job of some duration, um, only 1.75% or 1,096 people sustained employment for one year? Is that correct? Sorry, I just need to read this, Deputy. Just no, no, I'm asking the CNHE, sorry. Yeah, um just the last figure that you uh, read out there, uh, Deputy, I think, is that your own calculation? Because yeah. it's not, it's not yeah. given here. I'd, no. I'd have to just do the Could we do someone the, the, the a calculator? Um, yeah, what was your figure? 1.75 per cent. 1.75 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not seeing 1.75 per cent. Could you say to me again what the figure sorry, is? Sorry, 62,631 job seekers engaged in job had 15,731 commenced a job of some That's duration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then 15 per cent sustained... Uh, That's some those. duration, but how many of those then sustained employment for one year? 7% Se of the 62,631, which I think is about 4,000. 4,000, okay. Yeah. Um, and is that a, a good figure, do you think, Mr McGowan? It is, the, the Deputy. I mean, the, the, we gave some information as well in terms of our own performance statistics in um, the, the report to the, uh, joint, to, the, uh, to, the, to the committee. And we've given information, for example, on sustainment. Um, and if you just want to take, you can take any one of the pages, but we have, at that point in time, we'd only done 26-week job sustainments. Mm. Um, and, you know, what, what it showed is that we were outperforming uh, people who weren't on job path by around 22, 23%. Okay. So, we're, so job path is delivering job outcomes which are significantly higher than people, similar people not refer to job path, mm. and the people are sustaining their employment. As I said, the preliminary outputs from the uh, econometric review, which is an independent one being done by the OECD and Deloitte, um, are indicating that the earnings and employment and the job progression and the job sustainment are significantly higher among people referred to job path compared to identical or close to identical people who are not referred to job path. So I, I'm quite satisfied that these figures would, be, would compare more than favourably with our own intro okay. service, more than favourably with local employment services. Can I just come back to this term that you use of sustained employment? Yeah. Because 
the question then is, is that an appropriate benchmark? Uh, the CSO, for example, they wouldn't use sustained employment. They would use things like part-time or permanent employment, but sustained employment wouldn't be a benchmark that they would use. It seems to be a very low threshold to measure success, 13 weeks, and then maybe up to, I know it's, it's four stages, then up to a year, but 13 weeks, you could argue, I would argue certainly wouldn't be a success. So I'm just trying to figure out where the 13 weeks came from, why um, why you, 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 you would use the term sustained employment rather than permanent employment? Well, it, it is, first of all, a sustained full-time employment. That, that, that's an important point. The other issue is to do with the payment model, Deputy. We didn't want to pay, I mean, for example, we pay the local employment services on an inputs basis. We pay them 20 million a year and they deal with 20,000 clients and that's about 1,000 euro per client that they, they look for us. But we've no visibility um, we've no accountability for whether they get somebody into a job or whether they sustain that job for somebody. We didn't want to do that in this model. Uh, so what we wanted to do was base payments on outcomes. So then it was a question of how do you define an outcome? So we defined an outcome and first of all the person has to get a job but it has to be a job which is at least 30 hours per week and it has to be a job that they keep for at least 13 weeks. That's my point. You can define, um, but, but you can define the outcome based on a very low bar um, which 13 weeks seems, seems to me I, to be a very low bar. I, I would disagree, Deputy, because if you look at the, the pricing information I gave to you there, the 13-week the, the, the sustainment fee is significantly lower than the sustainment fee for a 13-week outcome. So there's a very strong incentive, or for a 52-week outcome, there's a very strong incentive to the providers to try to sustain somebody's employment for a full year. And part of the service they have to provide is to work with employers and work with the job seeker when the job seeker is in employment to help them try and do that. I asked did the companies okay. themselves, that the two companies, did they have an input into the t time frames? On the no, they had weeks? no input. No. We, we set the input and the, the contract was designed, that was all set in our tender document. The contract was designed after a, a very long and detailed um, consultation process. We had uh, input from the NESC, we had input from the ESRI, we had input from the Centre for Economic and Social Inclusion, we had labour market experts from Maynooth, we did a lot of study and research on similar models in other countries. And this was the conclusion that the best thing to do, if you're going to contract somebody to do something and pay them by outcomes, you have to pay them something along the way, otherwise they have no cash flow. So the something along the way is you pay them based on a 13 week job sustainment okay, and so on. That. That, that's fine. Of the 190,000, just two more questions, I, know I want to, to allow other people to come in before we get to the voting block. 190,000 came through job pat. Mm -hmm. How many would have come through twice? I think the most recent figure was about 15,000. 15,000? 15,000. 15, is, uh, is that a measure of success? I mean, that means then that these companies got paid twice for the same individuals. The whole purpose of going through a job pat is you would get a job. I would imagine, or get some level of employment. So if people have gone through twice, there's 15,000 people. What was the cost well, of putting them through twice? Well, they'd, they'd have gotten a registration fee for yeah. each individual twice, so that would have been 300 euro thereabouts each time, 311 euro each time. Um, I, I think the issue here, Deputy, is the service that we want to provide to somebody is a case management employment advisory service. It, and that's a service that we should be providing on a continuous basis to all job seekers. So people who've been on job path and haven't received a job, the question then is, well, do you just leave them? Do you just ignore them? It, it, these are people who come back from job path who haven't then gone on after six months to community employment or haven't then gone on to training or haven't then gone on uh, to the local employment services. So they're... I understand that, but, but 15,000 of 190,000 for people to go back a second time does seem to be a high figure to me. And I'm making the point, yes, they only got the initial <coughs> registration fee, but they get it twice. And I, just one final comment about the discount rate, but my point is, mm. uh, and I'm only just mm. trying to tease this out, um, I'm looking at this from the point of view of the company, from their perspective, mm. and what incentives are in it for them to make money, because they're in it to make money. Mm -hmm. and. If I'm looking at it, I, I, I think personally the 13 weeks in terms of the, the first tranche of, of money is too low a, a threshold. And if you have 15,000 people who've, been, who've gone through twice and these companies got paid twice, um, I see that as a problem. Now, you mightn't see it as a problem, and you've given the reasons why you don't think it is, but I think that there's an issue from a value for money perspective. And then I bring in the discount rate now because there's a discount rate of 
eight percent. I think it's page one four eight. Is it of the um, yeah. CNG's report that he mentions this? Mm -hmm. what, what is the discount rate first anyway? The, the discount rate. We, why was that introduced? The, the, the discount rate. Two rates, wasn't there? The, well, yeah. There's a, there's a number of rates of discount. Um, we can go from 4%, 8%, 16% are the rates that we can go up to. The reason we introduced the discounts in the contract design was something we learned when we did our research in other countries, is that their pricing models didn't include uh, any consideration of the fact that the economy might recover and therefore it would be easier to get people into employment. So we pegged and we told in advance in the RFT that we issued to providers that, based on employment growth in the economy, we would reduce prices, subject to an analysis that our financial and accounts I, and, I, and so I on. And that's that. the reason we introduced yeah, it. And that goes back to my point earlier. Mm. So I made exactly that same point when I talked about the 9% success mm. rate that we have a recovering economy greater than expected mm. numbers of people who are in employment. It's a little bit easier to get a job now than it was three mm. years ago, five years ago or seven years ago, which means that the environment is much, much more it's less difficult for, 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 uh, for these two companies to operate in terms of getting people into employment. So you've uh, built into this discount rates because of that, yes. and yet still we're only getting 9% success rate at the end of it. But so we're paying less, Deputy. And I the two but things, first of all. Paying now. You're paying less, yes, but, it, but my point is um, the 9% is the figure that you were saying a few minutes ago, well, notwithstanding the fact that uh, there is a recovering economy mm. and it's easier to get a job. We're dealing here with the long-term unemployment. Mm. You can't really see it in that way. But yet you do when you build in your discount. Mm, yes. yes. So it was. It's, it's a, so it's in a, a suits, it's, it's an argument that can be made that the recovering economy and it's easier, a uh, better environment. It suits when you're talking about the discount rate, which, which suits the department. But when it comes to actu actually measuring whether or not the project works, mm in overall terms, well, we can't use that argument because it's different because it's No, I think, there's, I think there are two things being conflated there, Deputy. I think on the first one, one of the challenges we had in designing the contract was to do it in a way that would protect the value for money for the state and that we wouldn't be paying money to people in a recovering economy that we would have paid in a, in a, in a more depressed or more... That should be the case. And we built that in and that's what we apply. The second issue is... Can I ask where, where the, the, the percentages come, came from? How did you arrive at the figures? We, we arrived at the figures in consultation with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform based on input and advice we had from the Centre for Economic and Social Conclusion, uh, Professor Dan Finn from the University of Southampton, who has advised the European Commission, among others, on the design of these type of contract models. But on the, um, the, the second point you raised about the 9%, the issue there is how does the 9% compare against other long-term unemployed people at this point in time today? And what I'm saying is it compares very favourably. Okay. Can I just finish by thanking the accounting officer for the information he gave us? A huge amount before the meeting, which actually made it much easier for us to, to uh, prepare for this meeting. And I just wanted to say that we don't always get it. When we do get it, I think we should acknowledge it. Okay. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you. And Deputy Peter for 15 minutes. Look, and I'd also uh, like to thank uh, everyone for their attendance on the witness side and also uh, for the detailed information that was furnished to us in advance of the meeting. Uh, it's very helpful to go through all the various different uh, documents from the various different aspects within the department. I just, first of all, I just want to ask you in relation to uh, your lead times for certain uh, payments, and uh, this has always been raising concern. Uh, just in relation to a carer's allowance, what's the average time to process an application currently? It's uh, 17 weeks. 17 weeks. And in terms of your target, what would you like it to be? Have you... It's, um, it's 12 weeks is what we'd like it to be, Deputy. I mean, I, I think we do uh, domiciliary care allowance, which is a slightly simpler scheme because there's no means test and uh, so on, in about nine weeks. We do disability allowance in about 12 weeks. We'd like to get it down to that level. It's a complicated scheme because you're not just looking at the disability of the individual carey, you're looking at the circumstances of the carer as well. Uh, you're looking at our means, our habitual residence. So it's a, it's a, they're, they're decisions that unfortunately take a long time and require a lot of information from the, from the applicant. And have you looked at other jurisdictions regarding their lead times with regard to carer's allowance, for example? I don't have that information. Um, I'm not too sure there are too many jurisdictions well, that have an um, analogous. Example, our nearest neighbour. I don't have that information. Exactly, I can get it. 
I'm not too sure they have an, an exactly analogous scheme. I think they have a different way of doing things, which wouldn't be as generous, for example, as the carers allowance in Ireland. So in terms sure of obviously analogous. a huge uh, amount is placed upon the GP in terms of for uh, the assessment for a carers allowance, yeah. and obviously you have your means test as well. Um, but I would be concerned for both it and disability allowance because I have a few cases at the moment. Uh, for one example, an individual who applied in October, being told it won't be well into January until the application is processed mm. and a decision made out. And I think, uh, especially with carers allowance, when there are people who are very vulnerable, and uh, obviously illness can be placed upon someone quite quickly and sometimes can be progressive, that it can be um, very frustrating in terms of the delay in assessing them. Yeah. Especially when we're told now we're at record levels of employment, 2.3 uh, million people employed in this country, you would imagine there should be more resources uh, in the department available for reducing the lead times in such schemes and when we've seen the outsourcing of so many labour activation schemes. Uh, my frustration is that why are we not seeing more progress in relation to these payments? Okay. What I, what I, it goes back a little bit definitely to what I said at the, in my introductory statement. You have a balanced strike between, on the one hand, protecting the interests of the taxpayer and controlling the scheme, and on the other hand, trying not to frustrate people's access to entitlement. I think everyone in the department would like to see us delivering those services more quickly. They tend to be the more difficult, and I think within the figures, the, 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 the average in some ways hides or maybe paints a picture which is worse than it is because that figure would include situations where somebody has had their application and might have been turned down. They then get a review in the disability allowance area, which takes time. Then there might be an appeal. So the average takes in all of those situations. It's not just the clean cases, for want of a but better e term. Even would you not say but, a, a target level of 12 weeks you're saying there for CARES allowance, is that not quite significant, three months to process an application? It is. It, it, it does take time, Deputy, and we are... But do you think that's... Can you not improve on that? Do you not think that's very generous in terms of uh, the department's side to have to take three months, that allocation? It, again, we're talking about the average here. So we're talking about the average across claims that are maybe uh, rejected in the first instance, then go through a review process, then go through a review, uh, 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 an appeal process. No, in terms of a clean about, claim... No, but it should be, and this is about processes too and reports. It should be very clear in terms of leaving out a review for a decision to be made in the first instance, for the application mm -hmm. to be processed. What's your ideal time frame for carers allowance? I think for carers allowance we should be looking at something around the eight week level. I think that would be reasonable given where we are on, do on domiciliary care allowance, which is a simpler and it's, I think is a good indicator of what can be achieved. So we're so significantly the, off that eight week period then? At we're the significantly off it on average for... And, and would the fact, am I incorrect in my thinking that when you see, you know, the outsourcing of some labour activation mm. schemes, when you see more people employed, that we should be seeing greater improvement in this sector? Well, no, actually, it, the, we're seeing uh, significant increases in the number of people claiming carers allowance, and again, it's to do with the ageing of the population and so on. And disability allowance. And disability, yeah. The, the, the three schemes that are growing, well, the four schemes that are growing the most significantly are um, carers allowance, disability allowance, domiciliary care allowance and pensions. So carers' allowance has increased 5% uh, year on year, um, where, for example, job seekers, as you mentioned, has fallen by about 15%. Um, so domiciliary care allowance has grown by about 11%. Uh, disability allowance, again, by about 5%. And those increases are putting pressure on our processing capability. Uh, and there are two types of, I suppose, people involved in the processing, well, three, actually. Um, but the main two types are our staff, that the deciding officers, who are in these schemes are based in Longford and Buncrana, um, who review the claim, do the means assessment, check conditionality and so on. And then there's our medical assessors. And uh, we're looking to add more resources into both of those areas. It's difficult at this point in time to get medical assessor resources. Um, but we are well, working on it. We're actually interviewing... The means in terms of a... Of a, a CARES allowance application should be fairly black and white in terms of be it uh, the old self-assessment forms or uh, P60s, bank statements. You know, the requirements should be the same as a job seeker's allowance application in terms of the individual. 
No, the, the two things with the carers allowance means test. First of all, it's more generous than the job seeker one. So no, but I'm talking about the, to actually adjudicate on them. Yeah, the but, documents that are required to make your decision. Yeah, but there are also other factors, definitely. So, for example, the person providing the care is meant to be providing full-time care and attention, ideally in the home of the caree. We, we do provide flexibility for the person to work up to 15 hours and to live away from the caree, provided that they can get there in a certain period of time. With it, all of these things have to be assessed because a lot of people claiming carers are not actually living with their caree, so we have to assess whether they are in fact providing full-time care and, and attention. And have you a target when you'll be down to eight weeks? Well, it, it will depend. We would like, and we're working towards that target, we're trying to recruit additional medical assessors at the have moment. Have you a date though, yet in terms of, I mean, to be ambitious and say, well, we want to achieve our excellence by... Well, hopefully this time next year I'll be able to say that at that time the figure for the year won't be at 8% because we're starting out where we're starting out. But at the time, I would hope that this time next year we'll be in the position to say for a clean application that we'll be at that week. Yeah. And we've already started making progress, Deputy. We've well, we're saying that lead times are long, even for um, disability allowance, yet one in five potentially are getting excess payments. And that would also be concerning if we're taking time to adjudicate on them, yet we have a high instance of getting an incorrect payment at the end of this lengthy process. That would be a concern. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, I, I need to check the fraud and control or the control survey, if I use the right terminology, for the um, carers' allowance. I don't think it's one in five. No, for disability allowance. On disability allowance, yeah. I think that might be the gross rather than the net gross, figure. Gross, yeah. yeah. So, 18 points. Yeah, yeah. So I think of which 15% is medical. Uh, medical. So. Yeah, just give me one second. Um, it's been going. You said the time to post this appeal, and you said the initial decision to review and mm. appeal. Yeah. Are you including the appeal to the independent social appeal? Yeah, that, that all comes in. It's, this is the time to award well, a claim. Okay, but surely that's outside your department. What's the processing time if your department makes a determination? Well, that's... Look, we, we need to know yeah, what happens yeah. because that's an... You've added... Cause we all know how long that takes. You know, if they ever made the okay. decision in 18 weeks, yeah. it would be Sorry, I, I, I misled the committee chair. Because you've said, you've said appeals twice. Yeah, sorry, no, I've misled the committee chair. You're right. I've just, the 17 weeks it actually excludes the appeal. It includes the review, but excludes the yeah, appeal. So that, that 17 weeks is internal in the department internal before within the somebody department. even goes yeah. to the appeals commission yeah. or the independent okay. appeals office. Yeah. I just want to put that, because I felt that. Yeah, no, sorry, no. Yeah, it fine, includes fine, the review, fine. but it doesn't include the, the appeal. Fine. Deputy, yeah. So, that, so, that, so we'd hope to get that 17 week. In fact, it's down to 16 weeks, but anyway, that's just this week. And we've reduced the number of pendings on carers by 1,000 in the last month because we've put extra staff in. But the main challenge to us will be to get additional medical assessors. We are recruiting medical assessors at the moment. They're being interviewed this week. Uh, but it's not only getting them, it's holding on to them because medical assessors, and we all know in the medical well, community, the rate for these people? their principal officer about 90,000. They're, they're a lot of them, and they, they have, you can imagine, medical staff, they're qualified occupational doctors. It's hard to keep them at that level. And why is it set at the principal officer level? It's, if it's you're competing a, against the HSE. It's a, well, I think it's 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 an historical thing, uh, chair. What we are looking at, and what I've done in some other jurisdictions, and we're actively uh, looking at this at the moment, <laughs> is not every medical office, and okay. we're looking at that. We're actively looking at that to see whether that would be an option. <laughs> okay. Sorry, deputy. For okay. uh, Thank you. Um, so hopefully next week we'll, or next year we'll see a huge improvement in the... Yeah, I, I won't be able to say the average for the year will be eight, but I'd hope that by that time we'll have gotten to eight. Excellent. Uh, just um, in terms of, uh, I think it's uh, note 2.8 there in the accounts about your major capital projects, and uh, just one is obviously the uh, public service card. I think uh, your lifetime cost, you're expecting around 32 million. Just how do you feel... Uh, the card is operating, are you reducing instance of overpayment by it? Well, I suppose the, 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 the card's main purpose, and it's, it's difficult to calculate, actually, Deputy, how much we save you think on it's the value for money? card. I think it's value for money, um, and I'll explain why. We've always had an identity card, always, always had an identity card in the department. We previously had a social services card. And so when you talk about the public services card, and most of that cost would be in the actual production of the card, the actual payment for the card to be produced, a lot of those costs would be incurred anyway because we'd have been paying for the social services card right. to be produced. We've identified so far about 220 cases of identity fraud um, using the public service card. A number 220, of those, 220. 
A number of those have gone forward to prosecution. A number of them have. What value are they? Um, I don't have the average. Sorry, uh, the average value in controlled savings is about 4.2 million from those cases. Uh, exclusively from the PSC cases. Exclusively from the PSC. And were you disappointed? I know you had correspondence with um, your counterpart in the Department of Transport mm. after he and the decision that was taken in terms of to drop the mm. card for driver theory mm. tests mm. and some of uh, their, um, which will be a key user of the card. Were you disappointed with that decision? Um, well, I think it's a matter for each department to make its own judgment as to how. But you it did correspond to... with him. Didn't I you? did. Yeah, I think I. I, I sorry, my, as Secretary General of our accounting officer of this department. We use the public service card for our own purposes. Um, whether another department wants to use it. But the genesis it, of it was that it was supposed to be uh, a huge tool to save costs across other different departments as well. That was one of the arguments that was is. put forward and from its inception. So it is, and it's more about what we call the safe registration process more than the card itself. The card itself is just a token that somebody's identity has been authenticated. So it's more about the safe registration process. My own view on it is that... But it's more than a token when it can be used to access key benefits. And in theory, it was designed as well to be used by the NDLS service and to be used for theory test re yeah. registrations, etc., which it was going to be across interdepartmental uh, entitlements. Yeah, the, well, I think there's two, there are two things there, Deputy. The card itself, the physical card, is simply that it's a token, except... Uh, for in the use of, we have about a million people use it for the free travel scheme. So they use it and they tap on and tap off the buses and they use it to get through the train gates and so on using the card. And that's a very valuable, uh, which isn't captured, for example, in control savings. That's a very valuable benefit to, to customers. So do, you think it was a regress, do you think it was a regressive step by the Department of Transport? Uh, well, to they, drop it? they have to reach their own conclusions. I would argue that the safe process where we've authenticated a person's identity it shouldn't be necessary for another state body to have to ask the same person for the same information again once we've done it because we do it to a very high standard. And if we can confirm that a person's identity has been verified, we believe that process of verification and it does serve a good public service purpose if that is used again rather than a similar set of information being requested from the same customer. My understanding in the Department of Transport is that you know, they were concerned about their own legislative framework and whether they'd have to make changes to their own legislative framework to be able to use our service or not. That's my understanding. Um, but I'd hope and I think the intention is that they might return to using, from a customer service perspective, you're going as to a user. Them to do that. I would absolutely. As a user, I'd much prefer to be able to say, I've registered my identity once, here's my public service card. Yeah, and to, and to get to the, ex the exact idea of why it was brought about, it's important. Uh, just in terms of. Um, uh, non-procurement, there was a number of contracts there um, where they were in breach of procurement law. Yeah. Uh, just, have you just a very brief flavour of those or what's the reason um, behind it? Sorry, just bear with me a moment, definitely. I, I, don't, I, I can't give you a list of them obviously, but they're mainly on um, one... Uh, most of them refer to situations where we are waiting for a framework contract to be placed by the Office of Government Procurement. Our own contract had run out, the new framework contract hadn't been in place, so we had to renew the contract. So, for example, right. one of those was the contract we have for our own mobile phone service. So, you know, we couldn't leave inspectors and other staff at the department without mobile phones while we were waiting for a government procurement Is contract. Is that just failing to plan for the renewal or getting the tender? An inception early in planning to do that, or what's the reason behind Well, we had anticipated that the um, government procurement frameworks would be in place by the time our contracts came to a conclusion, but they weren't, and that meant that we were in a situation where we had to roll the contracts over. Other ones, for example, translation yeah. services, you know, which are important to us because we procure translation services. Most people think for services three gaeilge, but actually we have a lot of clients who would be from Poland, Russia and so on, and we have to procure translation services. And just in terms of, I noted that you embarked on a tender, or uh, was reported anyway, in relation to monitoring social media. Uh, That's right. Was that uh, tender awarded? Was it completed? No, we haven't proceeded with that element of the tender. We included it as an option. Um, we do as a department, like most other big organisations, not just in the public service but outside, we, we do have, previously they'd be known as press cutting services, so we get 
files every day of you know references to the department, references uh, in the press, and given the role that social media is now playing, we thought it might be useful if we also got cuttings of references to the department social media. It wasn't what it was presented in some places at the time that we were going to be monitoring individuals' use of social so media. Just for the department's it purposes. was just was the department mentioned in a post? Is there something trending that we should be aware of? Uh, but given but why the concerns, did you withdraw it then? Given the concerns, we thought just pause it for the time being and let's try to explain to people what we're doing before we proceed with and it. And do you intend to proceed with it at a later date? Um, not in the next year or two. When this contract is concluded, we, we consider it then. Um, and just in terms of the, uh, um, the um, rebate for making uh, employees redundant that the employer is uh, due to pay, what outstanding debt is there currently in relation to recouping that? Um, on the R and I scheme, just bear with me a moment. I should have a note on it here. Um, the current debt is about 460 million. 460 million. 60, 460. It's about 13,400 employers, the vast majority of whom would have gone insolvent or into liquidation in the period 2008 to 2013. And if, what happens when, when a company goes into liquidation that you have? that has a debt to the department, what, what actually happens to the debt then? Well, we, we retain that debt on the books of the department. We're a preferred creditor along with the revenue commissioners in a liquidation environment. Uh, and generally, uh, we will pursue recovery of that debt via the officially appointed liquidator. But in practice, you're doing well to get more than 10% of it back. And when the liquidation is completed, it's then a write-off situation. It's then a write-off situation. Yeah. So, and that can take up to seven or eight years. So this 400 plus million is in relation to either active liquidations or employers that are still alive. Yeah, there's a, the most of it. 75% would be people that we know definitively have, are, have been liquidated and have ceased trading. That's about 345 million. The prospects of getting any money back there are very, very slim. But we're pursuing it. About 41 million is in respect of sole traders who don't have to go through a liquidation process, but they do not appear to be trading either. Um, so that would be fair. There's about 16% of the debt of about 72 million, which we reckon is in respect of employers, where we know at least some of those employers are trading. They're listed on the company's registration office as trading, and we work with those companies and we try to agree repayment plans with them. And just in terms of the money the, back. I note that there was a failure to reconcile the amount uh, at the 31st of December 2017. And just in terms of your um, DRAS system, yeah. uh, why was that? The, the DRAS system is the transaction system which records the processing of debts and then it, it, it sends a file to our general ledger through a, an interim reporting system which updates our general ledger. The DRAS system is overstating the. Um, amount by about 0.05%, I think, if you had calculated in percentage terms. So you'd normally expect some difference between the transaction system and the general ledger. We are working to work it down. In the past year, we've done a forensic analysis of that debt by PPSN, which has meant looking at 1.8 million separate transactions to try and reconcile it. There will always it, be... It is a significant debt at this stage. The 460 million yeah. per employers. Oh, it is a significant debt, but I, th there's, it's separate to the debt which is on the DRAS system, which is in respect of, uh, say, individuals, claimants, and so on, which is about 440 million as well, 475 million. So it's, it's separate to that debt. Uh, we, sorry, if I was back in the private sector and I worked in the private sector for a long time, um, I'd be writing this debt off. There'd be no question that a lot of the employer debt would be written off now. Mm -hmm. Uh, government accounting rules are we do not write it off until the liquidation is completed. That's not to say that the debt, about the 75 million, the 72 million of that employer debt that we know is in respect to companies that have still some activity, that we work hard to recover that. Um, we took in about 7 million of that last year. So far this year, we're about 9 million recovered. And uh, we set up a new process with revenue. Actually, at the suggestion of the chair of the committee, I think last year. Yeah, we've set up a, a new process with revenue to, where we're exchanging details on the 100 highest debts in both organisations of, of employers. Some of the amounts are trivial. Some of the amounts are trivial. That's why we're going to focus on the 100 highest. And uh, revenue will have 100, we'll have 100, and we look at the intersection and work together. Do you see in the account somewhere you expect to collect 
approximately 10 percent. 10 percent is 10 percent is what out, we out of 500, yeah. 50 million. I know yeah. you say there are 70 live, but you won't get 100 percent. We won't get 100 percent of that. Million, no. either, yeah. Mm. So 50 million. But yeah. there, thereabouts is what we'd expect to get. I'd say we recover about 10 million a year on average. Um, the, the, the thing we're very conscious of, and the people, we have six people working full time, debt recovery on employers, and a lot of the employers that are still trading are still in financial difficulty. So if we pursue recovery of the debt too robustly, we're in danger of tripping them over and maybe incurring an even higher debt because the workers they then have to let go. So you've always got to get that balance. I mean, I've looked at a number of cases myself, just to be sure, but particularly, and I'd say particularly outside of Dublin, there are a number of small businesses that are struggling. Uh, we could go after them, but that wouldn't serve anybody's best interest. Yeah, um, thank, thank you. Point, and Thanks for your time. To, just to, I was going to ask a question or two on that point when I would come back in, but I'll just tear them up now because deputy work mm. is covered. Last year it was down to about seven million collections mm. for the full year, mm. based on your accounts there. Mm. You're saying it's over eight million. It's, so it's, it's eight point eight million up to, the, up so, to so we expect to be now about nine million by the year end. But, but yet, yet there was payment out last year of almost thirty million. Yeah. There's still quite a bit redundancy. It's still, it's a significant reduction. At one, you know, back in 2011, you were looking at payments of 340 million a year. Right. Yeah. The previous year it was 40 million. So yeah. it's yeah. in the right trend anyway. Yeah. Just, and just on that topic to say, coming back. Um, you, 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 you have now a system in place with the revenue, because yeah. I know you mentioned you're dealing with the company's office, but the revenue are the best people to mm -hmm. tell you, are they active? Yeah. You know, and yeah. you, you have made yeah. some contacts with the revenue. You yeah. have some system in place. There That's right. We've just set up under our memorandum of understanding with Revenue and Employer Debt Recovery Group, yeah, and we've spoke. agreed to take 100 cases from both organisations, look at the intersection or the overlap, and then work together on that overlap. They'd be the 100 highest cases from each organisation. Right. And if that's successful, well, we'll extend it. OK. And, and just the last question on this topic, just to finish this debt issue and then call Catherine Murphy, so I won't have to come back to it. Where you list in your receipts in the Social Insurance Fund the benefit over payment recovery, how do you handle... Are they actual people making repayments of debt to you, or are they people who is in receipt for payment and they're agreeing to pay €30 Euro a week? How, how do you handle the two different types of... It's both, and I might rely on my colleague um, to, to maybe talk a bit, a, a bit on this, but we, most of our recoveries are coming from people who are still in payment yeah, because we have a direct contact with them. That's the truth. Any TD in Ireland will tell you that. Yeah. Um, okay. We do also recover debt, off-book debt, um, what we call off-book, which are people who are off-book, and yeah. we've now got the ability to apply attachment orders to earnings, and we've started to apply that attachment order. Um, and we've met them too as well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we, we are looking um, to, to, to do that. And maybe Kathleen, if I can ask you, Kathleen, if you just want to comment on those recoveries, because Kathleen is the lady who's actually okay, responsible great. for making it happen, if that's OK, Chair. Yeah, absolutely, okay. we're delighted. Chair, I suppose just in terms of, of our outstanding debt for, for individuals now yeah. rather than employers, yeah. we're yeah. talking here. We have uh, 156,000. Uh, this is at the end of October. Sorry, the end of October. Yeah, we have 156, just a little over 156,000 debts and 475 million in value. Um, and as the Secretary General mentioned, uh, I suppose we divide them between on book who are people who are still getting a payment from us each week, and then a number of off book people as well. So we have about 60% in terms of value who are on book, um, or sorry, who are off book, and 40% who are on book. So if you break the 475 down, roughly 191 million is on book and 284 is off book. Right. And my question is, just in your accounts, how do you record, you have in your receipts, for example, um, benefit over payment recoveries? Yeah. Is that a combination of the people who are not in payment and giving you a cheque, plus the amount that effectively you're not paying it out and you're taking that in as a receipt in here? Is that yes. Yeah. yeah. So that figure includes... That's right. Yeah, amount, amounts kind of deducted at source Absolutely. with the agreement or otherwise yeah. of the person involved. Yeah. Okay. For, 48 million is cash and, and 30, last year we got 82 million back. So 48 million is cash and 34 million is direct deductions. Direct deduction. That's what it was looking for. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dack. Now, Deputy Murphy. Yeah, just to pick up on that just to begin with, um, I mean, I've and, and the control piece for us is the people who walk through our door with the uh, 
you know, with the letter, you have an overpayment or whatever, and, you know, there's things that kind of jump out, and if somebody's an overpayment, or if somebody was overpaid or fraudulently claimed, obviously you've got to deal with that. And um, negotiating that very often in terms of the negotiating how people deal with you is, is sometimes why people will contact us. But one of the, one of the groups that I've seen kind of a, a number of are, are people who just maybe are on, say, a family income supplement and maybe work in a school um, and didn't quite get the right number of weeks because of the storm, because of school holidays and that kind of thing. Now, they could have signed off and gone on to a job seekers payment um, and should have signed off and gone on to a job seekers payment. Um, the this might have been a smaller payment. How do you manage that in terms of, of how you reflect that kind of thing? Is, there, is, there a, is that a contra item or, or, um, or, or do you look back in retrospect with somebody like that? Well, I, I just talk about generally we review FIS once a year. So when somebody gets into a FIS payment, or a working family payment as it's called now, we review it on an annual basis. Now we do ask them to notify us if there's any material changes yeah. in their circumstances. If they don't and they continue to get a family income supplement payment, if they have an entitlement to another benefit, we would generally and maybe we would generally net it off. We wouldn't. We would offset yeah. it. So you know, it's likely they're probably getting less yeah. in that situation from working family payment than they would have been from a job seeker payment. Yeah. So we would generally net it off, and it wouldn't be an issue. Right. Okay. So it, it's not going to show up in in, in in terms of something that you'll follow through. You'll you'll. You, you deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, just, um, I'm nearly afraid to raise the issue of job path because when I do, I know I'm going to get, um, and uh, uh, my colleagues are going to get a, a number of people who'll, who'll make contact who've had in, engagement with the service. But the one thing that, um, it depends on what you count in terms of value for money. You know, I have no problem with there being a case management system. Mm. Uh, and I think it's great that people are helped to maybe, I, you know, have a, a, a plan. I, I can't say I'm wild about uh, the uh, the outsourcing of it, um, uh, but I, I have a bigger problem with uh, what I'm told by people about just exactly what they uh, can expect from the service when they uh, when when they engage with it. And it seems like. Nearly everybody tells you that they sit and they look at a computer. They're invited in once a week. Sit and look at a computer. Go through, go through a, um, a you know jobs.ie or something like that. And that is the extent of um, that is the extent of their engagement. That I'm here. I hear that over and over and over again. Have you done an analysis in relation to the difference? in terms of the engagement with uh, the like of Intrio and with JobPath in relation to the person's experience in terms of a case being managed? Okay. First of all, Deputy, we do specify the range of services that must be provided by the JobPath providers. And they include, we've, unlike in other countries, in other countries they use what was called a black box approach. They said, we're sending you a job seeker. Your job is to try and help the job seeker get a job. We don't care how you do it, but if you do, we pay a certain amount. Uh, we said, well, we're not going that route. We're going to specify a minimum range of services that must be provided. So CV, assistance on CV, assistance on, CV, on interview skills, uh, the development of a personal progression plan, support if a person is in employment for the first three months they're in employment. Uh, and a range of other services are meant to be provided. We do, and as part of the contract model, we did specify that if providers didn't deliver those services, and we do customer satisfaction research and ask customers, and we've done it four or five times now, and I think I gave the most recent published version of the research and the information, we do ask customers, are they satisfied with the service? Do they think that it's delivering a good service and so on? And generally, on a scale of zero to five, where five is really brilliant and zero is pretty lousy, they're scoring in mid four point something, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, across pretty much all of the things that we measure, including the personal progression plan, including the post-employment support, including whether they think the services are valuable and will help them get a job. 
so at the, at the macro level, the feedback from customers is good. We've done, I think, about 180 inspections of job path providers. I, that number might be a little bit wrong. I, I need to just verify it. We have inspectors who go out and who check what's going on on the ground, and we haven't come across anything that causes us any huge concern. There have been some issues. There are always issues, and they've been sorted out. But we haven't come across any huge issues. And as I said, in terms of the outcomes, when we compare it, one of the questions we asked, sorry, by the way... I have a very limited amount oh, sorry, of time, sorry, so sorry, if you don't me, mind, I'd just like to kind of ask the questions I, I, want, to, I want to particularly direct at you. Um, the, uh, I mean, the narrative hasn't changed in terms of people who, who, who make contact. That's mm. the point I make. Um, and I, I would say that um, in terms of customer satisfaction, customer satisfaction in people's minds, for example, mm. is if you go into a shop and you buy something and it doesn't, mm. it doesn't, uh, you know, it fulfil what it was supposed to. You know, there's a there's a different kind of mindset in relation to that. There are particular departments that people don't like to have any serious engagement with. And I've got to say that 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 is something that we you know that that we will hear is that you know people will fill out the form they um uh, or, or they, they they will have a they, they won't want to rock the boat, let's put it that way, with the Department of Social Protection because they're in a vulnerable, uh, mm -hmm. they would see themselves in a vulnerable position. So it, it, I just make that point. Um, uh, the, the, what what do you, would you describe as full employment? So, well, you can ask any, you can line all the economists in the world up, Deputy, and you'll get a different answer from all of them, the usual, the, the, to use the cliche, they'll never reach a conclusion. I mean, we were at, before the recession, if you take before the recession, we were at 4%. That was... Um, now, it was described uh, as full employment at the time, four, yeah. constantly. Now, generally speaking, <coughs> economists will tell you that it's, that percentage has been related to the overall number of people in the labour market. And as, if you have a bigger labour market, the measure of yeah. full employment will so go to 4 5 Do you have a number? Do you have a number? I don't have no, a number. Okay. They, 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 that's really a matter for the, the okay. part of business enterprise yeah, but innovation. Would, would, that, but would that matter in terms of, for example, you're coming up to, uh, to a point, I mean, uh, or when you come to a point of renewing contracts, mm. that obviously some, would be something you'd look at because uh, the need would be different in a, a growing economy. And of course, just because an economy has grown doesn't mean it will continue to grow. Mm. But um, the that presumably is something that you factor Oh, absolutely. I mean, what we look at, de Deputy, is not so much the percentage of unemployment, but the number of people on our caseload. What people used to call the live register, the CSO have moved away a little bit from that. They still produce the figure, but they now focus on a monthly unemployment figure. So if you look at our live register, we have 188,000 people on it at the moment. We have about another 70,000 people on various programmes. So you're looking at about 250,000. Um, so we'll see where we are. These contracts are due for renewal at the end of next year, if, if at all. Um, we'll have a look over the next year at what we can do. We'll serve the, the, our client base with our own resources first, local employment service second, and then contract capacity on top of that if it's needed. And we'll have a look at that and we'll consider it. Okay, and in in, the, in that context, I mean, obviously, the the uh, <coughs> the introduction of both of the job path scheme had an impact on the like of community employment schemes. If you counted community mm. employment schemes only in relation to progression, mm. they, you know, you may well get a different measurement. Some of the community employment schemes, schemes fulfil quite mm. you know significant roles in communities that you know that would. You know things like Mills and Wheels, or you know, um, you know, running football clubs, or whatever. It's it, it very often it's it, it helps a community to function. Um, the there there has changed the dynamic of that. The, the like of the job path because people are more directed towards job path than they are uh, community employment uh, schemes. Um, and the minute they leave a community employment scheme, they go straight onto job path. So that's counted as unemployment. But they may well have had training before that that benefits in terms of the numbers that uh, uh, that that can sus that sustain employment after. Would that would that be fair to say? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the reality. I mean, we can all get very narrow-minded about when somebody gets a job. What was it that got them the job? Was it a stint they had on job part? Was it a stint they had in community employment? Was it a stint they had in a, a training course with the local uh, ETB? The important thing is it's probably the sum total of all of that which ultimately helps somebody who's very long-term unemployed get into employment. The, what the issue was raised before, Deputy, I don't know if you're alluding to this, about for a while, up until last year, mainly because we were trying to ration available places among everybody, 
people who are on community employment and who couldn't also be on job path and vice versa. And now we've changed that. And in the last couple of months, for example, about 1,200 people are on community employment and to on job path at the same time. So we've relaxed that because community employment is a, is a 19 week, hour a week requirement. Mm. Job path doesn't take up the other 19 hours a yeah. week, it's a couple of hours a week. So we've relaxed that and so we're trying to make sure that to the extent people thought they were in competition with one another, and they never were, you know, that's been raised with me. I can honestly absolutely say they were never in competition with one another, but to the extent that people thought they were, it's certainly not an issue anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just to move on, I just want to just very quickly make uh, just ask a question in, in relation to the um, the card, um, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. uh, sorry, the, the name? public service public card, service card safe public process. service card. Um, um, it, I mean, there's there's legislation for the use of mm. that card by the Department of Social Protection. When there was a discussion around other departments using it, what was the what was the discussion that was had in relation to whether or not they had the legal uh, competence or legal uh, uh, status to actually use that card? Well, certainly, definitely, that's a matter for each department by so itself. So there wasn't, there wasn't a collaborative approach between the departments? No, no, sorry, that would be wrong to say that as well. I mean, the view, and certainly there's a government decision on this, that where um, uh, citizens, clients, customers, people use different terms, so I use all of them so that I don't depend on anyone. But when anyone is, you know, in, engaging with the state to get a high value public service, they should satisfy or authenticate their identity with what we call Safe2 standard, which is a, a, a high level of assurance as to someone's identity. Whether that is done through our process or whether another body decides to set it up and have their own parallel process, well, we would strongly encourage the other body to use our process purely for the public savings and the public convenience associated with it. If another public body decides to use another process of their own, that's a matter for them. Yeah. Now, they'll obviously have to get sanction from the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform for the expenditure on it, so that's a separate discussion they'll need to have. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I, one of the concerns that people and some people had was that um, that by virtue of the, the range of a different different departments using it for different things, like for example, driver driver licences, um, that uh, uh, that was turning into a kind of almost a national identity card by stealth, as opposed to if we're going to have that, let's have the mm. debate on it if you like, um, uh, but not by not by stealth. But then there was there was question marks over the whether or not there was legal, the legal uh, st status by other departments to actually use that card. Now, I would have thought when you were actually setting it up, that would have been given a considerable degree of consideration, because there, you, you know, as you said, if it's going to be a cost, that cost doesn't have to be repeated by multiple cards, for example. Um, what kind of engagement happened? No, well, there was uh, the engagements at official level. Um, uh, between different departments, there was a government decision, there was a joint memo which was sponsored to government by our department and the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. The, the, the issue then is it's up to the other departments to make that real. I can't write the legislation. No, if legislation is needed for okay. another department, what I would say, Deputy, is I am confident myself that even within the Social Welfare Consolidation Act, and in particular Section 262 of that Act, would give the other bodies the, the legislative authority to use the card. I'm confident in that decision. That, that's something that might be tested in due course, but I'm confident that that authority is already in place. Okay, right. Can I just uh, move on to the um, social insurance fund? Um, and the, uh, I mean, obviously, an ageing population mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the, the 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 cost of. Um, like this, so the, the exchequer subventions will need to increase in 2017. The real price uh, to 20, uh, 1.7 million to 2025 and 5.6 million to 2035, which obviously reflects the uh, uh, the ratio of um, people employed to pensioners in the main. I, I would think. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have the figures in in relation to the numbers of people as opposed to the uh, as opposed or what those ratios are did you provide that to us um, in relation to the projected number or um, ratio 
I don't know if I have the numbers with me, but we can certainly get it. Yeah. The, the, the figures were done for us by um, KPMG, who conducted the actuarial review, so there will be numbers in the detailed report. I can certainly get those to you, Deputy. Maybe one of my colleagues might be able to lay yeah. their hands on it. And, and what but, relationship would that have now, for example, um, in terms of, for example, we have a national development plan and a national planning framework, um, and, uh, you know, so there, there's a... There's a cross relationship between this where there's an expectation that the population will grow. I presume that actuarial, actuarial uh, um, assessment or, um, or review will, will have looked at the projected population growth as well. And is it possible to do that? Oh, it is, yeah. Well, there, 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 there is what's called the ageing, um, it's the AGS, I can't remember the exact um, meaning of the acronym, but the European Commission and their across all European countries, involving our own Central Statistics Office, produce a report which does long-term population projections for every country, and they use those long-term population projections from last year in the development of this. Yeah, well, I don't think every country has the same profile as Ireland, because if you start looking at, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the vehicle That's of emigration right. when there's a downturn and things like that. They, just for that, the CSO is the authority in Ireland that inputs into the European Commission, so the figures are adjusted for each country based on the experts in the country providing right. the population Looking projections. At, at, at that. Um, the, just going back on to uh, another aspect in relation to disability payments, and um, um, Deputy Burke talked about the length of time it takes to, uh, for example, to process a carer's yeah. allowance. And like you're looking at situations where somebody has to leave, it would probably be more a carer's benefit, somebody has to leave work because somebody gets has a stroke or something like that, and, and there can be an in, there, there can be a gap in, in the length of time. But one of the areas that shows quite a sizable amount of um, and, and that needs to happen quite quickly because it, it obviously um, it, it obviously can put uh, somebody from being in a situation where they're at work to uh, suddenly depending on social welfare and may well have some savings and things like that so community welfare officers don't really kind of kick in so that would be one category but there's other categories um, in the area of disability as well um, um, I certainly have come across people who have had previously been on an invalidity pension and um, and I realise that that it is not necessarily a, a pension for life um, uh, if somebody recovers and you would want them to recover and they go back to work and it's a useful payment from that point of view. But I've seen people removed from it that you, 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 the mind boggles um, uh, where, you know, somebody has, has a, you know, a very obvious long-term illness. Um, the, then if you say appeal something like that or say disability payments, there's very high level of reversal of departmental decisions when it comes to the, that section of disability. Um, it certainly, I think it's in excess of 50%, if it's, if it, or it certainly was. Um, and it seems to me that that is not a very good use of administrative time um, and in actual fact, it, it adds a layer of uh, uh, both concern and bureaucracy to somebody who ends up getting uh, the payment when it's when they're successful on appeal. Have you looked at that, um, or has that number come down in recent times? No, uh, there's, there's two issues you raised there, Deputy. One was the issue of somebody who's on a payment, being their case being reviewed and then them being taken off the payment. I'd have to say that's very rare that it happens, mm. so it'd be very unusual. And if you have examples, mm. I'd be very happy to, to see them and maybe have a look at them. Uh, but that's very rare, because generally on a, a payment, particularly like invalidity pension, to get onto the payment in the first instance, yeah. you tend to have a very profound yeah. medical condition. So it's very rare that that happens. That's not to say it doesn't happen. The, with regard to the appeals, you're right, about 60% of people who appeal a disability or invalidity related decision, which is about 1% of people who get the decision, so we've got to put it in that context, but about 60% of those who do um, get what's called a favourable outcome, uh, about 40% of that 60%, so 40 over 60, they get the favourable outcome. What happens when an appeal comes in is the appeals office send it back to the department for another look, and generally at that stage, that's where most of them get the favourable outcome. And generally it's because people have provided additional information which wasn't available to us the first time. Now we've worked with disability <laughs> activation groups, we've worked with carers for example, and on the carers we've, we've developed a new form now. 
it's getting positive and negative feedback. On the one hand, we're accused that it's too long. Uh, on the other hand, the carers' associations, for example, feel that's as long as it needs to be in order to make sure that you capture all the information which is required to make a, a first instance decision rather than a second instance decision. So we're continuing to work to try to improve the quality of the information available, because our medical assessors, you know, they don't. They're, they're not the till is the hun, if you know what I mean. They're, they're trying to look realistically and objectively at each case, and it's frustrating for them as well if somebody presents with, you know, a fairly bare um, characterisation from their GP about a particular illness, and they say, well, and then subsequently that you get a full consultant's report, which suddenly puts the whole thing into perspective. Yeah, can, can I just say that it, I've had a good bit of experience mm. dealing with these, mm. and uh, and I certainly would be telling people to give evidence, evidence, mm. evidence, mm. because you need the full uh, the full mm. range of information to make a decision. But I've seen I've seen cases reversed, mm. or where there's a more favourable treatment, where there hasn't been really much additional information. The question I'm asking is. Is, is, there, is it useful to again look at, at the process um, uh, because of, uh, in terms of value for money and terms of, of administrative errors that will be used on, on something like this, where there is such a large percentage, albeit of a small number of people who apply? And, and we are looking at that, the Deputy. I've met the yeah, Chief. Of, uh, yeah, can if I can just give you. 10 seconds on this. Yeah. I've met the, the Chief Appeals Office, who operates as an independent office from the Department. And uh, I've asked her to meet with our chief medical officer. Now, they don't like meeting one another, not because they don't like each other, but because of the independent element they don't want. But I said, listen, can you sit down, discuss this, find out what's on, going on underneath to see if we can sort it out. So we are doing that at the moment. Okay. okay. I'm going to call Deputy McSharry and Deputy O'Brien. Both of you want to get in before the vote. Or two. Yeah, you can, yeah. Okay, uh, unfortunately I wasn't here for your presentation, so if I'm, if I'm covering ground that has already been covered, Chairman, you just stop me and I'll move on. Uh, because uh, I had to go to another meeting. Um, just on um, uh, job activation uh, measures, is there, is there an, an analysis done in terms of outcomes um, on the percentages that are in full employment, that have gained employment, that are more welfare dependent, less welfare dependent? Yeah, we, we've done a number of econometric reviews on different schemes at different points in time. Um, so we've done econometric reviews of the, um, the back to education allowance, for example, which is an activation measure. Uh, we're just finishing one on job path, and we have a programme of, review, of reviews ongoing. Are they we'll published or they just used oh, they're published. Oh, they're published. So the, the job path one we publish in January. Back to Education Allowance was published last year. We did a back to work. Mm. And what's the allowance. headlines? I mean, just very quickly. The, I mean, the headlines. Is it, is uh, it the 50 percent, 80 percent, 20 percent? No, no. The, the, the headlines in Ireland are the same as all around the world. I don't have the figures just to hand, but in general terms, in general terms, things like case management advisory type interventions, which would be intro, which would be job path, tend to have positive impacts. Um, the is, yeah, specific okay. training schemes, and you're looking at positive impact. I'm, I'm more so, interested in the, the percentages. Oh, you're looking at uplifts of around about 20 percent. Now, that's very around broad. About 20 percent success. Over and above what would have happened in the absence. So you're looking at an uplift. Um, so does it mean that 80 percent were unsuccessful? No, no. What I'm saying is, for example, <laughs> if without case management, 10 percent of people would have got into employment. Which, with case management, 12 percent get in. So there's a 20 percent increase over what would have happened. It's that kind of. A 20 per cent increase over what would have happened. So you're saying 12 per cent would have gained employment, so 20 per cent above that is 15 yeah. per cent in total. That, that, so that's the way they're measured. That's how you measure these right. programs. And is that, would it be that low? That's the kind of thing. You're generally, you're speaking about people who've been very long term unemployed who have significant barriers to employment. And then the cost of the schemes then versus the 20 per cent increase well, or generally, a real increase of 2 generally, per cent. And again, generally you'll find that case management activation type services. You, you don't provide them, by the way. Just and so you don't provide them on the basis that they're going to break even. You know, oh, no, it's, it's not a case of breaking but even or being profitable. You don't have to provide the that, service. But I suppose you would. You, 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 you'd be worth an analysis. It's oh, yeah. CNG. Have you done any analysis of them? Well, is it, is what, it, on, I mean, it, it is a difficult. Um, is it on the radar, or is it because there's difficult to, metrics? No, it, it is difficult. I think it is more um, a, a, a sort of an economics research unit that needs to do that kind of work. Okay. Rather uh, than have uh, we got one of those? Have I got one of those? No. Yeah. Uh, have you? Genuinely, we probably, as our department does, not we've published a number, and I'll get you copies of all of them. We do more econometric reviews of what we do than any other department in the state. Yeah. And generally, as I said, the, the, the outcomes are positive. 
if you were to bring those outcomes back and say, well, now has the state broken even on that? The purpose isn't for the state to break even. The purpose well, is I, to I provide with, a service I, to I the agree, job seeker. I agree with that. But if the cost was 30 million and the win was 20 per cent extra people or 2 per cent in the total, um, uh, you know, we, 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 I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, common to, sense would demand. Okay. Uh, let's look at another. Okay. Let's look at another way. So, yeah. uh, that, surely that's worthwhile. It is worth. I'll, I'll give you, an, and it depends. And who would we ask? Just, sorry for interrupting, because I know time is saying and you like to talk mm. more than myself. Uh, can I ask CNG who would be the economic forum in, in the Irish state that we could ask to do something like this? Well, I think the obligation is on the department to demonstrate that what they're doing is value for money. Okay. So I think I support the idea that they do the research so could in we the do first that? instance and publish it. Uh, and, and make the case. Could, could, could we do that? It's just because uh, like the, the kind of default position is, look, we're not doing this to make money. We're not doing this to, to, to break even. I, I appreciate that. There's a cost to the service. But the, the, you know, we, we need some way to measure the cost-benefit analysis of you know, a 2% win sounds pretty small. Uh, well, it's 20%. Yeah, well, it's 20% of, 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 you said, 10 to 12% are going to get employed. But that's just an illustrative So number. then we're, we're all the way up to 15%. Mm -hmm. So in that 3% boost, if it's 30 million or 40 million, maybe that's great value for money. But you know what? Maybe it's not. And maybe we need to do an analysis on okay. that 30 million would be better spent Doing something else for these people. Say, the, the, we commissioned the econometric research by the ESRI, the OECD, bodies like that, and Good. it's published, it's peer reviewed, it's all out there. But does the it, deal, one, does it give it, us the answer that I'm looking for here? It, it does give indications, and I, I don't have them with me, but it does tackle value for money. If I can give you a very rough number, Deputy, which might help. Yeah. If you look at the numbers of people who've been placed into employment through the job path service, or it's wrong to say placed into employment, got employment subsequent to the job path service, and divide the total cost by the number of people who are now in full-time employment, it works out about €4,000 per job. Those people would generally be in receipt of €10,900 as job seekers. When they go into employment, they're going to pay about 5000 in taxes. So you could, at a very simplistic way, say, well, there's 15000 for about 4500 yeah. It's not as clean and as simple as that, because then you've got to ask, well, how many of those people that you spent 4500 on would have got a job anyway? Yeah. And that's where the complexity comes into the analysis. So and it's many, important to do and that. And many left the job and six months later and we're back that, so, so you do need, it's a very specialised field of research. Yeah. As I said, with the Department of Probably Commissions, and if you talk to the ESRI or the OECD or the bodies, we'd have a reputation as a department for publishing this data and for not... To, so it's all out there. I just don't have the exact detail that you have one right. in front of me. But so will you send it? Oh, we can send you all the. All but the all. I mean, we don't need ten reports now. But I mean, I think you know what yeah. I'm asking. So if you could send us that. Yeah, yeah. We, well, we'll send you the ones we've done. And, uh, all right. Okay. What Sorry. report are you going to send? Just well, the ones report? that have been published recently have been on the back to education allowance, and I think the one on the back to work enterprise allowance has been published as well. Yeah. So and your job the path coming. Job path will be in January. Oh. Well, maybe send us all three in January. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just, I, I think it's good. It's, uh, uh, all right. Grant. Um, There's a Job Plus review as well, which will be published shortly. So we'll send the four of them. I read an article that 11,000 people did the job path thing twice. It's 15,000 now, definitely. We spoke about that earlier. Sorry, all right, okay. okay. So I don't want to go over all ground. Did we deal with that adequately with it? Yeah, yeah okay. I'll move on then. Um, if people are in prison, do they receive social welfare? Uh, up until yesterday, no. Um, the, the Supreme Court decision yesterday is one we now have to consider. Uh, it was particularly in the context of pensions. So we'll have to consider that Supreme Court decision and see what it means. And what was the decision, just very briefly? Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, an appeal, a, a case taken by a prisoner um, who claimed that his, effectively he claimed that his social insurance entitlement was a property right. He yeah. paid his contributions, therefore he was entitled to a payment whether he was in prison or not. Benefit. A benefit. Yeah, yeah, we're not talking about allowance. Not allowances. Benefit. But we'll have to, we need to be clear about, I haven't had the chance to read the judgment. Okay, I only so got the summary be... judgment yesterday. I need to read the full judgment and we have to get the Attorney General's office yeah. to look at it. Th th that'll be linked to contributions though, wouldn't it? It would be linked yeah, to contributions. Yeah, okay, so I mean, you can't get job seekers allowance in prison, can you? Uh, well, th you can't get job seekers benefit in prison either because you need to be genuinely available for and seeking work, which okay, is a very right. difficult condition. Invalidity, pension, in disability? Invalidity, pension is a possibility. Um, uh, disability, probably not. It's a means tested. As I said, Deputy, I'm loath to go too far into it. We need to read the no, I appreciate there's, there's implications. And the Attorney General will have to advise. I mean, the, the, the case was lost at the High Court. 
the Attorney General's office on our behalf, even though we knew the Supreme Court was likely to reach the decision it did, that the Supreme Court was deciding what type of order it would make. We had argued there was a type of order which it was possible to make to resolve the constitutional issue, which would not result in people in prisons being entitled to benefits. We now need to consider with the Attorney General whether that is an issue that is maybe the subject of a further appeal. Okay. So I think that is as much as I can say. All right. Uh, do, 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 is there a protocol around who holds uh, somebody's social welfare card when they are in prison? So if I am a prisoner, do I surrender my social welfare card to the governor of the prison? Or theoretically, is it out floating around? No, well, it's, it's, it's a personal card. It's your card. Right. So, I mean, you keep it. Now, you can give it to somebody else, but the advantage of the public service card is they won't be able to use it fraudulently because of the identity checks. Yeah. So, it's not like the old social services card, which didn't have a photo on and it. And there example. protocols where you routinely get the list of people that are in prison or in we custody? Do. Yeah, we do. You cross check that, then it gets weekly. payments. Yeah. All right, okay, good. Um, Taurus Nua, is that pronounced right yet? Taurus Nua? Taurus Nua, yeah. Okay. Was that dealt with in detail earlier on, too? It was, yeah. But okay, I won't, I won't annoy you about that then. Um, yeah, in. in um, do, do you employ um, um, private investigators? No. Never? No. So that's the special investigations you to do all of that sort of work? Yeah. Okay, and I see that um, uh, in, in, in the, I think it was page 12, it mentions 130 cases were given to the Gardaí for further investigation or referred to the DPP. So, so what sort of a case, I mean, not getting into individual cases, but what sort of cases I might ask get, Kathleen get to that stage? That. Or, or, yeah. I suppose yeah. they're, they're more high-end fraud cases, typically where you'd have somebody trying to impersonate somebody else or maybe a, a, you know, a serial offender who's been working and claiming for a number of years. They would be the, the cases we'd refer under the Criminal Justice Act. For prosecution. So people pretending to be me looking for my benefits or my... Yes. Yeah, okay. And, and there's about 130 somebody of them. Would they be large? Somebody maybe who has two PPSN numbers on the go, they might be claiming social welfare under one and working under another. So it's, it's, How do you get two? Um, you shouldn't, but, but on occasion... Who gives them out? The department. So does the department have different processes and procedures now to prevent people getting two, or how is that checked? The service card and the safe yes. process. A lot of these would have predated the introduction of the safe process. So right, the so quality of the safe process. Have a photo card we have whatever. the photo and we can check with our facial image matching software has this person presented before and if they have. Okay. So the deterrent. Did you grow a beard? No, the, the, it, works on, it works on mathematical models. Right. Mm. Okay. So, so, so it's. Sure, yeah. There's, yeah. there's loads of PPS numbers. Mm -hmm. There's more PPS numbers than there are people. Mm -hmm. So there has to be duplicates all over the place. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, definitely, there are people who, for example, may be looking for a benefit from abroad who will be looking, who are, need a PPSN in order to transact business with the state. Um, there there are mean, people. We're who going to ask you, send us a. Because yeah. people have emigrated, people have died. Uh, you know, yeah, you're, you're, they're no longer so working yeah. and for long-term benefits. Yeah. Send us. You must have some information on the breakdown. I think break there's seven down. million yeah. PPS numbers. Out no, there. I think we provided that information a number of times in response to different PQs. So we put yeah, it together. Easy, put yeah. it together yeah. for us. Thanks. What percentage of, of reports come from the general public? Joe blogs is. Claimant wise, or, or oh well, the numbers. Well, they all come from the general public, but it's the number. They all come from the general public. Yeah. How do you differentiate between a vexatious claim, or a vexatious report, and a genuine one? We we or do you investigate we do, all? we do no. We do a we do a desk review of each case, and in often cases, it's very easy to determine that they think John McKeown is working and claiming, but actually he's a casual part-time worker or he's on the working family payment, so that just isn't pursued. Yeah. About 70% of cases, I think it is, Kathleen, go on for an investigator So about 30% are deemed to be vexatious for what I've Well, well I, I, the person has an entitlement and that there's no issue involved. All right, okay. Without merit, is yeah. my, my, rather than say vexatious. And would it be a case merit? of people, you know, I don't like John McKeown, so I ring up and say, listen, John McKeown is working and claiming. They, listen, uh, we, we don't go into why people, or we don't try to figure out why people uh, reported, whoever they might report. Okay, so our, the our thing as well is their validity in report. You take every report on face value, do a desktop review, and from that you determine yeah, whether you go yeah, forward or yeah, not. Yeah. Have you been wrong in many cases that you've pursued? Um, I don't know what the outcomes would be. It, it, it depends. Sorry? Just a trigger. 
the, yeah. the reports themselves are just a trigger for an investigation. Sure. Which the department would look into the facts and evidence. So nothing, no action is taken on the foot of the report itself. The department right. would conduct a thorough investigation. Have you pursued any to the nth degree that have ended up to be false or vexatious? No, because the department would have to establish facts and evidence to support any anything that's in the original report. So Did you lose many cases when you got to that stage? So when we get to a court stage, for yeah. example, generally we don't lose cases in court. Um, okay. Ten percent, one percent. That none less, I would say less than one percent. Okay, good, less than one percent. Sorry. Want to let, no, want to let Deputy O'Brien in? He was in here. Callers, would you get uh, just in a year. reporting suspected fraud? Just as a matter of interest. Last year we got a little over twenty-one thousand, and up to October this year we got thirty, about thirteen and a half thousand. Can we? There is a vote, but we want to let Deputy O'Brien in. You want to let Deputy O'Brien in? Because he can't come back after lunch. Dealing with the uh, abortion legislation after lunch. Lunch, you'll have a second up. I did have a few more questions, but we get you again. Thank you. Um, I'll fly through them, and Mark might even be able to get back in. Can I go, can I, can I go back to the um, referrals and the job commencement? Uh, just looking at the figures. So uh, we're working off two sets of figures. We're working off current figures and we're working off the figures in the CNAG report. So I, I'm happy enough to work off the figures in the CNAG report, which is 15,731 of the 62,631 um, actually commenced the job of some duration. It says 15% uh, sustained employment for at least 13 weeks, which my calculations are it's about 9,395. 9, um, so are we saying then that the other 40%, uh, whatever it is, the 9,000 less the, or 15,000 less the 9,000 uh, didn't make the 13 weeks? That would be my interpretation okay. of it, yeah. That they didn't, they, they started the job, but, but they didn't, didn't reach persist the in it. Weeks. Yeah, they didn't so reach I, 13 I, weeks. I make out about, there's about 40% of people don't make the 13 week period. Um, and I, there's a number of questions that I, and I'll get to them at the end. So of the 13 weeks, which is 9395, we then go down to the next category of 26 weeks, which is about 7515. So there's about a drop off of about 20%, about 18, 80 is, and these are just real mm. rough figures now. But I estimate that there's about, between 13 and 26 weeks, a further 1,880 people drop off. Then the next stage, I make it 5637. So there's a further drop off of again of about 25%, which is 1878. And then the final one, which is the one year, we end up with about 4,384 people completing the one year, which is a further drop off of 1,253, which is about 22%. Um, would that be correct, those rough calculations? Yep. Yes. Okay. We have more up to date data, and as I explained earlier on, the, the figures improve because, because people haven't people got the opportunity. Haven't had time. Yeah. Okay. So. So, Deputy, the, the reference period, if, if you look at the, uh, the yeah, diagram, it's up to which, which is March, on screen. It's up to December 2016, so some yeah. of them wouldn't have yeah, it. But, up. but the, the target that was set by the department for that performance okay. was based on uh, a projection as to the number that might start a job, and then they said we would expect 80% uh, that's right. For each quarter as you go on. So uh, th that's the sort of progression rate. And the progression, apart from the first, the 13 weeks, the progression works out at 75, yeah. 80, so it's uh, 80. Pretty close. It's it, it, it's, it is the pattern that was previously okay. seen, apart from the fact that more people were starting jobs and more people were falling out in the first 13 weeks. You can see it in the, yeah, in I, the diagram I, there. There's I make a, about a faster fall off. drop out before yeah, they hit the It's a very fast weeks. fall off. Do we have a reason or do we know why there's such a huge drop off before the 13 weeks? Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say, Deputy. Around the world, again, the, the evidence is that the first four weeks in particular of somebody starting in a job, particularly being very long term unemployed, is critical. So that people generally they haven't been working. Most of the people we've referred to job path have been three years or more unemployed on the day they okay. start. So Here's it's very difficult for someone who has that long period of unemployment. Simple things like getting up in the morning and being at there at nine o'clock 
and you know taking instructions from somebody when you haven't been used to do that for a long time. That adjustment all around the world has shown the first four that. weeks are critical. But just just in terms of that. Those 15,731, and I'm working off the CNAG's mm -hmm. figures, I know there's more up-to-date mm -hmm. figures, right? but I did my calculations on this. Th that's the five groups. So there's, there's five different groups, is my understanding. You have people who are unemployed for 12 months, between one year and two years. So there's, there's, there's five categories, yeah, right, yeah. uh, and that would encompass all five of those categories. Yes. Do we have a, a further breakdown? And you don't have to give it to me now. If we have it, you can pass it on to the committee because of, we're up against time. But do, do we have a further breakdown of that 15,731 um, in terms of those five categories? Uh, and also, do we follow through on each of the, the various stages? So, in other words, when we get to the 4,385, do we have a breakdown of those people who have reached one year in continuous employment by each group? At, at, at Annex A, or Annex 12A of the well, control fact, orders it, report. It's figure 12.6. Yeah. Uh, you have the same kind of diagram for each of the five groups. Uh, uh, taking okay, into account yeah, the two yeah. service providers, and yeah. then in the annex we've given it by each of the service providers. Okay. Perfect. So I, I think you, you you do see that same very fast fall off in the first uh, quarter, but actually if you look at those um, those diagrams, they're all on the same scale, and you can see Group Four there, which is long-term unemployed, more than three years. And the, the, the lines are, are low in the graph, yeah. whereas if you look at the long-term unemployed group one, uh, those who have just Slightly reached higher. the 12, it's, it's actually Slightly a higher, higher, much higher commencement rate, um, but again, you do, you do see a falling okay. off. Uh, so obviously, the whole idea of job had is to try and prepare people who are uh, out of work for <coughs> whatever length of time, whether it's group one or group four, um, not, maybe not so much group five, um, with those varying groups, is to try and prepare them to go back into the workforce. So do we, I'm trying to get an, an understanding of, of what job Pat actually does then, because there is a perception out there, whether it's real or not, there's a perception out there, and we've seen evidence that, you know, they help you with a CV, uh, they may help you how to prepare for an interview, but the stuff that you just said there about trying to get back into that work routine, um, those life skills, and trying to teach people them, um, do they do do they do that as well? They do, yeah, um, and they you know they provide workshops and what to expect in work. One of the things we ask them to do, and the feedback and our own inspections and the customer satisfaction research indicates they are doing it, is to stay in contact with the person during the first three months. So to make regular contact with them, to try and help them through, because we know that is the most... The, the, if you can get over the first three months, as you can see, the, the, the tail off flattens off quite considerably. So it's getting to the first three months is actually the critical thing. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, we, we do ask them to provide those services. Our feedback from our own contact with the people involved and our own research is that they do. Um, the, um, the, the incentive in terms of the financial payment is also there to encourage them to do it because obviously they get a, a relatively small payment, all things considered, for getting somebody to three months, but they get a much bigger payment for getting somebody to 12 months. So yeah, the they incentive get 1,165 for getting to 12 yeah. months, and for 13 weeks they get 613 euros. Yeah. So there's, uh, okay, and that, that's the next set of questions I want to go on. I mean, before I come off that, um, you said we don't really have any detailed data of why people, there is such a drop off in before 13 weeks, it's about 40%. Is it possible to get that or is that something you, you should be getting? Well, there's, there's various, we haven't done it, there's, there's research that has been done which indicates the reasons are really associated with what I said earlier. It's the, it's the change in work habits, it's getting used to getting up in the morning. Uh, to, to put it bluntly, it's getting used to taking instruction from somebody where maybe you haven't had to take instruction before. Okay. The so other issue is a confidence issue that people generally, if you've been three years unemployed, you generally go into a job with quite low confidence. Okay. Um, so th they're the factors that play into the, the decline. So if the we course. know the factors, are the companies involved then, 
Are they tailoring their training programs? They do that, yeah. Those? They do. They have, have they updated them? Do yeah. they consult with the department? In they do, yeah. That? No, they, they they work and they work together. Even we have job clubs ourselves that we contract out for our own intro service that does similar work. And they do workshops with people. Um, they do provide counselling to them. They do provide support in employment. But the, the issue is, it, it, this is a very difficult cohort to get in. As I said earlier, while the fall-off is high on the charts, it's still considerably better than if they hadn't been on job path. I accept that. So the, the, the low green line is the reference rate. And bear in mind, the reference rate we set at 62% above the actual. So we already set what we thought was a fairly stretching target, and they're, all, they're exceeding it. So I, I, the, I think the evidence is there. And we'll see from the outcome of the econometric review when we publish it in, in January. I've only seen very preliminary data myself, but, so I don't have that level of detail. But the preliminary data is people are getting jobs, they're staying in them, and they're earning more when they're in them than people who didn't go through job path. Now, there'll be more detail. The OECD are still finalising it. So. Can I just talk about the, the fees? Um, so for a referral, it's... A commencement or a referral is 311 euros, mm -hmm. yeah? That's the average, yeah. It's the, it's the average. Yeah. So there's a higher and a lower figure? Uh, there is. There's a, there are different fees for each of the client groups and for each year. Okay. They don't vary that much. I, I can't give you the fees per provider, but they do not vary that much, really. Um, do the contracts have performance requirements for sustained employment? Yes, the, the, we, if the, the, the controls that are in the contract where there's a minimum performance level, which is that they have to do 30% above the, the counterfactual, um, which is set at a lower level than the reference rate. We set the reference rate as a target and also so that we can do price comparisons between bidders. But they've got to do 30% better. If they do less than 30%, above what was the case beforehand, we can terminate the contract. If they don't hit their own submitted targets, which are different to the reference rate, quite close to the reference rate, yep. we can take 14% off their payment. We haven't had to do that yet. We've never had to do that? No. So they've always hit their targets? They've pretty much hit their targets, yeah. Okay. So we built controls in that if they didn't perform, we, what we call retention payments. Now, we do offer them the opportunity under the contract to earn the retention payments back over a period of time by getting back up to that level, but we can withhold 14%. Okay. The next set of questions is just in relation to, um, it's in relation to social welfare payments. Let me just get the exact one. It's uh, in relation to job sustainment claims which were found to be invalid. It's yeah. uh, figure 1210 on page 148 of the CNAG's report. Yeah. It says that there is about, uh, when we looked, obviously when they put in their, their, their fee, mm -hmm. um, there are some controls in terms of uh, validating the data. Mm -hmm. So it says during the validation process for some 50,000 claims mm -hmm. for the job sustainment mm -hmm. fees submitted in the period 2015, mm -hmm. uh, July 2015 to March 2018, the department found a total of 10,000 claims to be invalid mm -hmm. and it gives a breakdown of why those mm -hmm. claims could be invalid. It also goes on to say that um, after the initial verification, there is an opportunity for the companies to put in for a re-verification. Yeah, uh, okay, kind of I'll finish on this, yeah. sort Um Do we have any figures in terms of how many of how many actually have a, a resubmit for a re-verification? of that 10,000? I don't have them with me, though. We could generate them. We haven't generated them up to this, but we should be able to generate them if okay. that's of interest to you. The, um, a lot of those, the, I mean, we built those controls in yeah. specifically to avoid those concerns with these contractors or the cases of contractors committing fraud in other countries and so on. The controls were specifically built in. We only pay when somebody has a commencement of employment notice and revenue and when uh, the person is signed off. 
So um, we know that they're no longer claiming a payment and we know they're in employment. And if we can't verify that of our systems, which is a good control to have. It is. And just uh, the final questions for the CNAG. Are, are you happy, CNAG, with those controls that are in place in terms you, of... Yes, yes, I am satisfied that they are working. Okay, I'll try and come back after lunch. Back at 2. When, when are you joining the chamber? Yeah, it's probably about half two, so I'll come yeah, back. Yeah, so we'll, 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 so at this stage now we want to thank Deputy and we're going to suspend voting situation in the Chamber and we'll break for lunch, so we'll resume at 2 o'clock. We might have originally said 2.30, so if there's anyone who's scheduled to come in for 2.30, say we'll, be, we'll try and start at 2 o'clock. Okay, so we're now suspended until 2, two o'clock. And we are joined again this afternoon by officials from the Department of Employment, Affairs and Social Protection and um, Ms. Maheen Fitzpatrick from the CNAG's office. And we are also joined from the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government who will assist with any queries in relation to Housing Assistance Programme HAP in, which has taken over from Rental Supplement Scheme. We are joined by Mary Hurley and Marguerite Ryan and we are joined from the Office of the Revenue Commissioner Keith Walsh and Kevin Cashin uh, because there is a chapter there in respect of the collection of PRSI contribution from the self-employed um, which um, the Revenue Commissioners are involved in. So again I have to remind, especially because the new witnesses here, those in the public gallery, um, to turn off all phones and put it on to um, airplane mode. And I want to advise witnesses that by virtue of 1721 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to the committee. If you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, you continue to do so. You're entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are you're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. While we expect witnesses to answer questions put to the Committee clearly and with candour, Witnesses can and should expect to be treated fairly and with respect and consideration at all times in accordance with the witness protocol. Um, so at this stage, the next speaker, we're resuming essentially um, from the morning session, and the next speaker was indicated as Deputy David Cullinan. I have two issues I want to uh, deal with. Uh, you mentioned the PRSI contribution for the self-employed. I'll get to that. But I do have questions in relation to uh, HAP and uh, also rent supplement. So. Who's here from the department? Sorry, did I miss that? Department of Housing. Yeah, just, uh, okay. So, if I'm right, there's four elements to state support for social housing applicants or people in need of social housing in the private rented sector. It's HAP, rental accommodation, the social housing current expenditure programme, which I think is long-term leasing, is it? Is mm -hmm. that what that is? Yes. And then rent supplement, as it's known. HAP, rental accommodation and long-term leasing is under the Department of Housing, is that right? And rent supplement is the Department of Social Protection. Okay, so I'm right on that anyway. So what is the current spend, or what is, was the spend, so we'll work on 2070 maybe is the best, so what was the spend for 2017 under each of the four categories? And how many tenants was there, or families I suppose is the best way to put it, in each of those four categories? If that information is available. Sure. Um, I can uh, give details in relation to uh, the three leasing arrangements that we have in place in the Department of Housing. I suppose uh, just to I suppose, point out at the outset, HAP and RAS are separate leasing schemes to SHEP, which is a long-term leasing arrangement, so we might deal with them separately. So are HAP and RAS seen as short-term? Short no, they're long-term long long -term. arrangements. We have long-term contracts in place okay. for SHEP. Uh, the, the SHEP programme. So in relation to HAP, um, the budget for 2018 is 301 uh, Sorry, million. Sorry, how much? 2017. So I'm talking about the spend. So for 2017, the budget was 152 million exchequer funding. That's what was spent, is it? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, that's half. Yeah. Um, and the number of tenancies that were supported during up to 2017. Um, I actually have the figure for uh, 2018. 17,000 17, additional tenancies um, for, for What was the, the overall n number for 2017? For 2017, for under HAP. Under HAP, we had 31,000 31, support. 31,000 31, household support okay. under HAP. And then RAS? For RAS, um, the expenditure in 2017 was 142 million. Yep. And that supported 20,000. Um, okay. And long term leasing or for SHEP? For uh, SHEP, we spent 84 million. Yep. And we supported um, the numbers, have the number to the end is 14,000 to the end of uh, 2018, okay. 792. Okay, and then rent supplement, have you got those figures? Uh, yeah, Mr. Last year, the expenditure was 230 million. There, thereabouts. This year, it's 180 million is projected, and it's currently providing for about 25,740. Is the last figure I have in terms of the number of tenancies currently supported. So, for 2017, sorry, was that 230? 2017, it was uh, 34,378. Yeah, what was the figure? Sorry, the expenditure. For it was uh, two hundred and thirty million five hundred and sixty-six thousand. Okay. So then, on the rebuilding Ireland, there's targets set for each of those uh, areas as well. So, what is the target for 2021 for each of those four schemes, if you have it? And what's the the, the targeted expenditure? So uh, the new tenancies set up under HAP out to 2021. Um, is 87,000 uh, households will be supported, additional households supported out to 2021 under HAP. Um, What's the projected expenditure? So we have 422 million expenditure projected out to, the, out, to, out to the end of 2018, 2019, and on an annual basis. Yeah, well, I'm looking for, I want to jump those, I want to get to the end of the, when does the Rebuilding Ireland finish? Rebuilding Ireland concludes in 2021. So, 20, so at the end of 2021, there's uh, for every year you have uh, planned expenditure and the numbers of uh, in families uh, or households that will be accommodated. So I have the 2017 figures, the expenditure and the numbers. I'm looking for the corresponding figure for 2021. I know it's a plan, it's an estimate, but what's yeah. the estimate? So uh, I suppose how it's worked at the moment, we work it on an annual basis in the context of the budget process. So the figures I would have relate to no, what but are projected. There obviously is a, 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 I know things well, can change, but, but there is an estimate built into uh, 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 rebuilding Ireland. We haven't agreed any estimate with the Department of Public Expenditure so you don't know because what it's going to cost. the numbers. Well, and give me it's the, very difficult to, to, to do it because. There's a number of factors. There's geography in terms of the actual tenancies and the rent limits. There is the market at the time. Um, there is oh, I understand eligibility. All that, Miss Hurley. Sorry, so no, just can I just stop you for I understand that. You gave me a figure a few minutes ago of four hundred and twenty two million. What was that figure? Four hundred and twenty two million is the funding we have in our vote for next year to support the HAP. Houses. Okay, so we'll deal with next year. So you have uh, figures for next year, but yeah. leave, leave the figures aside for a second to give you the numbers. So you don't have the estimate done for 2021, but you do certainly have targets. So I'm, I'm focused on targets here in terms of sure. where there's going to be increases. Sure. So it's 37,000 for HAP in 2017. What's the target for 2021? So the target for 2021 under HAP is 10,000. Additional? Additional. Yeah, what are the New total? Tenancies. I'm talking about what's the estimated total going to be? So it'll be 47,000. 83,000. 83,000? Yeah. From 37,000 to 83,000? Yes. Okay. And RAS? 20,000 in 2017 and 2021? So for RAS, the new targets are 3,800. But what we do have at is the that a yearly basis now? Just so I'm no, not that's confused. out to the end of 2021. So I'm just looking for the figure. So sure. I have 20,000 for 2017 and 2021. How many households? Sure. 20 I would say though, the figures have to have regard to the exits and to the number of yeah. homes that transition into social yeah. housing homes. So it's a and I'm assuming when all that's done, right? And you've built in those uh, adjustments. I'm simply looking for, you've set out in rebuilding Ireland, you have targets every year, yeah. so it's not really, it's not a trick question. 
In 2021, sure? I'm just wanting to have uh, the figures in terms of how many families or units you expect to be in under those categories. So I have to figure for RAS 83,000. I'm looking the same for or for HAP. I mean, I'm looking the same for RAS LTL and rents up. For RAS, there are 20,000 um, tenancies at present. Over the coming years, we will be adding a further 3,000. However, there will be exits from RAS. So what I can tell you is that in terms of additionality, there will be 3,000 additional RAS tenancies. But it may not be 23,000. So it you may don't not know be 23,000 okay. because what we are seeing with RAS yeah. are exits from RAS. Okay, long-term leasing, what's the figure? In terms of long-term leasing, um, we will be at... There. So in terms of long-term leasing, as you know, under Rebuilding Ireland, a third of the target, um, 10,000 homes will be leased out to 2021. So in terms of long-term leasing, uh, that's the additionality we will have. Is that 24,000 then? Yeah. Okay. And then, sorry, rent so, supplement, Mr. Keown. So I have that, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I can ask maybe Mr. Condon to comment. Yeah. Uh, we'd well, I don't want to comment, I just want the figure. Oh, no, I'll give you the yeah. figure. So we'd, we'd be expecting to reduce our numbers, so John. Yeah. Very good. Rent supplement is a short term income support. Yeah. So the numbers are reducing year on year, and we expect them to reduce further over the period to 2020. Um, Do you have so a projection? That's what I'm asking for 2020. We expect somewhere in the region of between 10 and 11,000 today. 10 and 11,000, okay. That's so, subject to labour market conditions remaining the way they are and the economy remaining the way okay. it is. So there's a lot of factors that can impact on that figure. Okay. You see, what I'm trying to understand is this. Uh, when rent supplement was first established, it was certainly established as a short-term strategy, wasn't it? When the rental accommodation scheme first came on stream, it was actually talked about as a long-term solution. Now, I've listened to the Department and I've listened to the Minister, and not just the Minister, but the Department of Housing as well in recent times talk about RAS and HAP not as long-term solutions, but as more short- to medium-term solutions. So I'm trying to understand, is that the case? Or do you, is, is, am I reading it wrong? Because I've spoke to my colleague, Ono Brin, who would be uh, uh, somebody who would uh, be very active on this issue. And as you know, in terms of the housing committees, his sense of it is that the department now sees HAP and RAS as more short-term short to medium term and not long term. That, that is, that's the language that the department uses. Well, I, am I right in that? No, uh, that wouldn't be correct. I mean, right. HAP, we see the long term needs of, of households being met in HAP. Uh, people are able to work in HAP. Uh, we see households, very few exits. That's all from I needed HAP. to know. So it's, it's, you see it as long term. It is. And yes. yet, some of your, uh, your superiors in committees have been talking about it more as short term to medium term. And I say that because in terms of the rebuilding Ireland, uh, they, they argue that post-2021 there will be a strategy then to house some of those people who are currently in housing uh, assist programmes and RAS into traditionally social housing. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what is the policy and what are the targets that are being set because it's very important for us to measure whether or not we're, you know, strategies are working, there's benchmarks and there's targets. So maybe I'm wrong in, in terms of their interpretation, um, and maybe my colleague is wrong. Um, I don't know, I doubt it very much. But if you're saying it's, from your perspective, it's long term, are you then saying that, just so I'm clear, that the plan up to 2021 is to have almost double the number of people in HAP accommodation from 37,000 to 2017, whatever it is now, probably 40 something, up to 83,000 by the end of 2021, which is double. And that will, I would imagine, double the cost as well. So you could be talking about 400 million just for HAP alone. But that's them sorted from the department's perspective. Their long term housing needs are being met through HAP. Is that what, what you're saying? The long term housing needs are being met through HAP, but I think it's important to note. In terms of HAP tenants, we've already seen 1,700 tenants move from HAP to a social housing home. So while you're in HAP, you're in a secure tenancy, you can work, but you also can remain on a transfer list. So in terms of exits, we have already seen 1,700 over 17 no, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm, that's a separate point to some degree. I, I do understand that. I'm talking about just in simple terms, if the department sees HAP as long term, if that's what it is, that's fine, and I can work out the rest of my questions from that. So you do see it as long term? 
Yes, it I meets a long-term that, housing yeah, needs. It isn't that you're looking at, bear with me, you're not looking at those 83,000 households who are in that, uh, who will be in HAP in 2021. There isn't any plan to move them from HAP into social housing beyond 2021 to any great degree. There will always be people moving out of HAP into social housing because the transfer list will always work. I suppose what you need to take account of is there are 71,000 households on waiting lists. That has reduced from 92 um, in 2016. Of those 71,000 families on housing lists, Rebuilding Ireland has a plan to deliver 50,000 built, acquired and leased homes, and separately 87,000 housing supports through the housing assistant payment. What the government is saying and what officials are saying at committees is that we will see housing support numbers annually drop from next year. The target is 16.6 as opposed to 17,000 okay, this year. Can... But what we will see is supply by way of build. And from 2021, we will see the state deliver build, acquisition and leasing homes to the order of 12,000 on an annual basis. And that and I'm, and I'm, what I'm trying to, and that, if that is the case, and, and that's useful because then it's, you have a, a, a target of 12,000, but how many of those 12,000 units, how many of those 83,000 people who you envisage will be in HAP will be transferred into any of those units? Well, I can say to you 1,700 have already, so if you work that... But do you have a plan? Do you have a target? We don't have a target for that. don't have a target. That's all. Well, that's the, fine. the transfer list is a matter for the local authority, mm. and the transfer. I'm going to get that was my next question. So my next question was: at the moment, you have. I know you gave me the 2017 figure, but currently, how many people are there in HAP accommodation? So there are currently 42, just 42, over 42,000. How many are on transfer lists? We don't know how many are on the transfer list because the transfer list is a matter for the local authority. Um, what we do know is what the movement of the transfer is. But how could the department not know? Surely you get that information from the local authorities. We're asking, asking the representatives of the CEOs to come before the Public Accounts Committee to help us, and so far we haven't been successful in getting that. So you're telling me, how many local authorities so, are there? I, I Sorry, so, one second. How many local authorities are there? It's 31. 31. So you're telling me that the department is not in a position to contact 31 local authorities and find out how many of their HAP tenants are on the transfer list. I'm is it that you haven't done it? Or that there's a problem getting the information from the local no, authorities? What, I, what I'm saying to you is legally, the operation of lists is a matter for the local authority. What I'm also saying to you is in relation to the 71,000... I'm, not, I'm thousand... sorry, Ms Hurley, I'm not asking about uh, how they legally deal with applications. This is data. Okay, well, so uh, if that is, are you telling me then today that local authorities legally cannot give the department the number of HAP uh, tenants that are on the transfer list? I mean, I will find that what flabbergasting. Names, names, so down names just the numbers. numbers. Well, no, what, I, no, what I'm saying. Well, I, but you mentioned legal. I'm asking you, you, are you telling me today that legally the local authorities cannot give you that information? No, I'm not no. saying that. So they can. So why have they not given it, or why have you not sought it? Because. My focus is on the 71,000 people on the housing waiting list who need solutions. So in terms of the transfers and HAP, I see the, tran the, the movement from the transfer list into social housing homes. And how many people form. have been transferred? Which is the, because I'm getting to the Seven, policy here. So, so 1,700. Yes, and how many? But I can tell you that much, much greater number of that, almost all, I think, there's a huge amount of people who are in HAP accommodation who are actually on the transfer list. Most are. Most are. The default no, all of them. And that's my point. So you know that. So you didn't even have to get the figure from local authorities. You could have said that at the start. You know that. That's my point. And only a small number are transferred. So that, that's then we're, going in, we're getting into the uh, space of are we uh, dealing with the need that's out there? The department are very clear to local authorities and a ministerial direction issued in relation to the operation, the equitable operation of the transfer list. So... The lists are a matter locally for the local authority. The desire is, obviously, that as many people move off the transfer list, we will see increased numbers as increased delivery happens over the coming years. For instance, in 2014, there were 400-odd houses built. We know this year 10 times that number will be built, so we will see much more supply. So you'll see much more transfers happening. Okay. So, but the, you, you can take it 
the Did you read the uh, independent report that was commissioned by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform yes. on all of the four schemes? Yes, yes. And uh, I would have taken from that report that it was a clear sense that capital, ex capital investment is much better than current uh, expenditure investment. I would have taken that as one of the take-out points in that report, and yet we seem to be increasing our expenditure. We're going to double it, and yet this deeper report, which is independent, is actually saying, well, actually, no, there's always going to be a need for some level of uh, support for people in private rented sector uh, because of the nature of housing. But the more fundamental question in terms of value for money, which we have to, to look at, is why are we almost have a target to double the investment in HAP, um, and yet we're not using that money to invest in capital investment to build homes that people need and in fact then the state would own those homes because really uh, we're adding to a problem here and I just want to make, make this point as well all of this is having a consequence on the private rented sector so we're funneling almost everybody social housing uh, tenants as well into the private rented sector and what's happened rents have gone up the average rent in Dublin is now 1900 the average rent across the state is 1400 a month and part of that is because of the policy solutions which are put in place. Everybody's been pushed into uh, the private sector. We're not building enough houses. And yet, it seems you haven't learned from it, because your target is to double the spend and to double the amount of people who will be in HAP by 2021. So how is that? Do you think, just gonna, can I ask you, do you think that that will uh, reduce rents across the state, or do you think that it will continue to play its part in increasing rents? I suppose one of the things that we're very conscious of is monitoring the rental market and it's one of the things we do in relation to the, the rent limits for HAP and for, for rent supplement were reviewed in 2016 to ensure that they were fair, equitable and were not driving up rents. And with what we're looking at at the moment in terms of the discretion that's been used, we're seeing that, for instance, in Dublin, the average HAP payment is well below what the average Dublin rental payment is. So we're not seeing that um, effect that you're talking about. But we will obviously continue to monitor it because it's very There's important. absolutely no doubt whatsoever, and I say this to Mr McKeown as well, there is no doubt all of the evidence points to the fact that the state stopped building social and affordable houses. The fact that more and more people who have a social housing need or having their need met through the private rented sector, that that in itself creates fierce competition in the private rented sector, which has played a very significant part in increasing rents in Dublin and elsewhere. There's nobody that could argue that that isn't the case, because it's reality. And, the, and if maybe if I can ask Mr. Is it Keown? Is it a, sorry, I can't see the, the surname. Yeah. yeah, Keown, if you can respond to this as well. Um, have you read the deeper report I'm talking about? Uh, definitely, the housing policy is obviously a matter for a yeah. different department. Our interest in the rent supplement, our interest in rent supplement is providing an income support in the form of rent supplement to people who are on a welfare payment. Mm. Because when people go on the welfare who are in rented accommodation, they may not be able to sustain. I the understand rent. that, but the question so is, did you read the report? I haven't. No, have, it's not. Okay. It's not part of my policy or okay. operational brief. And how many of the um, so you want to? because of the nature of rent supplement is going to be reduced because a lot of them are actually going into HAP anyway, isn't it? So there's a, there's a policy trying to get as many of them as possible either off rent supplement onto HAP or they fall off themselves naturally. Um, that's that's the, the policy. How many rent supplement applicants, or of, of those, sorry, who are in receipt of rent supplement, how many of them are on the transfer list? We wouldn't know. I mean, we pay, we pay people who present to us on a welfare payment with difficulty paying their rent, and we provide them with a support to help yeah. them pay their rent. That's the purpose of rent supplement. That's why it's called a short-term scheme, because hopefully people are in a transitory situation when they're on a welfare payment. Those who turn into a longer term, well, then responsibility for their housing needs moves to another department. Okay. And that's where HAP and social housing or whatever comes into the equation. Okay, I think this was useful for the, the session that we'll have, I think, in the new year with the yeah. department. I think it is, you know, very haphazard. We have four different schemes. I don't think that the left hand sometimes knows what the right hand is doing from my perspective. I think that we should, uh, I'll certainly uh, write to the clerk and uh, request information for the next meeting. We're going to have a further discussion with the department, I think, isn't it, on, uh, on HAP especially? Mm -hmm. On housing, in, including on housing, that. but it's the current expenditure. Yeah, yeah so we'll, we'll come back to some of those issues. If I can move on then to the PRSI. 
contributions by the self-employed, if I can. Uh, just for clarification, note A in page 254 of your report, CNHE says the department does not analyse PRSI receipts by class. Um, can we get that up on the... I mean, just so, again, just so I map for it. It's note A, uh, page 254. Sorry, it says, it says on it that the department uh, does not analyse PRSI receipts by class on note A. That's, that's it there. Yes. So I'm just wondering why, why is that the case? Why does it not analyse it? Sorry, it's, it's, it's something we could do. With just in our statistical report, we produce it. We produce the actual number. What we report on is the actual number of people uh, by uh, by each class. So that's produced in our statistical report. Uh, as the Control and Order General says, the vast majority of PRSI receipts are accounted for by Class S, uh, by Class A, and Class M. Is that the correct? Is, um, I think the, the note says that the department produces statistics on receipts by employee, employer, and self-employed. Um, self-employed PRSI receipts are assumed to be Class S receipts. But I, I, I think a, a difficulty here is that um, as the statistics are gathered by revenue, there are different definitions uh, in use in revenue and in uh, the Department of Social uh, and uh, of employment affairs and social protection so that you have different schedules used and so so the information that's captured in revenue is captured on a revenue basis and um, the uh, statistics captured by the department uh, I, I think some of them uh, that are available are using those definitions and some of them are using their own uh, class uh, definitions so you have different schedules uh, in in revenue and you have different classes uh, they're very close, but they're not the, exactly the same thing. Okay. And what I, what I would like to see is that um, all receipts and all uh, individuals uh, can be classified on both bases. Okay, so uh, something so that, that could you be can done get behind the statistics. I think I said, and we, we're working with revenue on those matters, and we're hopeful, for example, that the more uh, up-to-date information that will be available from the PAY modernisation project will help us there. But we do, just to be clear, produce in our statistical report every year the number of contributors by class in quite some detail. But we do report the income by employee, self-employed. That's how we, we, we report the income. Um, uh, but we could seek to break that income down by class as well, but we'd need to do a bit more work of revenue to do that. Okay. Can we get to recommendation 21 in the C chapter 20 of the CNHG's report? And I just want to get to your response, the accounting officer's response to it. It's 20... 20.1. It's the bogus self employment one or false self employment. 21, so it's, yeah. If I'll just read the, your response, Mr. Keown. It says Following from its awareness campaign on false self employment, which commenced in May 2018, the department is intensifying its activity in relation to employer inspections by its social welfare inspectors and SIU staff and it is anticipated that a significantly larger number of employer inspections with a particular emphasis on insurability for PR, PRSI purposes will be carried out in the latter half of 2018 and 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, so what type of records are kept of those inspections? Um, well, I might ask Patricia Murphy to comment on this, but what we do is the records are obviously they're kept in paper format. These are inspections which take on in sight. They're recorded by our inspectors on a system we call our earnings and... Um, I want to know how, how, they are record, how those inspections are recorded. How, do you, how does the department record? Well, we record them on an electronic system, having incorporated the information from uh, the, the inspectors operating the field. So obviously they conduct their inspections in the field and bring the information and back. Ms Murphy might be able to enlighten me. It, it, well, as the secretary says, I suppose it's there to inspectors will call to an employer and um, they, I mean, information on inspections is collated by the department's divisions in terms of, you know, where people are located. I, I suppose also the results of the inspections are collated to an extent in terms of what was found um, and where we're specifically looking for maybe where 
records aren't being maintained by employers or PRSI isn't being returned by employers or were there issues in relation to PRSI as well by employers? So we would collate that I, activity why generally. Is it, I read reports that there was no proper records kept. So maybe if, we can, if you can um, furnish I think, this. I think I, we don't keep specific records on bogus self-employment. Yes, that's we what I'm will, talking that's, about. I think right. that's, that's bogus, from the... Okay, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. So because bogus we self don't, it's not a category we actually capture, but we will, we will um, in the context of employer inspections, where, where there are difficulties with PRSI, Okay, if we I can just stop you there, Ms Murphy. What I was talking about was mm -hmm. false self-employment okay. or bogus self-employment. So there is inspections that are being carried out, but my understanding is that they're not recorded. Is that right? It's, it's, it's not a particular category that we would record inspections under. Yeah, I know under. that, so they're yeah. not recorded. So what we record yeah. would be the misclassification. But if I can have the question answered, they're not recorded. Am I right in no, saying sorry, they're not recorded? No, yeah, sorry, it's, yeah, it's not quite right. We record a misclassification of social insurance class whether that misclassification was down to a bogus and yeah. to something that was deliberate or whether it was down to a genuine reason why it was misclassified. That's not classified. That's, that's, but we record misclassification. But why, why isn't that classified? Because how do we, we're seeing, and this is an issue that uh, is uh, in the public domain now more and more, bogus <coughs> self-employment. So if it is the case that the work has been done but it just isn't being classified in that way or isn't being recorded properly, then when we put down parliamentary questions or when we try and do our job in terms of trying to understand the level of the problem, if the department is not properly recording it, then that's a difficulty for us. So I'm just trying to understand what's the, the reason for not doing it. And why, if, if it's a problem that he just didn't do it in the past, why not start doing it now? Well, I, I, sorry, as, as I think as, is, as, an, as an issue, um, we are, I suppose, ramping up our approaches in this area. I suppose, as well as the employer inspections, and we are increasing the number of employer inspections, as we said, uh, at the end of this year and for next year. Uh, we also have um, the other um, avenue on this is that individuals coming in querying their insurability of employment, where we will also then initiate an inspection on the basis of that, and they come back into scope section, um, then we will recategorise the PRSI, that category that should have been, pay that should have been uh, paid at the time. So. Um, we are, I suppose, so can the I, issue just, is just to, the term focus, I, can, I suppose, for us no, is really Maybe if I can just make a request then, because if, if, if the accounting officer is saying it is done, maybe you can furnish this committee with a report of the number of inspections which have been carried out, the level of records which are kept, how, if, if they are, if they're classified as bogus self-employment, how, how many, how many were, were carried out and where it was uh, determined that it was the case of bogus self-employment, and then the level of information that was recorded in general terms. Uh, could that be forwarded onto the committee or is it something you don't have? Well, we can certainly do the number I'm of I'm asking Ms Murphy first, sorry, because she was answering. Yeah, um, we, I can, maybe we have inspections. There were 5,400 inspections carried out in 2017. Um, and, and how many of those inspections said, uh, was it determined that there was a case of bogus self-employment? Arising from those inspections, I don't have that precise number. Why not? Um, because, as I said, we would categorise them. It wouldn't always be apparent. There may be no records maintained yeah. by the employer. Um, we may have no I'm not asking what the employer records. Yeah. I'm asking what you From record. If you have uh, people going out to inspect. So I've asked, you said, what was the number? 5,000? 400, 400 inspections. And the department is not able to tell me how many cases of bogus self-employment would have... We don't record bogus self-employment, as exactly. I explained. We and record, it took we about record 50 minutes to get there, but we don't record bogus self-employment, which is an, my point. Why not? But there is an issue which was discussed here, for example, last year in the context of should we call issues where we suspect fraud as fraudulent cases with regard to people claiming benefit, or whether we should de delay the, 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 the labelling of, of fraud until it's found guilty in court. The, the, the definition of whether something is bogus or not is a matter of judgment. So we record strictly what are misclassifications of employment. If it's subsequently found in court that a person was fraudulently presented as being self-employed under wearing, well, then you can label it bogus. Until then, to use the terminology we use here, see, there's, it's a, only suspected there's a bonus, fundamental and we were problem asked with your response. not to use that term. There's a fundamental, so we've got to be consistent. There's a fundamental problem with your, with your response there. Mm -hmm. Classifying somebody as bogus self-employed isn't illegal. So it's never going to be... Oh, it is illegal. No, no, I don't... I, it, it is absolutely it happens, illegal. It happens all the time. It's, people it's, are, it's done very insidiously in many cases. But so. it's illegal. Let us be absolutely clear. 
falsely presenting somebody as being self-employed when they're not is an offence under the Social Welfare Consolidation Act, and it's an offence. And how many cases was there? How many I've, people were brought before the courts? We've taken 22 cases against 22 employers cases. in the last three or four years. There have been none in the past year. What I would say, Deputy, is when we look at bogus self-employment and when we look at trends in self-employment, and I provided the information in my opening statement and some of the supplementary information, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist to the extent that is commonly perceived. All of the data, the ESRI has studied this in a separately produced report. The report on zero hours contracts was similar. When you go looking for evidence of precarious employment, bogus self-employment in Ireland, the levels of it that you can detect are much lower than in other European countries. That doesn't mean that there isn't a problem and that every case is not an issue to be dealt with. But just to make the general point, it's not as prevalent as people think is the first thing. To give you an example, we conducted 2,000 employer inspections um, as part of our response to the media campaign that we ran, both in Dublin and in Galway. In Galway, they concentrated on the um, construction industry. We interviewed over 170 staff. There was only one case that was suspicious, and when we finalised the investigation that case, it was found to be correctly classified as self-employed. In Dublin, when we did over a thousand inspections, there were three cases that we found to be suspicious, all of them, by the way, in the private security sector, which is not something we were expecting to find, that those three cases are being followed up. And if they lead to prosecutions in due course, we'll follow them up. But I'm just saying the evidence isn't, and I've, I've no, you know, I, 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 I have no finish, interest in presenting something that isn't yeah. the case. It's okay. just that what I'll, we learn from our own data and okay. our own experience isn't what is sometimes I'll, I'll presented my, to us. I'll finish my contribution to this because I know Deputy Murphy wants to get in. Uh, there are different views on how prevalent it is, yeah, okay? And you're saying that it isn't prevalent to some people, think whoever the some people are, right? Now, I know it is, it could be, and it's possible, it's exaggerated by some. My point is that we should have a more accurate recording and we should have a more accurate we should have more accurate data on how prevalent or not it is and the second point i'll make is because of the nature of it it's very difficult to determine when there's actually a case of bogus self-employment we had rte for example before us and we had staff members who were saying i feel i'm a victim of bogus self-employment the organization and not in this case but an employer will say no i see it differently so it's a very very difficult area um, and uh, that's what the, my point, uh, the point I was making earlier. So I think if we're not capturing the data right, and if things are not being properly recorded, then we can't be as definitive as you are there in saying that it isn't as prevalent. You may be right, but I need the data to prove to me it is right, and I don't have it. And I, I absolutely agree with nearly everything you said, <laughs> Deputy. I, I think. It is very difficult, and it's something that we find frustrating in the department. It is very difficult for someone who is being paid to kind of stand up and say, the person who's paying me is not paying me the way I'd like to be paid, or is paying me on, the, on a contract for service instead of a contract of service. We appreciate that is very difficult. That's why we did the media campaign. We encouraged people to contact the department, which is anonymous, is secure. We got 50 calls. We spent more on that media campaign than we did, for example, on the famous welfare cheats campaign last year. We spent more on the please tell us about if you're in a situation of you think you're in a situation of false self-employment. 50. Okay. You so, might just give you so, might just give us a note on on uh, Miss so, Murphy, so I can give us a note that I asked for earlier, and maybe we'll I'll be able to. Have can a I just say to the point on the data is I would genuinely refer you to the very good study the ESRI did. Again, they have clean hands in this. I believe we've clean hands. We're not trying to present something. It, it, that our, we're still concerned about it. Don't get me wrong, I'm just saying it's not as prevalent. We will be increasing employer inspections. We will be focusing on the construction sector. And perhaps, based on what we've got from the Dublin experience, the private security sector is an area to look at. There are some other sectors, and you've mentioned RTE. You know, we'll have a look at that in due course. There's an investigation going on there at the moment. Yeah. That's, that's Will completely. you clarify precisely what we're looking for there, just so we have an exact mm. what you said? I think Ms Murphy had it already It was basically the number, the number of inspections that are carried out was 5,100, I think, and then how it's classified or how, the, how, the, how they were recorded. And bogus self-employment isn't... It's not recorded in those terms, but the reasons why. No, um, that no just to clarify from our side here. Yeah. OK. Moving on to Deputy Murphy. Yeah. Deputy yeah, Murphy. just a few questions. Um, and just to pick up on that last point... Um, when you do inspections, 
uh, are they always notified inspections? No, no, no. So, uh, a lot of inspections are um, we turn up on site unnotified. We've, with the Revenue Commissioners and Joint Investigation Unit, we will stop people in roadblocks. So they're not notified right, okay. at all. And do you know what the percentage is in terms of, and I suppose they're different, as you say, if it's a road check um, with revenue, it's a different thing entirely to, say, going to a business premises. I don't know. The majority, and I'll, I'll defer to Patricia and John, perhaps, that the majority of our inspections, certainly the vast majority, are unnotified. I, I'm not aware that we do any that are... Yeah, employer inspections. I'm not aware that we would do any on a notified basis. Right, OK. Um, uh, and, uh, like, how many would be scheduled to be completed, like, this year, for example? D this year, we're not going to do as many as we did last year, um, which is why we said in the response that, you know, the intention is to considerably ramp it up yeah. uh, in the latter part of this year and into next year. This year, we would probably do in the order 3,000, which is 2,000 less than last year. Uh, but we will be significantly increasing that next year. And why would that have happened this year? It's down to the availability of our inspector resources and the focusing of them. Um, we need to focus more people on employer inspections, Deputy. We didn't do enough of it this year, I'd absolutely say that. Um, and that is something that we need to get a, a focus back on, is employer inspections. Right. Can I just ask, um, like, if people are miscalculated or, or mis miscategorised uh, in terms of... Um, Self-employment. We saw a lot of it with mm. the construction sector mm. going back some years, and in fact, it then you saw in a, in a different mm. context when the crash happened, and people then didn't have, uh, didn't qualify for payments and things like that, where uh, where they presumed that they would continue mm. to be self-employed. Um, the, the 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 point when someone is uh, when someone is ca categorised like that then they're categorised under a Class S stamp, That's if right. that would be the case. And if, you're, if you sign on for credits then, is that the qualifying criteria is the previous contribution that you made? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay, um, so, so there would be entitlements later on, but those entitlements will be reduced. Entitlement. They'd be reduced. That, uh, we have, <coughs> the, the, the current government has extended the benefits available to people with self-employed to include treatment benefit and invalidity pension and so on. Uh, the main benefits that are they're not I, that I can't access are illness benefit and job seeker benefit, and the government just announced that we're going to in, introduce a job seeker benefit for self-employed people. So, the percentage of entitlement that self-employed people won't be able to access will be quite small. Yeah, but, the, but can, can I just ask you, um, you know, following on that experience, which, which was quite a, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure you had a sizable number of people that fell into that category, mm -hmm. um, and then people would have applied for. Um, things that would would have required it would be maybe means found against them, and there would be uh, allowances as opposed to benefits mm -hmm. paid. I mean, was there any analysis done at that point in relation to because that was there was a big fallout mm -hmm. at that point? Was there any analysis done at that point about um, the cost of not fully fully capturing people in a, a system where? Uh, you know, where there has to be a, a floor below which they don't fall? Yeah, th there was a review group, which is uh, the Tax and Social Welfare Review Group, chaired by Ethan Mangan, who had a look. I, I can't recall the details, Deputy, mm -hmm. but I recall at the time there was a review done. Um, and okay. they did, yeah, I think the other thing to be aware that uh, around 85% of people who presented as self-employed who didn't qualify, actually more than 85 is closer to 90%, of people who didn't qualify for job seeker benefit did ultimately qualify for job seeker allowance, the means tested scheme. Yeah. So a very high proportion of people. And I think that reflects a lot of people who are you know, self employed or tradespeople, craftspeople and so on, they don't necessarily have the huge reservoir of personal wealth mm -hmm. that would disqualify mm -hmm. them from oh, the yeah, means yeah. test. Yeah. Uh, but essentially if it's a system that is that you're you're funding on a uh, kind of on a, a an annual basis, capturing something like that. I mean, I don't think any of us would have foresaw the extent of the crisis that happened. But uh, in in a in a system where you're you're self-funding, I mean, it's it, the contributions that have been made from that category then won't cover won't cover the, the cost because they've got to be uh, paid from. A, they've got to be paid on the basis that they're allowances as opposed to benefits. That, that, that's right. But yeah. as I said, it, if it happens again, I suppose the only comfort is that self-employed now have access to a wider range than they did at the time of the crash. Yeah. And I think that's probably what informed the government policy response mm. 
to exactly the problem that you described. Okay. Just, I just have just one other question. Um, and you, obviously, you've looked in the context of the social insurance fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, you looked at the potential impact of Brexit mm. um, and it, it, uh, a crash out uh, is pretty catastrophic for us and, and that's, not, uh, that's not a huge surprise. Um, but have you looked at other elements in relation to Brexit, like for example the reciprocal arrangements that are there at the moment in relation to uh, you know, uh, pensions in particular um, and are there assurances in relation to that aspect? Yeah, I think we have been working quite closely with our colleagues in the United Kingdom. The common travel area which preceded our joint entry into the European uh, Union still provides the basis for the retention of the existing arrangements and we would hope to finalise a formal agreement on that very, very shortly. Okay, right. Uh, it's under the common travel area. We have a bilateral agreement with the European or with the UK which predates our entry into the European okay. Union. Okay, that's okay, thanks. Okay, um, thanks Deputy. I've put a few questions um, myself, um, covering a variety of issues that maybe other members didn't pick up on so far. And <clears throat> just the domiciliary care allowance application process, you set out your case. It's not the old type of reform where you tick the boxes after the domiciliary care warriors and everyone got on to improve it, to make it more user-friendly or whatever. Am I, did I hear you're moving to that method for the carer's allowance application? Form? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so where is that? And uh, I take it'll be for new applications. And my question is, you'll have to give some explanation to people how to work the new form, because people who've been used to ticking the box, um, now we're going to find they're really going to have to state the case um, and do an essay, we call it, and they're going to need help. Personally, I think it's a good system, and I've helped people with domiciliary care many a time, documented what to do from the minute the person wakes up right through, and the same with elderly people, where you're living and setting out the circumstances. I'd imagine the assessment process is going to take more time to read all the volume of information you get in, in relation to the person being cared for, where they live, and how many hours they're doing. It's going to be a more voluminous process. Um, for somebody to make an assessment on. So just where is that at and why have you come to that and are you, sure. is it a good thing? Well, I think it's a good thing, Fine. Chair, for, for the reasons you say. I think um, just very briefly on the on the domiciliary care, which you're very familiar with, that was done very much in cooperation with the with the stakeholders, with the parents, with the people involved. And I think, as you're probably aware, the rate of uh, approval at first instance, yeah. because we get far far more information now, is much higher. So there's fewer appeals. So it's all done far more quickly. And as uh, John said earlier, our response rates there, our processing times are uh, are quite good for, for all and that we have for to do. Care now, that's around uh, ten, eight, eight, eight to ten weeks. Eight like weeks. Back a few years ago. Just oh, it was way up. Just yeah. Just no, no, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's it's a combination of, yeah. of, of uh, getting far, far better in information. Families keep diaries uh, and, yeah. and all of that. So you're, 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 you'd be aware of that from, from your own work. Uh, so it's to use that model in the carers uh, area and in due course I think in the in the DA area as well. The medical schemes are our are, are most difficult and they take the longest for the reasons we, we spoke about earlier. But it is we have done use the same model on the carers. There's been huge discussion with the advocacy groups, uh, with people who are in receipt uh, of the entitlements themselves, just to learn from all of that. We need to uh, just have some discussions as well with um, the IMO, who uh, would uh, represent the, um, the the GPs. So we have uh, we have a new form. And yes, uh, it's far, far more detailed, but I think uh, we would be hopeful, as has happened to us on DCA, that the approval at first instance will be higher and uh, we will have all the medical information um, that we need 
uh, in the, uh, at the first point, both medical and non-medical. Yeah. The whole, the whole. So thing. when's it kicking in, or when does it start? We would. The, we have the new form. We and we are uh, using it. We some GPs are using it. We just need to to talk to uh, the IMO uh, a little bit further to get uh, full usage of it. And have they to be paid for their part of the form? It's part uh, chairman of um, overall discussions that were almost so finalised. Is it a few months ago? Uh, no, I, I would say a lot sooner than that with, with, with this, hopefully. But it will be next year. Right. And will there be a separate section in the form for the GP to fill in that the applicants won't see? Or, you know, the question I'm getting mm -hmm. at, sometimes the applicants don't know what the GP had put down and under the current system they can get turned down and you see the form signed by the GP and the minute you see it you know it couldn't possibly pass but you wrote a strong yeah, no, I think, I, I, think in the, I think in the future it will be as much information as we should be getting uh, at, it, from everybody including the person themselves like in the care situation as John was saying earlier um, there's both the person providing the care yeah. and the person that needs the care yeah. and we need details of, of both and, and the doctors. There's really the three doctors. people's Absolutely. information required. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think it's to make it as, I suppose, as easy as possible um, for our medical people, our medical assessors, to see what actually is involved in this situation. OK, and just explain this to me, because what I notice about some of the application forms and across the board, whether it's disability or anything, is the medical forms that, the medical section and all your forms at the moment, there might be 12 different things to take, whether it's mild, moderate, severe, or profound. I would guess 11 of the 12 relate to physical difficulty, to physical difficulties, can they walk, can they climb the stairs, can they, whatever. But a lot of people have mental illness, yeah. and they feel the form is utterly weighted in favour of um, physical, physical. Ill illnesses. Yeah. And there's very little space for people who have severe depression or maybe suicidal. I, I yep. just give my observation. I yep. think the form doesn't adequately capture um, the reality of a lot of applicants. Yep. You know, they might be able to sure. run up and down the stairs, but, yep. you know, no. and, and when the doctor ticks that, and then there's just one section ticked on medical health or whatever, the form seems very light in that department. The department needs no, I, I think we're, we're very conscious of that, uh, Chair, and the, the new form would pay a lot more attention to both medical health and physical health. It's something our Chief Medical Officer, Dr Singh, is uh, very, very conscious of. So yeah, but not just talking about carers allowance, I'm talking about... Oh, across the, the OAT, OAT, OAT. Oh, no, absolutely. All, all absolutely. The, all yep. the applications, because yep. it's either... Yep. No, no, absolutely. We, it, regularly it comes back to that yep. issue, um, yep. and it's hard. There's nowhere in the current forms to really fully yep. adequately explain no, no, that. Absolutely. Now, different question. I'm post... The, the payments you make, yeah. what percentage goes through the banks versus what percentage goes it's through a, the At the moment, it's about 70 30, I think. It's Which heading towards 70 30. It was 60 40. It's on, he, heading towards 70 30. Deirdre might be able to confirm now in a moment. But, um, Seven, yes, 70 the banks, you mean? Yeah. Who's the 70 and who's the 30? Yeah, sorry. At the end of September, 40% um, of payments were made by UNPUST. And 60, sorry, I, it's not heading as fast as I thought. 40% yeah. of payments were made by. Via on post and 60% by the bank. Right, and have you done, let's say, in terms of the applications that have come in this year or last year, the, the newer yeah. applications, I presume the percentage is different than the historic ones. Uh, well, well the figures for the 2017. Yeah, the figures for 2017 were 42 to the post office and 57 um, uh, via the bank, and then there's a small percentage by cheque. Right, okay, and and what's the payment arrangement you have with the banks and the post office for processing these payments? We How have does that a, work? We have a contract, uh, a payment services contract uh, with OnPost, uh, which is, expires at the end of 2019, so we'll have to go to tender. And we have a rate of payment for each payment that they make. And it's, it's tiered, so if it's more than X amount, the, the payment rate drops and so on. So we have a payment arrangement with OnPost, and it's a, it's a, a fixed fee per transaction. With the bank, it's the standard EFT fee. Right. So uh, the bank so charges how, the standard so EFT fee. So in terms of the, what you pay the banks versus what you pay on post? It, the, the banks would be significantly cheaper. Um, if everything went through the banks, we would probably bring our payments down by over 40 million a year, our costs. So you're saying the 40% 
Let's try and work this out, and the controller might help me on this, because mm. I'm just thinking out loud. So the fact that 40% are costing 40 million more. 40% are costing most of the money. Right, and we understand it's historic. It is, and I think, it, it, to be honest, uh, Chair, our, our view on this... Are you able to give us some... If, I, if I was purely based on finance and accounting, you'd be Keep saying everybody should be EFT tomorrow, no question. Our customers value the ability to go to a post office. They obviously do. That's where they choose to go. Uh, and we do want to have a payment facility where people can collect their payment. Um, so that's a facility that we'd be proposing to keep. When we go to tender, we'll be asking for that facility. If you are going to have an in-person payment, it is obviously going to cost more money. Yes. That's, so it, if, once you everything. decide to provide that service, so you have credit, to accept the cost. Do you pay it through the credit union? We do. People can mandate their payment into their credit union account. So where yes. is the credit union? That in uh, the the EFT is it's yeah. all captured under the EFT heading. I had to send us a more specific note to seem to probably have information. You know, just flesh out mm. the information. In yeah, the we case. can send you a note on that. Yeah. But, uh, and how, so the arrangement with on post finishes. Every two years we seem to be in this space, the contract... Is it's been a again. long contract with Unpost. We've been, it's over six years. We've been renewing it, as, um, but month. we've run out of renewal rope in terms of the procurement rules, so we now have the tender. Yeah, well, design it appropriately to get the right result. Um, the we'll design it to get the best result, as we would. OK. Um, um, and, and tell me, the arrangement with the banks... What kind of a contract? So both in the EFT payments, as you mentioned. So both in the banks just announced next month we're putting up the EFT payment. Um, is there anything you can do about it? Have you a price? How long does that price hold with the banks? Um, the, well, the, at the moment, there's a, our banking arrangements and LVA uh, are moving to Danske Bank. The government ran a procurement competition um, for uh, government banking services through the, uh, it was a central office of government procurement. So um, I think our, our charges are probably safe enough for the time being. We'll see if they increase their charges, whether we'd have to pay more in the future, but I think we're reasonably safe for the time being, Chair. Okay, you've said something I hadn't heard before. The, the, the role of Danske Bank taking over just your payments or all government No, they're, 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 take, they're now going to be the government banking provider. Since when? Um, it was a Sorry, contract which was yeah. placed to earlier this year. Earlier this year. Okay, um, okay, we're here a while. It's the first I've heard of this, and I think people are going to be quite interested. Mm -hmm. So this, the handle the payments method for all government payments it could be the Department of Agriculture. It could be. It's not salaries. I think does it cover salaries for public will, I think the shares? government the government will be paying all of its money out via Dan now obviously if the customer is Bank of Ireland, Danske Bank no, will pay the to money the to Bank of Ireland, but Dan Danske Bank will be handing all of it. So you'll all, all the be payments. banking with Danske Bank. Yeah, it will take some time for us to make the move. There's a migration plan, so because we're the biggest payer we'll probably be at the end of the migration, but and what? Two years, year or two to About get a to year, I'd say about a year from now. About a year from now. So so um had you a role in that? No. We were, no, we were involved in It was a big tendering process. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were. We were um, Who was on the body? It was the Department of, uh, Department of Finance uh, tendered. We were on the group that specified the tender. Um, and uh, it, it's obviously designed to try to get the lowest cost banking solution for the government. Wow. So the Department of Finance are responsible so, for it. So, look, we're going to write to the Department of Finance for a full briefing information note on this. Um, like it's, people will find it unfortunate that one of the domestic banks, maybe they didn't want it for all I know. I, do you know where the many tenders in? I know you were... I, I'm, sorry, I don't know department. that information. I'm, I'm sure they all tender, but it is ultimately, I mean, like any department, the Department of Finance's job is to try to get the job done at the best value for the state. And but you um, said it's a good job you don't operate that way, or did I'll be going through the bank to be no post office payment. So well, it, it, the, the, the humanity the we works have, its way down to you. Well, we have to take account the customer requirements, and that was part of certainly we fed into the bank. So we're comfortable that Danske Bank will be able to meet our requirements in terms of our customers. So okay, I take it, controller, you're fully available. In issue, we'll, we'll, we will be, will be looking be at it. it. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but I, main, I think in the meantime, certainly um, we, asking we'll the take department it up for a briefing. Yeah, so we're uh, going to write on straight away now to yeah. the Department of Finance for a full briefing and information in relation to the whole process to tender, because it will be news to the people, the public, um, that Danske Bank will be taking over payments on behalf of all government. And is it, 
So, uh, th there's a severe centralisation um, uh, of all the payments. Like the, the risk if something goes wrong in cyber security. Yeah, yeah, and we're dealing with that next week. Cyber exactly. security. Uh, nail the uh, presumption that the reason why some of the payments are being made through the banks is for the benefit of the banks, uh, you know, uh, by the Department of Finance. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to ask you some questions on the different aspects of the chapters and the vote between us now. I'll move along. Um, in relation to the vote, um, on, on the vote, on page 24 of the vote, I ju just one thing there, I see you had higher expenditure on direct provision allowance. Is that supplementary welfare payments through the Community Welfare Office? No. Um, direct provision allowance. I, I presume that's to the asylum centres, isn't it? That's it. We, we paid the direct provision payment to people in the asylum centres. Um, so that, that's a payment. There was an increase. I can't remember the exact amount. There was an increase last year in the amount paid, and there'll be increase again next year. Okay. My question is this: to say um, that the final outturn um, was higher, 4.8 million was higher than the original estimate, estimate by 1.1 million. Higher average recipient numbers: 2620. Like I've just, during the course of the meeting, checked to figure out, and at the end of last year there was 5,096 people, and that's the order of the number of people in direct provision. Now, I know that includes 801 families, so are they individuals, or could a parent be claiming for a spouse? You know, they, 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 they'd be, in effect, household payments, in effect. So you send us a note on, because yeah, yeah. I think that should cover about 5,000 people. Yeah. And I know you say the figure went up because... Um, they're included in the higher rate of the €36 Euro per week plus the Christmas bonus. It, you know, that's fine, but it's just I didn't know it was you paid that directly. I'm just making that point. Okay. Um, next thing then I just want to deal with um, on page 25, the next page, just rural employment scheme, the average payment is 262 Two, so you have it there, and the average payment is... 241 per week, mm -hmm. but community services program, you don't give the comparative figures. What would be the comparative figures? The community services program, and I, I might defer and to you one don't of my colleagues, have we, don't, we pay the, we pay the service the e provider. No, community services is a different program which is now run by the Department of Rural and Community Affairs. We pay a provider to provide services rather than pay individuals. I think that's correct, John. Yeah. So, so what does that heading there mean, A16, community service program? What's that about then? Tell me. It's the old social economy program. Yeah. The old social economy program. Social economy program. Okay. Yeah. I just when I saw it there, I thought it was community it's employment. Now so it's. Mr. Rings Sorry, can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying it's the old social economy program. Got the answer to that. Okay. That's fine. Now I just want to then ask about page seven on the CNAG's report. Um, you have a, the CNAG has put a, a paragraph into his report. Regularity of expenditure, um, he says, on the vote, chair. Yeah, on the vote yeah. at your own note, chapter 11 of my report on the accounts on Which the public services for 2017 yeah. Yeah. relates to welfare payments in excess of entitlement included in two, the 2017 account for vote 37. I consider the estimate level of irregular payments to be material. Do you have that in it every year? Yes, uh, I, well, we have for the last uh, seven or eight years. Yeah. So yeah, and it, it's based uh, effectively on the uh, evidence from the, uh, the controlled surveys. I, I, I think I'm not coming down on a specific amount uh, that uh, would be irregular, yeah. but the fact is that the percentages that are coming through, even on a net basis, seem to indicate that it's material. Okay, that's fine. Now, I know we have, um, in relation to, I just want to chapter 13, um, I just had one question there. Yeah, it's about the actual aerial review of the social insurance fund. And who, who, who carried that out? Can you tell us again? Yeah, yeah, and who came up with the, like, I just say it's everything in, I have to take everything in that chapter with a suitable grain of salt. Yeah. Because 
you made assumptions in this report about GDP growth until the next 50 mm -hmm. years. You made assumptions about the inflation rate for the next 750 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. You made assumptions about life expectancy for the next 750 years. You made assumptions in relation to employment growth in the economy for the next 50 years. You made assumptions in relation to um, the what do we call it? Um, the worker, the, the, the projected decrease of mm -hmm. workers mm -hmm. for every individual over the period and the unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's a lovely chapter, but you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Am I being too severe? Based on the assumptions, the figures work out. But you could have, no, we have the assumptions are so far into the future. Yeah. I, I suppose, Chair. I just make the point. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, I agree. A if you, severe if you, dose of caution. If you do a forecast for 70 years, which is what it is, it's a 70 year forecast. The one thing you know for certain is it's wrong. Okay. okay. Um, but the question is it's still a useful exercise to do in terms of giving a little bit of advance warning of what might be coming down the road. We do it every five years, it's a statutory obligation. It's also a European obligation now to produce an actuarial review. So the, the assumptions they use would be the general assumptions. Where did that you get the assumptions? It probably is it European or who's, who came up with those? The, well, the KPMG there was the actuarial arm of KPMG did it. So these are the type of assumptions that they would use in valuing pension schemes generally. So right, and the Department of Finance, we had a, a working team which worked with KPMG, where the Department of Finance were involved, the Central Statistics Office were involved, we were involved, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. So the government actuary works in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. So there was a group of people that agreed the assumptions, but the assumptions would be very similar to those that would be used by any firm of actuaries okay. in valuing any long-term investment scheme. Okay. Yes. I mean, one of the things that uh, certainly gives me um, uh, cause for uh, to, to think about this is real earnings growth forecasts are actually very, very significant. And um, to me, uh, looking forward to uh, you know, real, real earnings growth, that's after inflation of 2% in 2016, 1.4% in 2017, and, and uh, 1 to 1 1.1 in the period 18 to 21, and, and so it, it goes on. Real earnings growth into the future for, uh, for 40 yeah. years, uh, you know, it, it seems very difficult to believe, and yeah. that's the, one of the key drivers of yeah. the... And what um, I'm coming at is, this was kind of designed, as you said, to look at a, a scenario that showed a, a bigger problem than if you'd use a more... Like, there's negative income, income growth for probably a decade in our... I, I, I think the, the, the point is that anybody using this, uh, and, and if you like, it's, it's a useful mechanism, but the first thing you have to do is you have to question on what basis can it be maintained yeah. that these assumptions are likely to, uh, to, to be the outcome. And that's really all I'm asking. You know? and, and so uh, it's better to have this model than, than to have no model at okay. all. I accept that. You know? Okay. In relation... Yeah. Yeah. There's important two points on that. One, the earnings growth, the real earnings growth figure were taken off the GDP growth figures. So yeah. there is a relationship, so you're assuming that the economy is growing at a certain, that some of that will translate into real earnings growth, which I think is reasonable. The second thing they did is it that they did... It depends on the distribution of the wealth. They, it does, <laughs> it, uh, but the other thing they did, to be fair, is they do a sensitivity analysis. So yeah. they do a low earnings growth and a high yeah. earnings growth and the, the base case earnings growth. So I'd, I'd agree with the controller and auditor general. A, a lot of these assumptions, you do have to look at them, and even if you look at the projected deficit for 2018, or was it the 2018 we'd be going, 2019 we'd be heading back into deficit? Well, we're not no. with this surplus is growing. So even within the three years, it's gone a little bit askew. Uh, we hope it goes more askew in the same direction. But anyway, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I mean, well, in, inevitably, the the kind of figures that it is uh, forecasting, they cannot work out that way. No. It just will not be sustainable. So that is not going to be what will happen yeah. in 2030 yeah. or 2045. Chair. Yeah. It wouldn't be sustainable for the social insurance fund, but arguably it is potentially sustainable for the state. The Irish, pen, the Irish pension share expenditure on public pensions as GNI star were about 4%. A lot of other countries that are already ahead of us, yeah. their GDP equivalent spend is about 8%. That's effectively what they're saying is going to happen in Ireland. It's just a question of whether that 8% spend is funded through the social insurance fund or whether it comes out of general taxation. That's really the, the question. Yeah. Okay. And the ageing is 
implicit they're making an assumption about birth rates and immigration. Yeah, yeah. It's implicit they're not. Okay, Chapter 14, this, this issue of the overpayments of age-related job seekers' allowance, where we know um, you have to be 26 years of age to get the full rate, and there's a reduced rate if you're 25, and a more reduced rate again if you're between 18 and 24. And you looked at the, the 4,700 people who were on the rate, and you found um, CNAG said there's 486 on the full payment that shouldn't have been on the full payment. Just explain to me, how did those errors arise? Surely if somebody, you had their date of birth when they arrived to make a claim and you had their PPS card. Just explain, I don't get how the mistakes were made. I'll, I'll, ask, putting them on their own I'll ask Ant and maybe comment on that. I suppose uh, the first thing to say, uh, Chair, is that these decisions are they're, they're difficult enough for, for staff. The scheme is complicated, and these reduced rates were brought in under, yeah. over, under, yeah. over a number of years. So in, there are exceptions to the rules. It's not that everybody under a certain that, age, yeah. and I think it's the working of the exceptions. And in the first, I suppose, set of cases we got from the, from the CNAG, we worked through them, and between us decided what the, what the final error uh, cases were. And if I tell you that it is complex because even within our various intro offices, we had a bit of a debate about some of these cases and whether they should or they shouldn't uh, get the benefit of the exemption, i.e. be paid on yeah, the, the higher rate. rate. So it's not as straightforward as, as, you, would, as, oh, you, as you would think. Okay, the question, yeah. the, I suppose for the, for the future, what yeah. we've said is that we are trying to, well, firstly, we've put in better training. Yeah. Secondly, we have said in each of our intro offices that only two deciding officers would work in this, on, on these cases. Right, or so everybody. That, correct. Yeah. So that should uh, yeah, that, that should improve the, improve the situation. So uh, oh, they're, they're very much as 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 the okay. controller so said. Okay. So the obvious error. question is, in relation to the applications that will come in this year for the yeah. underage, do you think you're on top of it now? In yeah. I mean, there, there will there will always there will be always some. be something. But yeah. yes, I, 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 I yeah. would hope so. Yes. And you have less people making the decisions, so they're more yes. specific in relation to yeah. the production. Okay. So. I just didn't get why it happened from reading the chapter, and I just wanted to ask that, right? Um, that was, then I'm on chapter 20 to PRSI. Um, <clears throat> I think I've asked this question here before. Um, generally, you stop playing PRSI at your 66. Six. Which birthday? 66, isn't it? 66, yeah. birthday. Okay. And the question I have to ask is in relation to the self employed people, that's what this chapter is about. Um, where do the self-employed people come into that? Because if they do an annual return for their return of income for the calendar year, during which they turn 66, their income covers their full year, the payment into the tax office is for the full two weeks, and I understand that. Um, I understand that there's a mechanism. I know you can add the number of days up to their 66th birthday to increase their number of contributions, but it won't be taken into account in working out their annual average. And so my question is, I thought the legislation says that if you're self-employed, there is zero or 52 weeks PRSI. Do you understand the question I'm asking? I think you both, you must know the question. People who be self-employed people during the course of the year. It's a one-year contribution in effect. Yeah, so do they get the benefit of 52 contributions in the year of the 66th birthday, a self-employed person, if they're making just a single payment? This is my question. I'll need to check. I, 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 I'm just looking around at them all. I, I, there is definitely the ability for them to pay yeah. for their full up to the time they're 66, uh, because they can pay us directly rather than via the revenue. Whether they can accumulate a contribution, 52 contributions for half a year, I, I'd need to check. I the don't think they can. I don't think they can, but well, I just want to confirm that. Well, common sense might say it should stop, but yeah. I just don't know does the legislation no, reflect that. You've raised that before, I have. Uh, Chairman, and I think... Yeah, I think you know I, the query I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, there's a, perhaps there's, we can come back to you. Yeah. Just oh, please, I so don't expect to the answer you. Yeah. Do a bit of research and send, yeah. your, send yeah. us a written note on it. And I, Now, um, next item then. Talk to us now. The big issue, that's one of the big issues in social protection in the last 12 months has been those mainly women who had left the workforce for family duties and they had the reduced annual contribution versus those. Um, where there's thousands, I'm going to ask you to give us the full rundown 
letters were going out to people. Um, give us where you are in that. When do the people get their increases? And we're going to ask for a detailed breakdown. You've, maybe you've already provided in PQs. I haven't been watching no, I, it. Yeah. As how many people will get an increase? Will anybody get? A, is there anyone going to get a shock and get a decrease? And I think more women, understandably, might qualify than men. And so, have you? You must have. You must be up to speed. Oh yeah. The, the, um, all of the letters have issued to people explaining what the process is. There's 70,000 in Ireland and 7,000 outside of Ireland. I think that was the number. 77,000 in total. They've all issued. We have taken on 74 staff on a temporary basis and we'll be taking on more in the new year and in January we'll be starting to do the exercise on recalibrating or recalculating everybody's pension entitlement and we'll write to them at that time. Um, nobody will get a reduction. Okay. Nobody will get a reduction. So we'll be writing to people telling them we've done a calculation, this is what it works out for you, you've got an increase or you're being kept the same people will be able to ask for a review of that. It's a deciding officer decision, so if they think that we've done the calculation wrong, they'll be able to request that. We would hope to start making the first payments of the new pension in quarter one, um, fairly early in quarter one, but it'll probably take us three to five months to get through all 70-odd thousand in terms of get, telling them what their calculation is, getting them to come on to the new system and so on. Um, so that's where we are currently with it. We won't know the numbers until we do the reviews. Okay. But you're, not at, you're not at that point yet? We're not at that point yet. Okay. So it looks as if you're taking over 70,000 cases and you said you're taking on 70 or 80 temporary staff. That's an average of 1,000 cases yeah. per staff member, yeah. is that? Yeah, it's more than, I can't remember the exact number. I think we're taking on about another 30 staff next year, so it'll be close to 100. So how many months do you think it'll take to work through? We're, we would hope to get most of the reviews done in the first quarter, but it might slip into the second quarter. Fine. And then people, when they get, is it backdated then to the 1st of January? Backdated to uh, March of last year. Oh, Mar I forgot that. It's backdated. So people... Or March of this year, sorry. Isn't it March 18. March yeah, 18, yeah. So some people, if they get the extra 30 euro by 50 weeks... They They'll might get a nice surprise. They might have 1,500 euro coming to yeah, them. Yeah. Fall park for those who yeah, get the... Yeah. Yeah, so you've no sense of how it's going to work out. Until, until we do the reviews. Yeah, OK, because that's, that's been a burning issue with a lot of people. Um, this is one now for yourselves in, um, in housing. And if you don't have the answer, we'll ask you to send it on. Uh, you mentioned, we've spoken about HAP. Um, goes without saying, there's a big issue in Joe Duffy all week. Um, people um, who... Landlords were ringing in saying they took people in on the HAP, there's no problem doing that, and then they get a letter from whether it's the local authority or the central processing place, I think they're in Limerick on behalf of the local authorities, saying uh, your tenant didn't pay their contribution in respect to their portion of the rent, their 14 or 15 per cent, so we're stopping your payment. So talk to us, how many cases would landlords have had their HAP payments suspended during the course of the year to date? And, the re and a breakdown of the reasons why, especially where it is through no fault of their own, it is maybe because a tenant hasn't paid the tenant's portion of it. I think you've probably heard that controversy raging all week. So can you talk to us on this one? Sure. I suppose um, just in terms of the number of landlords we have in HAP at the moment, 21,000. For how many properties? Um, for 42,000 properties at the Okay, moment. and I'm going to ask you to, you might call it out if you have it, but to send it to us in writing, like how many landlords have more than one and how many have two to five properties or five to ten properties or have you I can, those? I don't have that data. We'll, we'll ask you to send it. For you. Yeah, that, that's Fine, no you problem. can understand. So straight away, on average, more landlords have two. If there's 21,000 um, landlords for 42,000, HAP agreements, that but, and lots of people will be single, how, single. Yeah, yes. but there will be a number of people will have multiple. What would be the biggest number of people receive? Yeah. Would there be anyone receiving HAP payments in respect of over 30 properties? Over 50 I properties? can get you the details. You can would send it to us. Yeah, it would be unusual. There would be, you know, there would be some landlords with one, two homes, but then yeah. there would be some outliers with more, but I can get the breakdown. You'll send you. the yeah. analysis of that yeah. to us, and talk to me about and the suspension. If you don't have figures sure. on that, you can send it to us. Have many HAP payments been suspended 
during the course of the so year. So I, I can give you a bit of detail on that. Um, in relation to payments to landlords, we have a very kind of robust system in place in the shared service in, in Limerick. So where tenants are beginning to get into trouble in terms of arrears, there is a, a system whereby a number of letters are triggered. Um, and we have a situation where there's 98% collection of rent okay, good. so we would only have a situation where there's one percent of cases that you refer to there so the number i have it here for to date would be 575 tenancies ceased um, where a payment was not made and, and can they be reactivated be promptly if things get right or were they complete ceased not suspended they would, they would be suspended. suspended, but I suppose in every tenancy that ceases, the local authority would try as quickly as possible. Obviously, that the tenancy is a valuable, uh, a valuable thing, and they, they, they would try and work with the, the, the tenant and keep the landlord in the half scheme. And who does the tenant pay their contribution to? The tenant pays their contribution to the HAP shared service. Right, because some landlords are saying they were paying the tenant share so that they wouldn't lose the rest of their payment. The tenants weren't even paying. The landlord knew. I'm listening to what Joe Duffy was reading out all week. Um, the landlords knew that if the tenants 15% didn't go in, their entire payment would be stopped. So some landlords said they were actually paying the 15% to make sure they got the other 85% because they had a mortgage on the property. That really should be meant sounds, to be or to be. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't um, have to be. But absolutely. And it, I mean, one of the objectives with the shared service centre in Limerick is to streamline processes as to make it easy for the landlord. Once the landlord is set up and the paperwork is done, um, it's very straightforward. The last Wednesday of the month the landlord is paid, the differential rent comes into the shared service, um, landlord paid, and all of the regulation and the paperwork is done through a shared service. So there's a, a centre of excellence, shall we say, for landlord and for tenant. Okay. So it works and well. When you're sending us the note, give us the detail how many of these people are working through agents, because again, there was agents on the, tele, on the radio during the week saying he had multiple, you know, he was the agent and he was a collecting agent and he was passing it on to the landlord. So out of the 21 or the 42,000, tell us how many are covered by agents, because I'm sure some agents could have 100. Detail. Or more, yeah. you know, there might be the landlord, yeah. but they're agent. So, don't just give us a breakdown of the landlord, because you'll have the HAP shared service people will have details on that. So, just two final questions then, and you can send that on to us as soon as you can. So, back then to um, your, yourself, just for two questions. Uh, in the briefing note you gave us, it's um, document one seven one seven four five two in brackets, and a couple of things you've given us a summary of the seventeen out turn the year to date to the end of October of all the various categories of payments and the 2018 estimate and um, that's the reference yes. numbers you sent it in to us uh, appendix two in the document you sent in to yeah. us so my question really is I'm looking at the, the working age employment support and I'll read them out I'm surprised that the TUS figure the estimate for 18 is down considerably on last year's outturn I'm surprised that the back to work enterprise allowance is down considerably on last year, your estimate. I'm surprised your back to education allowance is down and that the back to work family dividend is down. Um, can you comment on, on why the, the, the yeah. estimate for 18 is significantly below the. Yeah, they're, they're all with the exception of tooth, and the tooth estimate is broadly at what it was for 2017. In fact, the numbers on TUS this year are probably a little bit higher than they were last year. So the outturn for 2018 might be closer to the outturn for 2017 and maybe a little bit above. Uh, so th that's what's going to happen on TUS. On the back to education allowance, the back to work enterprise allowance and the back to work family dividend, they're all demand led by people leaving the live register. And because the live register is falling and falling a bit faster, um, there aren't as many people leaving the live register to go to education, for example, and there aren't as many leaving to, go, to set up their own business. Okay. So it's purely demand. We're not doing anything Okay, to but the back-to-work family dividend, the former FIS, yeah. you know, actually said the opposite earlier, because people, are, as mentioned earlier, because people are leaving social welfare and going into work, yeah. there is, should be an increased demand for the back-to-work well, family this, dividend. If there's young, that's if there's people going to work with families on low income, you, I would have expected 
an increase there if people are leaving social welfare uh, No, there is a, there's a mathematical calculation thing going on there. there you're, more you're, people... you're going to send us the details? No, no, it was happening, I can explain it. Was happen... Two years ago, there were more people going on to it than there are this year, and it's a scheme that lasts for two years, so there are more people coming off it now than oh. are going on to it. So you get the back so to work only lasts for two years. It only lasts for two years. So you get the, the full amount of the qualified child payment for the first year and 50% of the child qualified child payment for the second year, and then you're on to... So it, right. there's more people leaving oh. because there's more people went on to it because the library was higher two right, years that ago. That replaces the family income supplement? No, the family income supplement is a separate payment. It's the working family payment. Oh, that's the wor that's back to work family dividend. Yeah, so the back to work family dividend is a payment that's made to people who leave the live register uh, in order that they, people that have families with children, they keep the qualified child portion of their payment. The working family payment, which is replaced in the FISP, pays them a differential based on the gap between their earnings yeah. and employment, which uh, and are where's familiar the with. For that in that the time. working family What's payment is uh, normally... Pardon? A31. A31. Working, yeah. right, it's just the two titles. One, yeah. one was it's back gone, work no, family no, dividend, no. and the other one is working family payments. It's just yeah. a yeah. similar type. Okay, yeah. we're nearly done. Then um, the, the next question: You're still projecting this year 180 million on rental supplement, which we've been talking about. What's mm -hmm. your estimate for next year if everyone is moving? I can't that? remember the estimate off the top of the head, but it'll be it's considerably less because we expect the numbers to fall from 25,000 yeah. to 15,000. So I think you're probably looking. I, I just don't have the estimate with me, but ballpark, if you look at yeah, we can send it on. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been published on any event, so we'll send it on to you. Yes, yeah, send it on, the, and then on, just on that page then, the fuel allowance um, was um, 148 million last year, and your, your estimate for this year is 138 million. I thought there was an extra week in the fuel allowance. Why is the estimate down? There is, but again, it's the falling number of people that are entitled to and mainly driven to the live register. So we put an extra week into the payment. Yeah. Uh, don't forget this year we also paid an extra week yeah. because we paid a, the supplementary week with the bad weather on top. So we had 27 weeks and we paid an extra week of fuel allowance was the decision that took the but government fuel allowance early this is mainly, year. How many of them are for the senior citizens rather than the people on the other... On there the there are people on long-term payments, including people on the long-term live register. Give us a breakdown how many are over versus yeah. Yeah. under, because it's, I would have thought with the population ageing to be more reaching the age category to possibly qualify for a fuel allowance. Okay. You know, we'll have, we can send you the detail of that. That's it. Now, it, 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 it is a means tested scheme as well, fuel allowance. So most of the increase in the pensioners there on the contributory pension. Okay. So they'd have to pass a means test to qualify. Now, and last thing then, I'm on to document number, a dual document, Compliance and anti fraud Strategy 2014-2018, your annual report 2017 and annual target statement 2018. That's our document there, or that's it on the screen. Just have a question or two to say um, um, on, on page 23 I have to compliment you on this one it's not really a question the, the value of the overpayments re being recovered by yourselves is going up every year from 2012 from 50 million to 81 million last year so you've stepped up your collection of overpayments because mm -hmm. we all we've had a lot of talk and I see I see the total overpayments in 2017 was 111 million based on the page before and you've collected overpayments of 81. You're heading to the situation <laughs> that you might be collecting more in over, recovering overpayments than you're actually being overpaying. You're, the gap is closing. But we'll I know that's a bit dreamy. We have a bit to go yet, Chair, but we're, yeah. we're yeah. moving in the right you direction. You understand, like, I, I, I look back, the gap between the overpayments in 2013 which is 127 million overpaid, and you recovered uh, 71 million. So the gap there was 56 million. Whereas the gap last year, um, you overpaid 110 million, but you recovered 81. So the gap has come down yeah. considerably. It, uh, that's progress. I'm, yeah. I'm not here to knock it. I'm saying that's progress in terms of you're reducing your level of, your, well, relatively your overpayments are not increasing, and you're improving your recovery of over previous overpayments. So that's be recommended. Now I'm on to page 25 and there's a chart on page 25 as the outstanding debt to the department. I think we've mentioned this in our last periodic report about writing off the small amounts under 100 euro or something like that. But if you look at that chart there, 
th th there's still 30 per cent of, according to this, the end of last year, there's outstanding debt due to the department from over debt, uh, you know, overpayments, I presume, of 501 million. And over 30 per cent of that was over, 10, over eight years old, pre-2010, and between 2010 and 2014, another 36 per cent. So the majority of that debt is very historic. Very historic. Um, your chances of collecting that historic debt, especially the pre-2010. Have you somebody, is the figure just going to sit there just putting the chart in? Are you making much progress on the old stuff? Um, suppose, Chair, just, just to say to you that um, we did a fairly extensive exercise on our legacy debt over the last 12 months. Yeah. And as a result of that, we have uh, written off a, a, a substantial level of old debt. Um, with the Department of uh, Public Expenditure and Reform's approval. So in the last 12 months, we've written off uh, 41.5 million in, in all legacy debt. Now, they would be all pre-2011 overpayments, um, where with a value of less than 10,000 euros and where we, we hadn't collected any, any uh, repayments in, uh, since, to, since 2015. So in total, we wrote off 41.5 million and a little over 33,000 cases. Right. I'm going to ask you to send me a summary because obviously... 33,290. Cases. So some of those were somebody got one overpayment and the, the, the so, old fight Some of them would be going back to the 1980s, Chair, so um, the 1990s, so like they were, we were never, they were uneconomical, we were never going to... to yeah, to, to, to chase some of the old small ones, it's always yes. going to be uneconomical yeah. and it wasn't going to achieve... The average debt written off is 1,247 euros. Yeah, but it wasn't collectible anyway. We were kind of cutting ourselves thinking it was collectible, to be truthful. You know, we, we can send you on some details. Send us a detailed note, and you might be able to give us a breakdown of, in turn, this is the one I'm looking for, um, of that, whatever you still have on your books. Sure. Give me a breakdown between um, the number and the amount, say, those under 100 or those under 1,000, those under, between 1 and 5,000 and under 10,000, because we want to have an idea how many big ones there are. So give us a breakdown of the numbers... You, you, you probably have it, right? Well, I'm not asking for it now this minute, but... Um, would, 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 you, would you have many figures over... Let me ask you, would there be many figures over 30,000? Um, I'm picking that figure, because that would be fairly big in social welfare. Then. I have the figure somewhere, to, uh, Chair. If you just bear with me for one yeah. second, I'll find them. Can I have a question in the yeah, same field, you? if that's OK? Yeah. Just, 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 just um, you know, the, the, the process by, whereby the department is entering into arrangements to, for, for repayment of uh, overpayments or, or uh, whether they be accidental claims or rollovers or whatever they might be. Um, has the, surely the department has some sort of um, legislative backing to deduct monies rather than try and get money back, so deduct money from existing social welfare payments. And if we have that, then why are we, why are we not doing that? Or are we doing that? Because if, if you're talking about debts that are going back to the 80s in particular, um, and those persons are, are in receipt of, of, of social welfare in any form, then surely there's a means by which small sums, you know, five or a week or something, can be deducted, at least making some sort of inroad. Yeah, I suppose if you look, um, um, Deputy, at, at our on-book debts, which I, I spoke to the Chair about earlier on, um, roughly about 90% of those people who are getting a payment from us at the moment and who have an overpayment, we are, we are, they are repaying us, and that's since 2012, and we're gradually going back over the years. I suppose that the, the, the big issue with debt recovery really is that this, the quicker you do it, the better chance you have. Yeah. So if you, if you leave it for a longer period of time, it gets harder to, to, to make the recoveries. So what we've been trying to do in recent years, I suppose, is very much concentrate on more recent debt, but we are working our way back. But certainly in terms of people who are, who are receiving a payment from us at the moment, um, we would have a, a very high percentage of those who are making repayments. We do have a legislative basis. I mean, there is a basis there under, under social welfare legislation for us to take up to 15% of the personal rate. And, and we do that in certain cases. I suppose what we try and do is agree a repayment plan with uh, the people who have been overpaid. But there is a provision there that we can take 15% of the personal rate if, if somebody doesn't, I suppose, cooperate with us. Perhaps when you're providing the figures to the chair or to, to, the, to the clerk, rather, um, you might provide some sort of indication as to what's... Um, the numbers of arrangements that are in place at the moment, for instance, that, that probably... And just for the deputy's benefit, I see um, 
last year, three, there were 337 cases where they recovered 8.9 million from the estates of people who had passed away. So it doesn't even stop when you die, they can actually get it back off of the estate. So no such thing as free money, Chairman. But exactly. So we under, so, pardon? Death and taxes. Death and taxes. The only two, the only two certainly. You know, Chair, where I think a point you raised a number of years ago was one of the issues there is people get a shock. Yeah. Um, but we now write to everybody every year with a statement of the debt they owe, so yeah, there can be no hard. shock. Because I made the point, some people mm. had been in the workplace, went to get their state pension, mm. and all of a sudden, oh, you owe money from eight years ago when you, you came for, mm. when you were on mm. job secret and you claimed an adult dependent. Mm. I said, why didn't he tell me and I'd have paid it rather than hit me when I'm on the pension? Mm. So, and what I have found is a TD, the old debt. Sometimes when somebody would advise a person <laughs> To get verification of how the, the debt arose, the paperwork, if you go back 10 years in a local office, did somebody claim for a week to say they didn't claim? The evidence wasn't always up to scratch on the very old stuff. So you probably have had to take a pragmatic view on some of that stuff if the old records weren't great. So, look, we've covered good ground here. I have to say, um, Mr McKeown and to all your staff, we've covered great ground here. We have five chapters from the CNAG's report, plus um, your annual accounts. Um, plus um, the social insurance fund and the reason yeah the reason we wanted to um, we, we thought we wouldn't get through it all today but one of the reasons I have to compliment your department consistently again you've been able to answer questions provide all the information asked anything you haven't provided on the day we know we, you, you'll get it uh, we will get it in due course from your from yourselves and that's what adds to the smooth running of the meeting and it allows you to get all the answers out, it allows us to get all our work done, and I had originally thought this would take two days, um, two meetings, but due to the, you know, social well, social protection revenue, there's a couple of people out there, organisations out there, are very good when they appear here, and it does help the smooth running of the committee. So I do want to thank you all for that, everyone from your department, the Department of Housing and the Revenue Commissioners, and also and the CNAG staff. So at this stage, the meeting is adjourned. Can I just say, Chair, yeah, I please, just want to acknowledge speak. Anne Vaughan, our Deputy Secretary, is retiring in oh. what, a week or two's time. So just as she's been here, I think, every year for the last eight years, so just to acknowledge wow. okay. that work. And we wish you all the best, yeah. and thanks for all your assistance. And we've said that yeah. here, and it might be no coincidence, the number of... Um, uh, of, of, of lady or women that are mm. part of the group from social protections mm. consistently is higher than most mm. other departments. The other departments we often have six mm. and seven males and no female. Maybe that's why it's a well-run department. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, maybe we have something to learn from you on that one. Yeah. So just, the meeting Chair, now, just to give you one figure, yeah. you asked me about the over 30,000 debt. There's 3,209 of them. And how, uh, what amount of money? 30,000 plus. No, but um, what does the... What does the 178, 179 million. Right, so uh, there's 179 million owed by how many people? 3,209, which 3, is... 3,209 people, yeah. and each of those is over 30,000. Each of those is over 30,000. Yeah, so well, I can give you the breakdown, but just... Yeah, and you're, you're going to send that to us, but I'm yeah. just going to do this sum for you now. 179, no, 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 no Sorry, no, I gave no. it to you, will I? Divide, <laughs> I I'm dividing it. I'm dividing... <laughs> so for those who are listening, the 179 million... Um, and that's all, that's all by the 3209 individuals is an average amount of 55,781 euro each. Get after it, folks. <laughs> OK, collect it as soon as you can. And thanks for that. I knew the figures were big. But that's actually, and it's great that we can get information like that as, as efficiently as that. And I do want to thank you. So the meeting now is adjourned until the 6th of December when we will be meeting with the Department of Communications, Climate Action, Action and Environment on the following matter: the appropriation accounts for 2017-429, the CNAG's uh, report, Chapter 8, measures dealing with cyber security, Chapter 9, the Energy Efficiency National Fund, and also matters relating to the National Broadband Plan. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much.